You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Oh, tough luck, mister. Yeah, I thought I could make that one easy. Yeah, I thought so, too. Well, I guess it didn't leave you much. Well, let's see. <laughs> they said you don't have a shot. <laughs> it looks like you're going to snooker yourself. Well, you never can tell. Eight ball, corner pocket. <laughs> Lots of luck. Like I said, eight ball, in the corner. Hey, how'd you do that? Ah, oh, just lucky, I guess. Luck nothing. <laughs> that was some shot. Been practicing. I uh, guess it finally paid off. Yeah. You win. Here's your five bucks. Yeah, one more game? Double or nothing? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't be hustling me, would you? Do I look like a hustler? I'm not sure. Oh, come on. <laughs> me? See, I just play on my lunch hour, you know, whatever town I'm in. Relaxation. Oh, me too. Strictly for laughs. So how about it? I don't know. Flip to see who breaks? That's all right. You go ahead. Yeah? Sure. Well, okay. Double or nothing. Go on. Sink as many as you can. Make it hard for me. No money on the table. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, Pops. You know I don't allow gambling in here. Yeah, we're, we're just having a friendly little game. Jesse, Jesse, why don't you give it a rest? Now, he do this a lot? Every day is all he lives for, this one. So he is a hustler. What are you talking about? Tell him, Pops. I never hustled anybody. Not for money, for pride. Go outside, Jesse. Get some sun on your face. You'll feel better. I already feel better. Forget the money. We'll, we'll play for the fun of it. No stakes? Not a dime. In that case, let's see how good you really are. Nice break. Of course, I didn't sink any. But that's my advantage. Yeah? Too many balls on the table. It doesn't leave you a shot. Watch me. What in the... Bank shot, three cushion. Curveball. Top spin. Little English. And over and under. Now, my favorite shot. It took me years to learn this one. You're not going to believe it till you see it with your own eyes. This is the way it's done. Pretty good. Pretty good? You kidding? Nobody ever made a shot like that in the history of the world. That's yeah, not bad, I'll give you that. But you're no Fats Brown or anything. What? Put your glasses on. It was impossible, but I made it. Yeah, sure. Keep practicing. You'll get there. Hey, here's for the beer, Pops. See you around. Okay. Thanks. What, what are you talking about? Keep practicing. I made it. Jesse. Just enough hey. English, the right draw, perfect position. Settle down. Perfect. Easy, Jesse. That's all I ever hear. Fats Brown. Well, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of hearing his name. Jesse, relax. You got company. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, you are a lucky man. Rita, what are you doing here? I thought we had a date. Oh, that's tomorrow night, Thursday night. Tonight is Thursday night. What? Oh, 
I, I guess I lost track of time. I'm sorry. I, I was supposed to pick you up at 8 o'clock. 7. 7. It's 9. Wow. <whistles> wow. You, you look great. Mm, don't change the subject. But I did get dressed up special just for you. Well, we can still go out. Mm, it's pretty late for dinner. Well, how about if we go out for a drink? Or a movie? How did you forget about our date? Yeah, how did you do that, Jesse? I, I was shooting pool, and I guess I just lost track of the time. Uh-huh. The guy I was playing started baiting me, saying, I'm no Fats Brown, I'm no Fats Brown. Can you believe that? How could I not be better than a guy who's been dead for 15 years? When it comes to dating, it's a draw, Jesse. <laughs> okay, I deserve that. Look, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you. Come, come on, let's get out of here. Why not? There's nobody left to hustle. Right, kid? You bet, Pops. I beat them all. Fats might have been good in his day, but this is my day. I'm Jesse Carter, the best pool cue on Randolph Street. The best player ever. Maybe. Too bad Fats is dead. Now, you'll never know for sure. <sighs> I know. And it's killing me. I would have given anything to play him. Jesse Cardiff, Pool Shark. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be on Randolph Street. He has spent every free minute honing his skill for pride and for love of the game. But he's about to learn that there's more to a man's reputation than skill or talent or even fame. And that being the best at anything carries its own special problems in or out of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Game of Pool, starring Wade Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hmm. So, what's the big deal about this dead fat guy? Uh, don't you know nothing? Fats Brown is a legend. Where you been? Most people say he's the best ever. Then he must be. No, no, not really. Because most people never saw me play. I'm better. Is pool all you think about? Well, what else is there? Look, if, if you want to be the best at something, it's got to be your life, right? Where do I fit into your life, champ? Oh, oh, you are right there. I work you in whenever I can. You gotta understand something, baby. Pool takes a lot of concentration. Well then, I got a great idea. What? I want you to stay here. Yeah? Then concentrate. Oh. On losing my phone number. Oh, Rita, don't be mad. Rita, where you Come on! Look, Rita, please stop. Get lost. Let me explain. What? Look, I, I would give anything to play Fats Brown just once. Is that so wrong? Yes. But for your own sick, self-centered ego, I hope you get your wish. Rita, come on, give me a break. I just want to beat the best. What's wrong with that? Fats, dead and buried in the ground. I'd give anything to play him one time. I could beat him cold. I know it. I'd show him who's the best. anything to play him one time. One time. One time. One time. One time. One time. Fat Ass Brown. Mr. Fat Ass Brown. <laughs> Report to Mr. Pool Room. Randolph Street. Who is this time? Fat Ass Brown. You're needed. Mr. Pool Room, 
Randolph Street, Chicago. I'm on my way. Mr. Fats Brown. It doesn't matter to me, straight pool, anything. If I just had the chance to meet Fats Brown face to face one time. At your service. Who? How did... You called? Y yeah, but... I, I must be seeing things. Why do you say that? Fats Brown? I, I thought you were... Dead? Not quite. As long as people talk about you, you're not really dead. As long as they speak your name, you continue. Continue? The game goes on, you might say. A legend doesn't die just because the man does. No. No, no, no. I, I know that, but... But what? This is impossible. Nothing's impossible. Some things are less likely than others, that's all. Wait a minute. There's a picture of the real fats on the wall. You... You look like them, but... Not many people do. Yeah, there, standing by a table, holding this custom-made pool cue. You mean this one? Where'd you get that? Nice stick. Good balance. I had it made to order. Wait a minute. Let me get a look at the face. The, the chin? The nose? Not one of my better pictures. It isn't a rib. I, I mean, you're, you're him. You're... James Howard Brown, known to my friends as Fats. <laughs> I know it's a shock, but then you called me, I didn't call you. Oh, uh, well, I, I didn't mean to... I mean, that is, I, I, I was just trying to... To what? I don't know. I, I was just saying if, if I could... If I could... If I could prove... It was big talk. Is that it? Well, no, not exactly. Talk is cheap. I know the type. You like to play with fire, but you don't like to cook. You're not really as good as you claim to be, and you know it. Hey! Deep down, you know you're second rate. Now, hold on. Are you afraid? Well, why would I be? Look, I've come a long way, boy. I don't like to be fooled with. I've met your kind before. A little skill, a little knack, some style. But when the heat's on, you fold. That isn't fair. You've never seen me play. Maybe not, but I've seen plenty like you. You have, huh? How do you know I can't beat you? How does anyone know anything? We learn to read the signs. Well, take another look. It's possible, isn't it? That's not the point. It's a matter of what's likely. But it is possible. Sure, it's possible. Things change. Records get higher. Once upon a time, nobody could run the four-minute mile. But people get better. Then you admit it. Yes, it's possible you could beat me. But the only way you'll do it is with a pool cue. You'll never get the job done with your mouth. All right, fat boy. Dead or alive, I'll tell you something. Maybe you are some kind of a legend, a tin god. But you know what you are to me? A big balloon, just waiting for someone to stick a needle in you. Well, I'm the someone, and here's the needle. Where? My pool cue. Oh, it'll get the job done, don't you worry. You're like all the other legends. You get by on your reputation. One time I heard a man in this very room swear he saw you make a nine-cushion bank. And you don't believe it? Now, you hit a ball that hard, it won't stay on the table. The guy had more imagination than brains. Is that so? Well, let me tell you. That's not what counts. The question is, can I back it up? Oh, how right you are. I know how good I am. But you... Then you'll play me? Rack the balls. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. What about the stakes? The stakes? A little something to make the game more interesting. Oh, here's what I got. I'll shoot it all. My whole bankroll. Any or all of it. Put it back in your pocket. Why? My money not good enough for you? Come on, use your wits, boy. What good is money to me? Then what? Something to make the long journey worth my while. Name it. You said you'd give anything for a game with me. Anything. Well, what are you getting at, mister? Just what kind of stakes are you talking about? Life or death. What? You beat me, you live. You lose, you die. You're pulling my leg. The proposition is simple enough. You're crazy. Interesting. What is? 
to see how much faith you have in your ability. Or should I say how little? Go chase yourself. You know something? For my money, you don't want it bad enough to be the best. Why, when I was your age, I would have jumped at the chance. But then I was better than second rate. Watch it. You wouldn't know about that. It takes more than skill to be a champion. It takes equal parts talent, work, luck, and nerve. A quality you sadly lack. Nerve? You mean insanity? How so? You want me to risk my life on a game? Insanity, then, if you prefer. Listen, I'm just a pool player. There's probably no less important thing on the face of the earth. Pushing balls around with a stick on a felt-top table. But mark this in your book. I'm the best. It's a proud thing to be the best at anything. But then you wouldn't know about that either. Hey, hold on. Hmm. Where, where are you going? I'm going back, of course. Back where? You wouldn't understand. You're wrong. About what? You say I don't want to be the best bad enough. That's not true. Oh, boy, is it not true. Do you know how many hours, how many years, how much of my blood and sweat I put into this game? I'm listening. How many nights I slept right here on this table? Yeah, I did that. I made a deal with the owner so I could practice after the place was closed. I haven't been to the movies in years. I know what you're talking about, but it's still talk and nothing else. I'm good, mister. Real good. But am I... am I that good? You'll never know until you're ready to risk everything. Will you stop pushing me? Sure I will, I was just thinking. Where I come from, there's a race driver. Go to the track and whisper his name. Say Tazio Nuvolari and watch the heads nod up and down. Or go to the bull ring and hear them talk of Manolet. Both men face death daily, and both are legends. They learned something important early on. You'll never make the grade by playing it safe. Uh, this is nuts. So long, kid. Wait. What for? Oh, boy, what, what am I doing? Something you want to tell me? Well, I... You accept the terms? I... Life or death. Rack them. Just so you understand, once we start the game, there's no turning back. Get cold feet and it'll be too late. You heard me. Rack the balls. In a hurry, are you? I've been waiting a long time for this. Have you? Yes, I guess you have. First, the tools of my trade. Now, what's so special about that stick, anyway? It's the man that counts. You're right. But this one suits me. You know how it is? The big game hunter has his elephant gun, specially bored with a custom grip. The fencing master uses a blade from Lima. This cue? It was made for me in St. Louis. It cost 600 bucks back then, and I made a living from it for 35 years. It never let me down. Well, there's a first time for everything. Yes, I guess there is. The question is, what's the most likely outcome? Look, if you're not going to rack them, I will. Anytime you're ready. Do I get to call the game? Name it. Rotation. Kelly. 14-1 rack. Eight ball, what's your pleasure? All right. Let's see how good you are. One game, 300 points. That'll do. Standard rules. Is there any other kind? But just so there's no misunderstanding, we play for the value of the balls. Nine points for the nine ball, ten for the ten, and so forth. Agreed? Agreed. Good. Do you have a coin? Right here. Toss for break? You flip. Sure. Call it. Tails. Here goes. Why'd you put your hand over it? I want to give you a fair chance. Go ahead, let's see. You can change your mind. You heard me. Tail. All right, then. If you're sure. You can change your mind, you know. There's still time. 
Not on your life. My life's not what's at stake. Let's see it. Heads. I guess that means it's my break. Yeah, your break. As soon as I chalk up. Take your time. I know what you're thinking, son. Oh, you do, huh? Same as most players. The man who breaks is at a disadvantage. Once he scatters the balls, the other man has a clear field. Well, doesn't he? Maybe with some people, but not the way I play. Oh, sure. I suppose you can control the break. Time to go to school. Two balls into the rail, back to where they were, exactly. No advantage given. That's... That's a perfect break, all right. Mm -hmm. I bet it took you years to learn that. Oh, it did, but not the way you think. What do you mean? It takes more than practice. Not just setting up shots in an empty pool hall. You have to handle the pressure out there in the real world. Well, this is my world. You're on my turf now. I know this table like the back of my hand. Maybe, but who have you played here? Kids, two-bit hustlers, traveling salesmen? Step aside, fat man. Be my guest. Now it's your turn to scatter them. <laughs> You'd like that, wouldn't you? What a safety. Playing it close to the vest, aren't you? That's what you call strategy. What are you going to do now? I'll try to think of something. There's always a power break. Yeah. But if nothing falls, you leave me wide open. And if I sink one, you're really in trouble. With luck, I can run the whole table. Prove it. Keep your eye on the 15 ball. It's not going in. Funny thing, I was thinking it is. Corner pocket. Think again. Oh, well, quite a few balls around the one. Looks like you're sewed up. Yeah, yeah. If you don't connect, it'll cost you. If I don't, mind if I smoke? If it makes you feel better. Yeah, you wouldn't have a fresh pack on you. I gave them up bad for my health. Oh, that's okay. I got one left. Nervous? Eh, not me. Why is your hand shaking? Uh, maybe I'm itchy to get this over with. Or maybe you're just trying to rattle me. Or maybe it's because you don't have a shot. Except for the bank. That'll take a lot of English. Oh, I'm loaded with it. So you are. This time. Shall I keep score? I got it. Now what? The follow-up is important. You have to plan ahead. Three rails. Two ball in the corner. That's a hard combination. For some people. Watch your angle now. You watch it. Oh, I am. How about that, fat boy? Not too shabby. It was great! In some places. You know what? You're like all the others. Always trying to bring me down. Well, why would I do that? When I was a kid, there were plenty of guys like you. Guys who were good at things like music and basketball and arithmetic. They'd do anything they could to make me feel about an inch tall. Well, you fooled them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I sure did. I knew there was something, somewhere, that I could be good at. One day, I was about 16. I wandered in here. It was cool and dark, like, I don't know, like being underwater, you know? Yeah, I know. So I kept coming back. I used to stand around and watch them play. Got to know the place, till I felt relaxed. Now, one day, I picked up a stick and asked this old man. He was sitting right over there. I said, do you want to play, mister? Why not, he said. And I beat him. I beat him! That was when I knew I had an eye for the game. Three ball. 
Go in. And I, huh? What happened to it? Well, I almost made it. My turn. The reball. You know, almost works a lot of the time, but not in geometry. Well, what's that got to do with it? Pool is geometry in its most challenging form, a science of precise angles and forces. You have to understand that or you're lost. Yeah, yeah. Four ball, other end. Lucky shot. Luck had nothing to do with it. Five in the side. Angles, forces, big deal. Now who's sewed up, huh? I'll admit, it doesn't look good. You can say that again. If you don't hit the five first, you scratch. And that'll cost you points. Mm-hmm. You're a shot. Oh, man, is it. Five ball. Six. Seven. Now the eight. Nine in the side. Ten. Eleven ball, corner. I have 59 points, you have seven. The game still has braces on its teeth. Rack them up. No kidding. Just in case you lost track. Tell you what I'm gonna do, fat boy. Let me make it easy on you. No thanks. Hey, I'm trying to do you a favor. For what reason? Because I got feelings. Come on, admit it. This must be humiliating. Oh, I wouldn't say so. Well, let me say it for you then. The game's as good as over. Is that what you think? You want to throw in the towel and walk away? I'll let you. You will, huh? Sure. That way it won't hurt so much. It's not over till it's over, son. Be serious. Look at the score. I got 299. So I see. Well, what does that tell you? I need any ball to win. That right. Time to face facts. There's no way. You might as well throw in the towel. I've been in tougher situations than this. <laughs> when? There's more to winning than scoring points. Oh, yeah? Like what? Something you can't learn in here. Then why don't you teach me? Go on. I I'm all ears. Takes time. So? That's something you got plenty of, right? Talk is cheap. The big things you have to learn for yourself. Quit stalling. It's my shot. In an awful big hurry, aren't you? To be the best? Oh, you better believe it. I've been waiting years for this. One more shot and you are history, fat boy. There's a new shooter now and his name is Jesse Cardiff. Back off and give me room. This is something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life.
Don't let me hold you up. Oh, I won't, I promise. Yep, this is the big one. They don't come any bigger. Me and Fats Brown, and I need one to win. Feast your eyes on this. Number five in the corner. Funny. Something you want to say? I was just thinking. You do a lot of that. What is it this time? Just that there's more to life than a pool hall. No kidding. It isn't right you being cooped up in here all the time. You're all hard fats. You gotta get out a little, see what's going on. Uh, I've heard that before, from Pops. Now what about you? What about me? Oh, you didn't get to be the best sitting on a park bench. You spent a lot of time with a pool cue in your hands. You must have. Of course I did, but I found time to live, too. I've been to places where they never heard of billiards. If you call that living, why would you want to? Why bother? It's not easy to explain, but I'll try. I may not look the part, Jesse, but I've done other things, too. A whole lot of other things. I've made love, walked uphill, and swum in the ocean. I've been on airplanes and cruise ships and played tag with little children. And when I think of the wonderful things there are to see and do in this world, it hurts me to think of you rotting your life away in this miserable dark hall. What? Oh, I get it. Nice try. What's this, you don't believe me? Doesn't matter whether I do or not. You're trying to distract me so I won't make my shot. Am I? That's a lousy thing to do. But it won't work. Five, corner pocket. Hey, what are you doing? Doing? Oh, you mean the coin, sorry, it's an old habit of mine. Take your hand out of your pocket. Sure, if you like. Now don't say another word, just for a minute. This is the easiest shot I ever saw. There's no way I can mess it up. Nobody could. I'm in no hurry. Good. Take your time. I will. And I'll stand over here and just give you all the room you want. You do that. Enough with the chalk already. What? Oh, sorry, sorry. You're not even going to get to shoot again. I'm making this shot and there's nothing you can do to stop me. No doubt. You did that. Did what? You dropped the chalk. Then I better pick it up. My shot. But, but... That one right there, in the side. Oh, I don't believe it. Look at you. A little gamesmanship, a little pressure to put some fun in the game, and you come apart at the seams. You cheated. I did? How so? Well, you... Kid stuff. To make you break your concentration and shoot wild didn't take much. You know, if you ask me, that's pretty low down. Some places they break a guy's thumbs for that. Not here. Game ball. Oh, one more thing. If you want to concede now and save yourself the embarrassment. Take your shot. It's not over till it's over. Right. Even when it's just a formality. Last ball. Corner pocket. Choke. You wouldn't be trying to distract me, would you? Ha! Almost. Almost doesn't make it. There it is, the game ball again, right in front of me. All my life. So you said. Okay, you had your fun. This ball has my name written all over it. Perfect angle, clear table. I was made for this. Give it some thought, Jesse. Think about this. I sink it. I become the greatest. You're not going to make it. It's simple enough straight in, but you won't make it. You're sweating, fat man. Now, why are you so nervous? Not why you think. You wouldn't understand the reasons. No, no, no. I understand, all right. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? Even as a dead man, to have your name up there as the unbeatable champ of all time? It carries certain satisfactions, yes. I'll give you a chance at my crown, Jesse, but only if you're willing to stake your life on the game, Jesse. Couldn't be just a nice, friendly little game, huh? I take it as it comes. To you... Pool is not a nice, friendly game. It's a win-at-any-price affair. I saw that right off, and I acted accordingly. But it didn't do you any good. Didn't it? I've made this shot hundreds of times. Not when your life depended on it. Is this some more of your gamesmanship? I've been studying you, Jesse. 
I've gone up against dozens like you. Pressure is what separates the champions from the also rans. I've seen men who could shoot brilliant pool, but they were duds when the stakes were high. That's why I insisted we play for something big. What does it matter to you if I win or not? Afraid I'll take your place? Is that it? Did people stop talking about Dempsey when Joe Lewis came along? Did Beethoven replace Bach? No. He wouldn't replace me. Then why? Someone has to keep the flame. Someone has to weed out those who haven't got what it takes. The champions, the legends, they serve a purpose. To be a challenge and an incentive. I don't need a challenge. Everyone needs a challenge, Jesse. Someone great out of the past to say, match what I've done, boy, and make it better. That's true of all walks of life, music, politics, sports, you name it. Musicians all over the world have been better because of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. There's a man in the White House who can look out his window and see the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. Don't you think it helps him to be a better president? Yeah, but a game of pool? Anyone who tries to be good at anything finds himself in your shoes. He finds himself faced with a legend. And when he can't measure up to the legend, he fades away, he dies, and is forgotten. I'm only a pool player, Jesse, but I'm the best. No, you were the best. No man gets past me unless he has what it takes. And you don't think I have it? There's still one ball on the table, and it's taken you a mighty long time to get at it. You wouldn't believe this, Jesse, but personally, I'd like to see you win. Yeah. Yeah. I've only been doing my job. Stand back and give me some elbow room. Wait, Jesse. Oh, no. I've been waiting too long. Before you shoot, think about one thing. What? Sink that ball and you may win more than you bargained for. You're wasting your breath. Don't you get it? There's nothing you can do to stop me now. Nothing. Sorry. I was required to say that. Something along the lines of a disclaimer. Well, what are you waiting for? Not a thing. Win more than I bargained for, huh? Is that what you said? Well, it's over. I beat you. Looks like you did. Now I'm the best. I'm the best at something. So you are. You had to prove yourself under pressure, and you passed the test. Well, aren't you going to congratulate me? I'm not sure that's in order. Thanks. What do you mean, thanks? I beat you. I'm going to live. Of course you are. Those are the stakes. You'll live forever. Then why thank me, fat boy? You'll find out when the time comes for you to leave Randolph Street. Ah, you're a sore loser, that's all. I beat you fair and square. Yeah. You saw it. I beat the king of the hill, Fats Brown himself. So long, kid. Thanks for the game. Me, Jesse Cardiff. Now I'm the best. And I'm going to stay the best. Because nobody's ever going to take it away from me. Not ever. From now on, it's me, Jesse Cardiff. You hear that, world? Jesse Cardiff. 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 Yeah. Report at once to Mason's Pool Hall. Sandusky, Ohio. Mr. Jesse Carter. You're needed. Yeah, I'm on my way. Mr. Jesse Carter, who became a legend by beating a man known as Fats. But many years later, after his funeral, he found out that being the best at anything carries with it a special obligation to keep on proving it. Mr. Fats Brown, on the other hand, having relinquished his champion's medal, has gone fishing. These are the ground rules on Earth and in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. 
where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Game of Pool, starring Wade Williams with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Craig Brawley, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, Sandra Delgado, and Linda Ryder. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. How much longer, Chris? Not long. We'll stop soon as we find a place. Where? Look around. We saw the last shade two days ago. That's a buzzard up there circling the wagons, and it's been following us since dawn. It's waiting for the next one to die. How's the boar? Still burning up with fever. He can't take any more. All right, honey. Hold up! Whoa! We'll stop here for a few minutes. There. There. Still the fever? Poor little thing is burning up. If I could just use a damp cloth. Try my handkerchief. Can we spare it? If he needs it, we can. Here, put this on your forehead. It'll make you feel better. How's that, son? This is the eleventh day, Christian. Eleven days of fever. He can't go on much longer. Hey, you said that on the third day. And then on the fourth. He'll take more, just as we all will. This is Arizona country. We've got 400 more miles, and we've already traveled almost 2,000. We'll do what we have to do. All of us. How's the boy, Mrs. Horn? About the same. Thank you, Charlie. Figure that Apache country is just due south. That's what you said we were looking out for, ain't it? That's what we've been looking out for. We travel due west, close together and button up tight at night. No fires if we can help it. Bad Indians down there, Chris. That's what we heard. And they travel in big parties, don't they? And we got five rifles. Five rifles, Chris, and a sick child, and four wagons, and seven dead, tired men and women. We was dead tired a week ago. And a month ago and a month before that. And there were war parties back in Kansas, and we near froze to death in Colorado. And we was out of our minds with, the, with, with thirst last month. And we've kept on going. We've always kept on going. We always... It's this way, Chris. We've been doing a lot of talking and a lot of thinking. And? We figure we ought to turn back. Turn back. That what you all want? Turn back? Chris? We're about at the end of our rope. 
We're hungry and we're sick. We figure we better do it now, or we're gonna die out here. You turn back and I guarantee it. You turn back and try to go over 1,500 miles to St. Louis again, and you'll leave your bones bleached in one of those deserts between here and there. Or have your scalps taken off. Or you'll freeze to death in a, in a, in a mountain pass. And if you go on, what's going to happen to that beautiful child of yours? Listen, those 1,500 miles are behind us. They're all gone. The heat, the cold, the misery. You can, you can look back at them as things that have, that have happened. Not agonies you're, you're going to have to live with. How do you know there's not going to be more days and weeks and months like it? How can you be so blame sure? I figure there's only about four to six hundred miles more to go. Four to six hundred more miles, friends. And then we've made it. We can't stop now. Listen, if we stop, we're dead. That's gospel. We're dead. Could be we're dead anyway. Just, okay, okay, just give me one more week. One week. I'll get us through. I promise you. I'll get us through. What about water? We're almost out of water. I'll get water. I'll, I'll find some. How, Chris? With a divining rod? I, I, I don't know how, but I will. I swear. The year is 1847. The place is the territory of New Mexico. The people are a tiny handful of men and women with a dream. Eleven months ago, they started out from Ohio and headed west. Someone told them about a place called California about a warm sun and a blue sky, about rich land and fresh air. And at this moment, almost a year later, they have seen nothing but cold, heat exhaustion, hunger and sickness. The men and their families are now one with the animals and the wagons and the landscape, and they stare straight ahead, numb and glassy-eyed. They are dust blobs whose lives have been reduced to a single function, forward motion. The man in the lead wagon is named Christian Horn. He has a dying eight-year-old son and a heart-sick wife, once beautiful but now gaunt and drawn in the merciless desert air. Her husband is the only one who has even a fragment of the dream left, Mr. Chris Horn, who's about to go over the rim of a sand dune in search of water, sustenance, and survival, and who, in just a moment, will find himself heading into an uncharted territory known as the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, A Hundred Yards Over the Rim, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. A man had best not make promises he can't keep. I give you my word. And food and medicine for your child? We'll have those things. We'll, we'll have food and medicine and, and everything else. If you can just keep going. Just just keep going and, and, and don't look back. Look out there instead. L- look west. We don't even know where that is anymore. Don't make any decisions yet. We can't stay here anyway. Once we're past the trail, we'll be able to rest a couple of days. I'm almost out of water, Chris, and food. I'll go up ahead, over that sand hill. I'll do some checking around. Stay here now, all of you. Martha, give me my rifle. Chris, Chris, you might, you might look for a shady spot, a pretty spot where we, where we can. <laughs> I won't talk about bearing our son, not now, not while there's life in him. How far you plan on going? Just over the rim there, a hundred yards or so. Might find a stream or something. Maybe some game. A rabbit or two. Never can tell. I guess that's true enough, friend. Never can tell. Stay close to wagons and keep them bunched up. Hold on, Charlie. All of you. Just hold on. I'll be right back. What in God's name? Hey! Everybody, look what's over here! There's a road! Down on the other side, a a road! Look! Martha? Charlie? Hey! Hey! Where's the wagons? Where... Where'd everybody go? 
Well, must have got turned turned around there. Go on, go up again and see. Yeah, see which way I'm looking. What's going on? What what what, what in devil's name is going on here? It's hard. And black. What the? What are these poles doing here? All these wires. Joe? Yeah? What was that? Backfire. What? Truck backfired. Oh, you sure? I thought I heard a gun go off. Not likely. It might be one of those local boys shooting your sign. Well, if it was, I'll get the sheriff out here, but that didn't sound like any 22 to me. Look, Joe, who's that? Some guy with a rifle. Go in the other room. But, Joe... I said, get in back. I'll take care of it. Howdy. Did you see it? You, 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 did you see that thing? What thing? That monster. That, that big animal or, or, or monster, whatever it was. It almost hit me. Monster? No, I didn't see anything like that. If there was anything, it never got to hear. It must have. It went by me just a mile or so back. You mean... You, you don't mean the truck. What's a truck? Hey, are you all right? You wouldn't have any water to spare, would you, mister? Any extra, I mean. Water? Sure. Come over here and sit down before you fall down. Here you go. Is all this for me? Sure. On the house. Well, thank you kindly. Uh, you want some more? You got more? Sure do. Whoa, whoa, now. You don't want to drink it too fast. Just how long you been out on the desert, anyway? Uh, how long? Uh, well, almost a year. Well, at least almost a year of traveling. Started from Ohio. I had six wagons to start with. One of them was burned by Indians, and one turned back. Indians? Wagons? What are you talking about? Say, mister, what, what happened to your arm? You're bleeding. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> well, I guess I did it to myself when that thing come at me. I rolled out of the way. Thought it was a mirage, then the gun went off. Just a flesh wound, though. Not too deep. I'll have Mary Lou look at it. She's my wife. She used to be a nurse's aide. Mary Lou! Everything okay, Joe? The fella here, he shot himself in the arm. He did? By accident, he says. You want to take a look at it? Oh, why, sure. I'll get some bandages out. Hand me a clean towel, will you, Joe? Sure thing. Got the first aid kit right here under the counter. I'll just set your gun over here. Oh, well, thank you kindly. Well, careful with it now. That's a real old-timer. Antique piece, isn't it? Uh, no, I uh, bought it new before we started out, but she's been used a lot, I guess. We're running low on bullets. I don't suppose you've got any ammunition around here. Oh, uh, no. We don't carry anything like that. This isn't a hunting area. What about Indians? The south of here's Apache country, isn't it? Why, sure. Well, sure, but there aren't any Indians nowadays. Well, I mean, not not hostile Indians. No? Well, not as long as we've been here. Well, how long have you been out here? How long? Oh, well, a couple of years now. Where do you hail from? Well, we used to live in Phoenix. Phoenix? Yeah, Phoenix. Mary Lou's folks are from there. I worked for her old man when we were first married, and then I bought this place here. The restaurant isn't doing so well, but the truckers are starting to come in now with the interstate. Restaurant? Uh, you have food? Sure do. Just like the sign says. <laughs> On the wall there, see it? Right over the register. Joe's Air Flight.
cafe and gas station. You don't understand a thing I'm talking about, do you? You've never heard of Phoenix or registers or nurses' aides or trucks or gas. Hey, mister, where are you from, really? Where'd you come from? Tell me straight out, why don't you? From from Ohio. I, I left the wagons back there, and I, I, I walked up the rim to the hill, and I... I thought I might find some water or something or some game, and then I saw that 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 uh, you know that stretch of road out there, that black road, and those those things, you know, running on it. What things? He means trucks. Hold on, hold on. You hear that? You hear that? There's another one. It's all right. It won't stop. Take my word for it. Well, we heard tell it was a dangerous route, but the most direct one. To where? California. They say. They say... No, no, take it easy, friend. We can talk about all this later. No, I, I, don't, I don't have much time. I, I promised him I'd be right back. There you go. Your arm's all cleaned up with a bandage on it. I even made you a sling, see? Oh, much obliged. I just try to keep it clean now. I'll give you a roll of gauze and some tape. You're a... a nurse? Are you, are you the doctor? Me? I just sling hash and pump gas. Take two of these. Drink a little water to get them down. What are they? They're antibiotic tablets. They ought to keep away any infection. Where do you get this? Well, at the drugstore. Of course, you're supposed to have a prescription, but these won't do you any harm. How do you feel? Could I? Uh, do you think I, I could buy some more of those pills off you? Oh, I don't sell them. But you see, I, I got a real sick boy back there. Back where? In the wagon. If I can ever find the wagons again, but you say that this will help a, a, a sickness. Sometimes, depending on what it is. How about a, a fever and a bad cough? Uh, it's worth a try. You've got a family? There was three wagons of us, but when I turned around to look back down, they'd, they'd gone. Well, maybe you better rest a while, friend. You, you know, lie down. Get washed up. There's a bed in back. Look at this place. The tables like like wood, but they're not. They, they can't be. And the legs are all silver and bright. That's not silver. It's steel. It's chrome-plated. W- w- what's that thing in the corner? Jukebox. A what? It plays music. You put a coin in it and pick a tune. Here, I'll show you. Hey. Where's that coming from? From inside. Didn't you ever see one of these before? You got a... You got a man inside? Playing his guitar on, on, on my account? Let him out of there right now. Turn it off, Joe. There. That's better. That was a bad idea. With all these things. Where am I? What is this place? Come with me. I'll show you where to wash up. Wait a minute. That, that picture. Where do you, Where do you get it? The calendar? Pioneer West Insurance Company. That's a picture of my covered wagon. Look, 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 look just like my wagon. Oh, well, that's just an old lithograph. The date? That can't be right. It, it says, it says April. But the year's all wrong. This is the year of our Lord, 1847. But this calendar says it's, it's, it's not even the same century. My dear God, how could that be? Easy now. What's going on here? Who are you people? Where am I? No, 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 no! You better stop him, Joe. He'll get himself killed. Come on now, fella. Come inside. Please. Please. Somebody tell me where I am. One dollar and eighty-four cents your change. You keep it, dollface. I thank you. Say, uh, pretty lady, if you don't mind my asking... 
what time you get off work here? Oh, not till late. But you better not let that man in the kitchen hear you say that. He's my husband. Oh, uh, uh no offense, ma'am. <laughs> None taken. You come back now. I'll do that. Doctor still in back? He is. Been a while now. I made a club sandwich for the fella. You think he wants some soup, too? Well, you better ask Doc first. How's he doing back there? You have a fresh pot of coffee? Sure do. Shall I bring it to him? Not for your visitor. For me. I believe I'd like a nice, strong cup. Sit down, Doc. You look like you just seen a ghost. You look him over? I did indeed. And? Malnutrition, that's his major problem, along with dehydration. Though he's a strong specimen of a man, I'll say that. Tough stock. What else did you find out? You were right. He's an interesting customer, all right? Quite the character. The heat did it, or something, didn't it? I mean, he's, well, he's not in his right mind. I, I figure that has to be it. I'm not a psychiatrist, Joe. I'm an ancient GP, not much past the school of castor oil and sassafras tea. But, you know, I think old Freud himself would have something to gnaw on here. How do you mean? He happens to seem very rational. Extremely rational. He can trace his imaginary life a whole lot clearer than some of us can our own. His recall of details is amazing. Or it would be if they were true. Maybe they are true. I mean, maybe he read it in a book somewhere. There's lots of books about the pioneer days. I even know a lot about my people, how they came out here. And one other thing, a little parenthetical aside, let's call it. The fillings in his mouth. There are two. Well, let's just say no modern dentist drilled them. Yeah, his clothes, too. They didn't come out of an Army-Navy store. No, they didn't. They're the real goods, circa 19th century. And you saw that squirrel shooter of his, Joe? Sure, but it's an antique. An antique that isn't more than a year old? A hundred and fifty-something year old gun, Joe, but it was manufactured less than a year ago. You said that yourself this morning. But what's it add up to? Look, Doc, if you're trying to tell me... I'm not trying to tell you anything, Joe. That is to say, I'm not trying to make any point of my own. All I'm giving you is the benefit of some observations from an old hand... He says he's a pioneer, and when he climbed up to the top of that hill out there, he was living in 1847. That's what he said, all right. He seemed so sure. Well, we're three normal, rational human beings here, and we know that sort of thing doesn't happen. So he's suffering from some kind of delusion, but it's a delusion of the purest form. Frankly, I've never heard anything like it, not with this degree of detail. The way he describes his wife, his son, the wagons, the, the other people, it's with genuine emotion. He's lying in there right now with tears rolling down his cheeks, worried about them. He said his boy was sick. He told me his boy was dying. And from the way he described the symptoms, I'd call it pneumonia. That's why he wanted the pills. Which pills? I gave him some antibiotics for the wound in his arm, and he wanted the whole bottle so he could give some to the boy. I don't get it, how someone could be so sincere. I just don't understand it. I don't either. Which leads me to the next question. Yes? What do we do with him, Doc? Precisely what I'm going to deal with right now. Where's your phone? Behind the counter. But wait, who are you calling? The authorities. So they can get him help. Oh, that won't do him any good, will it? They'll lock him up in a rubber room and throw away the key. Once he's turned over to the state, he'll get a thorough examination. They'll know what kind of help he really needs. Yeah, the funny farm. Oh, Doc, I've heard about those places. They're bad news. Nobody even knows you're in there. They, they can do anything they want. What are you suggesting? That we pack him a box lunch and send him on his way? You think he'll survive out there? He doesn't know where he is. And even if he figures that out, he'll... Die of heat exposure before the day's over. Uh, I want the sheriff's office, please. Oh, it just doesn't seem right. Yes, uh, is the sheriff there? Oh, in his car. Well, uh, that's even better. 
can you radio him to get over to Joe's diner as fast as he can? Uh, we've got a man here who needs looking after. No, 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 not violent, but he should get here real fast anyway. Uh, yeah, thanks. Oh, Joe, I hope we're doing the right thing. So do I. Well, at least he's calm now. As calm as any man would be if he suddenly woke up and thought he was past his time. That's enough, Doc. Well, hello, Mr. Horn. This book, it, it was in my bedroom. Well, that's the encyclopedia. I was looking through it. I, I found something. What? Well, this, this here. Uh, Horn Christian Jr., M.D., Famous for his early work in childhood diseases. Pioneer in vaccine research. Born 1839. Died 1914. Well, that was my son. That, that's Chris Jr. So I guess I'm either crazy or the world is turned upside down. But I think I, I got put here for a reason. Oh, you did. I just know it. For important reason. What are you doing? You've been gracious and kind, and, and I appreciate it. But I gotta get back. I'll just get my gun now. Horn, we want to help you. But help means rest and medical attention. I can't let you leave like this. Come on, son. Come over here and sit down. I've called for the authorities. The, the authorities? Well, listen, I, I don't know who they might be, but I've got no time to wait and find out. Horn, please. Hey, don't don't go trying to stop me now. I know my purpose. I'm going to finish it. Well, my life don't add up to much. Listen to us. Please, Mr. Horn. You take your hands off my gun, mister. You okay, Mary Lou? Oh, I'm fine. The gun just went off when he took it. And blew out my plate glass window. Horn! Horn, come back! Sorry, mister. What's the matter with you? Horn, wait up! Are you all right? Those people, they're trying to stop me. Yeah, huh? Where are you going? I, I have to get back to the Arizona Territory. You do? Well, that's an easy one. Don't just stand there. Get in. beast. How's that? What is this contraption? Peterbilt 18-wheeler. Best long-haul rig ever made. Where's your team? I ain't a teamster. Strictly independent. But your horses? All the horses you want right under the hood. Sweet, huh? Where you say you're headed? California. We were headed for California. Well, that's where I'm going. Good country out there, is it? Easy living, if you ask me. Everything a man could want. And... Land to work? Any seed you plant, it grows tall. That's what I heard tell. Suppose I could give you a ride all the way in, so I'd have somebody to talk to. I'm 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 going to California, but I I, I can't get get there this way. What are you talking about? Uh, it has to be the same ridge right right around here. It was, Mister. You have to let me out. Say, look at that sheriff's car moving like a bat out of hell. Please, I, I made a mistake. You you've got to stop this this machine. Hello, Doc. Now, what's this emergency you got? Not exactly an emergency, Sheriff, but since I called, it might have turned into one. 
Sheriff, you got to stop him. That's right. He won't make it out there. Hold on now. What you trying to tell me? Mr. Horn, Sheriff. Horn, is it? He's the man I examined. It's a long story, a pretty strange one. The point is, now he's run off. Well, where? He headed for the ridge, where he came from. So, he came in out of the desert? And now he's going back, about a mile up the road. Now, well, don't worry. I'll find him. Gotta make it. Just, just a little ways more. You there! Hold it! No, you don't. Not now. Drop the gun, son. I said, drop the gun. All right, now come on down, real slow. The pills. I dropped. I dropped the pills. That's it. Now put your hands in the air. Got it! I said halt! Halt, son, or I'll shoot! What was that? Sounded like a shot. Maybe Chris got himself a rabbit. But he ain't even had time to get up the ridge yet. Martha! Forget something, Christian? Martha, what happened? Where'd you go? Where did we go? What do you mean, Chris? Where could we have gone? Well, when I looked down, I, I, I couldn't see you. Or the wagons. When? You haven't had time to go anywhere. Martha, I, I, I don't understand what you're saying, but I, I'm, I'm truly glad to see you all this time. All what time? So much happened. First I fell, and, well, somehow I shot myself, and... It doesn't matter. I, I have so much to tell you. But how could you? Oh, Chris, honey, you just left a second ago. What did you forget? Forget? And what's that in your hand? Oh, that's... that's a medicine. Medicine? Where did you get it? Never mind. Just... Oh, Lord. Give him some water. Give him... give him two of these. I think... I think it may save his life, Martha. I see... As you say, then. Chris? Charlie. Short trip. Was it? Nothing much on the other side, I guess. You'd be surprised, Charlie. You'd be mighty surprised. There was a whole lot to be seen at that ram. A whole new land. And you know something else, Charlie? Us. People like us. We're the ones responsible. That's the truth. People like us. What's Orrin talking about? Listen, he's saying something. He wouldn't talk like that unless it was important. There'll be a highway. And machines. And a whole new land. And we're the ones who began it. What are you saying, Chris? Where'd you see all that? Up on the rim. It was all laid out before me like the... Like the New Jerusalem. Wide, hard roads, all black, with no holes in them, and machines, and... I gotta see for myself. Me too. Let's go. Up the ridge, he says. Chris, there's nothing down there. It's, it's just like this side. Sand and desert and miles and miles of nothing. Oh, but there will be, Charlie. There will be. Just you wait. It may not happen in our lifetimes, but it's coming. It'll be here, all of it, sooner than you think. If you can hold on to what I'm telling you and keep the faith. You didn't get him, Sheriff. I saw him all right, but I couldn't get him to stop. Fired a warning shot, but I didn't scare him none. Look, I wouldn't worry, Joe. He can't get very far. Don't worry, we'll find him. Thanks, Sheriff. 
You say he had a gun? That's right, a rifle. This it? It can't be. And that one's all rusty, like it's ready to fall apart. That's what I thought. He couldn't have done any damage with it. Look at it close, Joe. It is his rifle, but it's changed. It... It's just as if it had been lying in the desert for a hundred years. What's it mean? Who was he? Where did he really come from? I think... I think he went back to wherever he did come from. But... To where, Joe? Back to where he should be. Back to where he can make certain that the things it said in that book can happen. Back to a wagon train heading west to California on a spring day in 1847. Giddy up, boys. We're going to California. My son, too. He's got a whole lot to accomplish out there. A whole lot. Mr. Christian Horn, a farmer from the state of Ohio, one of the hearty breed who headed west when there were no blacktop highways or telephone poles or the solace of civilization. Mr. Christian Horn and family and their traveling companions, heading west after a brief detour through the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Hundred Yards Over the Rim, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Peggy Roeder, Rick Peoples, David Darlow, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Rich Kamenick, Meg Falcon, Zach Gray, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, Diane Trice, and Irene Olson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Corporation, how may I direct your call? Just a moment. Cooper Corporation. Coffee coming through. Who ordered coffee? With sugar and two creams. Right here. Thanks, Louie. You got it. Coffee here. Uh, do you have any Danish this morning? I got bran muffins, granola bars, and trail mix. Oh, no. What happened to the Danish? 
Dutch. Mr. Cooper's orders. Mr. Cooper, how come? He's on a health kick. Says Danish is bad for you. For the whole office? Everybody on the floor. He wants more work out of you. Oh, well. I suppose I'll have one of those granola bars. Is it chocolate coated? K Rob. Sounds positively yummy. Guess I'll give it a try. Hey, that's wrong, you know. What is, McNulty? Well, the pastries are bad for the brain. True, they're mostly sugar and starch, but so are muffins, huh? <laughs> granola bars? Granola bars have as much fat as 13 strips of bacon. Did you know that? And trail mix? <laughs> Forget it! Forget it! There's so many calories and saturated fats, you might as well eat a tub of popcorn, huh? <laughs> With butter! <laughs> <sighs> well, if Mr. Cooper wants to improve productivity... All I know is I got coffee with cream, cream and sugar, cream by itself, sugar by itself, or artificial sweetener. And that old favorite, all black. Take your pick. Ah, diversification. Now you, you're on the right track. As I always say, you can't run a business standing still. A business has got to move. A business has got to progress. You think about that now. Excuse me, I gotta progress through the office. Oh, yeah, so do I. We all do. A business has got to keep pushing, keep punching, keep prodding, keep moving forward. That's what a business has got to do. Now, you think about that. <laughs> Personally, I got to get a drink of water. <clears throat> you coming, Gertrude? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I think I better go with you. Ah, sounds good. I think I'll come along, too. Oh, that's, that's all right. right. Hey, did you know that water is the most important part of a healthy diet? We're almost all water. I mean, our cells feed off of it, right? <laughs> hey, you see that suggestion box on the wall? I personally told Mr. Cooper to get better quality bottled water. Huh? Huh? But the chemicals they put in it these days, I mean, think about it now. It's a disgrace. Not to mention. Submitted for your approval, or at least your analysis, one Patrick Thomas McNulty who, at age 41, is the biggest bore on Earth. He holds a 10-year record for the most meaningless words spewed out during a typical coffee break. And it's very likely that, as of this moment, he would have gone on through life in precisely the same manner. A dull, argumentative big mouth who sets back the art of conversation at least a thousand years. I say he very likely would have, except for something that will soon happen to him. Something totally unexpected that will considerably alter his existence and ours. You think about that now, because this is, after all, The Twilight Zone. And now we continue with our story from The Twilight Zone, A Kind of Stopwatch, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Um, you can taste the impurities. We need clean air, too. HEPA filters, air ionizers, the whole bit, huh, you know? And these rooms need a new paint job while they're at it, you know? I mean, a nice, soothing color. Come on, Angie. Let's go to the powder room. Yeah, I'm with you. Because we got to keep this company on track. You think about it now. We, we will. will. McNulty. Right here. Mr. Cooper would like to see you. Well... Well, you hear that, everybody, huh? <laughs> Mr. Cooper would like to see McNulty, huh? <laughs> and all because of that box right there. You know why Mr. Cooper wants to see McNulty? Because McNulty has been feeding him suggestions in that box for 11 months now. Did I say suggestions? Wrong word. Suggestions any Claude can give, huh? <laughs> but dynamic blueprints for the future only McNulty can give, huh? <laughs> you just think about that. Mr. Cooper's waiting, Mr. McNulty. In here, McNulty. Hi, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Do you know what I've been doing for the last half hour? You've been looking through the suggestion box. I knew it was going to happen one of these days, Mr. Cooper. I've been expecting it. You see, the thing of it is, 
It takes a very special kind of employer to recognize that one of his men has got it. And obviously, McNulty does. Truer words, McNulty, have probably never been spoken here or anywhere else. I have just gone through the residue of the suggestion box covering the past three-month period. Here is your suggestion dated March 13th. Make hot dogs flat so they can fit more easily into a hamburger bun. Well, how about that? Now you think about that now, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Make tin cans square so they can be stacked together more easily. Well, huh? <laughs> Isn't that a guess? You think about that, too. Put small pontoons in field packs of soldiers so that when they cross rivers, they can float. That's worth a million bucks as it stands, huh? <laughs> I mean, that one little suggestion. You see, the soldiers, they go into the water in the cans. Well, the cans, they're full of air, see, so... Mr. McNulty, the Cooper Corporation makes ladies' foundation garments. Not a single one of your 340 suggestions, repeat, not one of them, has anything remotely to do with this company's product. Right. See, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about that, too. What you ought to do is focus on new inventions for our customers. Our customers? Well, I've been doing some reading about pressure and leverage, the principles of engineering, and one of the greatest engineers of the 20th century was Howard Hughes. Why, did you know that he invented the cantilevered brassiere? Huh? <laughs> he invented a, a, well, an undergarment that actually defied the laws of gravity, huh? <laughs> like a suspension bridge. And if it weren't for his little invention, nobody would have ever heard of <clears throat> Jane Russell. Huh? <laughs> Did you know that? I believe this company is well aware of the history of our product lines, and they don't have anything to do with 1940s movie stars or eccentric old recluses with mental delusions. Exactly! The key to a successful business is diversification. More products for more kinds of customers. Now you think about that. I have thought about it, McNulty. Now you think about this. Yes, sir. You're fired! <laughs> Another round, McNulty? In a, in a minute. I'm, I'm still working on this one. Now over here, Joe. Coming right up. You know something? Oh, here we go again. With the long ball hitter, as opposed to the consistent clutch hitter with a big average, I will take the latter. Well, that's very nice of you to tell us, McNulty. Well, it's a fact that at no time, at, at, at no time, has the home run leader in either league led the league in batting at no time, which should tell you. Uh, Ted Williams won the batting championship and led the league in home runs in 1941, 42, and 47. The exception to the rule? <clears throat> Think about that now. The exception to the rule. Let me ask you something, McNulty. How come you're in here so early tonight? You've been sitting here now for three and a half hours. Well, for the simple reason that... Uh... I quit my job. No kidding. Yeah, I went into Mr. Cooper's office and I read him off. Just like that, you know, Cooper, I said. Don't tell me, McNulty. You got canned. Well, in, in, in a manner of, of speaking, you might say, well, yeah, we mutually agreed that I wasn't going to work there anymore. <sighs> Let me ask you something. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think... That after one year of putting suggestions in the suggestion box, after one whole year, I'd get noticed? McNulty, you want to know something? Getting noticed and getting liked are two different things. What do you know about it? Nothing, McNulty. Not a thing. All I know is that every week of every month except election day, you come in here and drive everybody out of their skull walking on your lower lip. Now you think about that little thing, will you, for my sake? Where's my other beer? Right here. Thank you, barkeep. 
If you don't mind, I think I'll find myself a nice, quiet table to sit at. Goodbye. Excuse me, my good man. Is this seat taken? It is now. Sir! You, uh, you want another one? Thank you. I would consider it a kindness on your part. <clears throat> one more over here, please. So, what's your name? What's my name? Potts. 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 Well, that's not such a bad name. It is the one I was born with. Seems to me there was a third baseman played for the Phillies one year. Seems to me his name was Potts. Let's see, it was uh, Lou Potts, Frank Potts. Could it have been Bots? No. Potts! You paying, McNulty? Because this old rummy already gave me his last dollar. This man is my friend. And I like a little respect from you while you're at it. I bet you would, McNulty. And you getting respect from me would be about as easy as flagging down a cab on 46 and Broadway at 8 o'clock on New Year's Eve in the rain. Here you go. So, what do you want to talk about? You want to, want to talk about baseball? Well, it is a great American pastime, and I am so glad that Abner Doubleday saw fit to invent it. To your health, friend. And now, to show my appreciation for your generosity, I have something for you. Consider it a gift. A small remembrance of our friendship. Ah, huh. what, what is it? It's an old family heirloom. A kind of stopwatch, you might say. Why, why do you carry it around? I, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's just a stopwatch, it doesn't keep... Keep time, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is a fact. But it's all yours nonetheless. Someday you might own a racehorse. Or you might want to run the four-minute mile. Who knows? Now you've got a stopwatch to time yourself. <laughs> I've been looking for someone to give it to. I myself am finally finished with it. Goodbye, old pal. <laughs> E pluribus unum. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you didn't finish your beer. You done for the night, McNulty? There ain't no more ears in here you can bend. You bored ten people to death and you emptied this place faster than a smallpox sign. Funny looking watch. Anyway, <sighs> I hate to go home, Joe. I mean, geez, you know, I mean, I already saw the picture on the late show. I mean, I even saw the one on the late, late show. Hey, McNulty, do me a favor, would you? Whenever you get the thirst, go to some other bar. Sometimes, you know, I wish I was I was married, cause <laughs> so I wouldn't have to go anywhere, you know. You ever get that feeling, huh? <laughs> <sighs> work this thing. Push the button on the top. I and another thing about you, McNulty, you make me nervous. First you come in here, and then What? <laughs> what what's going on, Joe? Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey, Joe. Why ain't you moving, Joe? Joe, why don't you say something? I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's like he was, was frozen. And what's with the TV? There was a game on. The guy started the pitch and... And... Well, you, well, you look at that. The ball's just... Hang in there. Did the TV freeze up or something? <laughs> Say, what is this? 
Something's going on. All I was doing was telling you about how bored I was, and then that crazy gleep gives me this watch here, and I push the button on it like this, and... And you bore people to death. And then you start to make me so nervous my back itches. And... F <laughs> hey, I kinda like this. Furthermore, it's getting so people don't stay very long in my establishment when you're around. You catch my drift? They stick their heads in, see you sitting here, and move on. In other words, you're costing me business, McNulty. Do I have to make it any plainer? So like I say, take it somewhere else, okay, pal? It's nothing personal. <laughs> I make you nervous? <laughs> you don't suppose... You don't suppose this, this watch here... You know something, McNulty? You're the one guy who makes me wish they never repealed Prohibition. And you know what I think, Joe? I think this watch, this watch, this watch is a very unusual one. That's what I think. A very, very unusual watch. Huh? <laughs> Hey, buddy, watch where you're going. Oh, 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 so, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my good man. Yeah, you should be. Excuse me. Begging your pardon, lady. Officer, oh, officer. Yes, ma'am? That man over there, I think he's drunk. Oh, he is, is he? He bumped right into me. You can see the way he's staggering. He can hardly stand up. Oh, it's a disgrace. Well, no, we'll just see about that. Hold on there, fella. Yes, uh, officer? Had a little too much to drink, did we? Well, I wouldn't say that. Not enough is more like it. <laughs> Why don't you just go home and sleep it off? You'll feel better in the morning. Yes, yeah, of course, of course. I'm, uh, I'm on my way home now, as a matter of fact. Walking, are you? I'd say you're in no condition. You know, you're, you're right, officer. I was... I was just thinking about that. Well, get along with you now. Why should a man have to walk at all, right? He could fall down and get hurt. Now, here's an idea for you. You make the sidewalks out of rubber, huh? <laughs> Think about that now, huh? No more injuries. You fall, you bounce right back up again. All the money the city could save. No more broken arms and legs to fix by the hospitals would save millions. Not to mention the, uh, the, uh, uh, insurance companies. I think I'd better call you a cab. Okay. I'm a cab. <laughs> you get it? You said I'll call you, and then I, I, I said, well. No more kidding now. Not at all. I, I don't I don't want a cab in, in the first place. I never stop for you. And in the second place, it takes too long on account of there's too much traffic in this city in the first place. Am I right or am I wrong? You tell me that. I'm not telling you nothing. Now listen, if you can't afford a cab, the subway's right at the end of the block. Now run along. Either that or I'll haul you in right now. On what charge, may I ask? Public intoxication. Plus, you're making a real nuisance of yourself. Now quit flapping your lips and get a move on, you hear? Of course I do, officer. I hear the wisdom of your words, and I have enjoyed this conversation immensely. A good evening to you, sir. Let's go. I think I better take you down to the station house. But why bother, huh? I mean, you know, as long as I can hail a cab, let me let me show you McNulty's method. <clears throat> you watch, and you think about it now, okay? Taxi! <laughs> there, yeah. I think I can see a cab now. That one, in the middle of the street. How nice of the driver to stop just for me. Hello there, driver. What, not speaking, huh? <laughs> well, let me see what I can do to fix that. What? Hey, who are you? How'd you get in my car? Never mind, I'm here now, aren't I? Okay, okay, where to? Home, driver. Take me downtown by the shortest possible route, and you think about it now. Sure thing.
Hey, 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 have you ever thought about this? Ban cars completely, you know, in, in, in the city at least for starters. Helicopters. Now that's the future. Your private copters, okay? Each one big enough to hold one person. You think about the savings in, in, in gas, pollution, and traffic jam, not to mention police meter maids, no parking zones. Anything you say, buddy. Yeah, yeah, you see, you see, all you, all you do is you, you take some electric golf carts and you retrofit them with propellers on top and you plug them in, you charge them up and... Here you go. This here is it, mister. Far as I go. I think I'm gonna pack it in for the night. Thank you, my good man. That's 1780. How's that? The fare. Make it 18 bucks plus something for the wife and kids. Now, you see, that's just my point. All that money and for what? I say ban the internal combustion engine. Springboard shoes would work just fine. All we need is a company to manufacture a prototype. You gonna pay me or talk me to death? Neither, to tell you the truth. Do, uh... Do you have the time? <laughs> huh? The time. Here. Let's have a look at my pocket watch, shall we? Um, have I, have I told you about it yet? This is really a very unusual watch. A kind of, um... Stop watch. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <clears throat> Allow me to demonstrate. Don't try to con me. All I want is for you to pay up. If you don't, I'm calling this in. It's a violation of the city code to defraud a- There. Isn't that better? So much more restful. <sighs> I think I'll go inside now and lie down. No, 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 no. Don't, don't you worry about it. As soon as I get to my apartment, I'll open the window and hit the button on this stopwatch again, and you'll be on your way. And tomorrow morning, so will I. In fact, from the way things are going so far, I say that your friend and mine, the one and only Patrick T. McNulty, is going to be the life of the party. Yeah? <laughs> you be sure to think about that now, won't you? Stand back, world. McNulty is walking through the universe. <laughs> yes, it is. And a good good morning to you, listeners. We'll be bringing you the Eye of All News at 7:27. Oh, I forgot to turn the blasted alarm off. But for now, here's an update from Weather Central. Some overcast this morning with scattered clouds this afternoon. And now, back to this morning's casual concert for the swinging set. Eh, wrong. There is nothing moderate about today, because today is the day that people start listening to McNulty. Unless... Uh, unless it was some kind of dream. Now, where is that crazy watch? Aha! Here! All right, now, let's give it the old test. Ah, my kind of town. Millions of people going to work. No imagination. But McNulty, now that's a different story. A man who's just full of ideas, so original, they don't have a word for him yet. But they will. If this thing works. Well... Here goes. <laughs> it's not a dream. It's not a dream. It's the goods. The real deal. This wonderful, gorgeous watch. I just push the button and everything stops. I mean everything. The whole world stops for me. <laughs> Get ready out there. McNulty steps up to the plate, he swings, and he swats it clean out of the park. The 
Jerry is. Oh, no. Not McNulty again. What's doing here? Maybe he's going to shoot up the place. Morning, Angie. McNulty? You look lovely this morning, as always. What's the suggestion this time? Because if you haven't got one handy, I've got one for you. Yes? Why don't you jump off a bridge? <laughs> Honey, baby, you don't mean that. Wait till you see what I got in my pocket. It'll put a dent in your eyeballs. Try the Brooklyn Bridge at midnight. You think about this now. You think about a stopwatch that, uh, if somebody pushes it, everything stops in midair. Everything, huh? Huh? Think about that. Without a life jacket. McNulty, why don't you get lost? What's the point? You see this little gimmick? It's a watch, so... So, last night, I'm sitting in Joe Pellucci's bar. Figures. We're talking about this and that, and this funny little gleep comes in and gives me this watch. Without thinking about it, I give it a push. This little button right here. And everything stops dead. Pellucci stops, the ball game stops, you know what else? Everything! That's what stops. You think about that. No kidding. Joe Pellucci and the TV, too. Well, thanks for the entertainment. Now get out of here! After I see Cooper, it's time to diversify. Now you wait just a minute, McNulty. Mr. Cooper's in conference. You bet he is. He's in conference with me. I thought I fired you, McNulty. What are you doing back here? Mr. Cooper, he barged right in. I couldn't do anything about it. Well, if he barged right in, he'll barge right out again. Hey, listen, Coop. Coop? You can't afford to fire me. This time, I got more than a suggestion. I got the goods. You figure out how this little doohickey works, and you got yourself all the money in the world. McNulty, once more I remind you, we make ladies' foundations, nothing else. Did you hear me? Nothing else. Now I'll give you 15 seconds to leave this room, 25 seconds to reach the elevator, 45 seconds to vacate the building, and you may use that, that watch to time yourself. Is that a fact? All right, then. I'll go. Just remember, you lost a fortune today. <laughs> what a gleep to me to let me show him. McNulty, if you're not out of here in one minute, I'll call the police. So, what am I waiting for? I'll show him anyway. I'll show you all! Hello, operator. Get me... Now, you put that phone down and come with me. That's right. <laughs> In here. Right on Cooper's lap. <laughs> How about that, huh? <laughs> nice coffee. Right in the middle of pouring it, huh? <laughs> and you, hey, sweetheart. I like your typing. Don't your hands get tired up in the air like that, huh? <laughs> <sighs> All right, so it's good for a laugh, maybe. There must be something else I can do with this thing. Help! Miss Hinkley, what do you think you're doing? Who's up next? Don't look now. It's the cleanup man. The guy could empty a baseball stadium, not to mention a bar. And if you don't spend three hours telling us how he'd run the Mets, he'll keep ootsing me about how I should run my own place. Hey, Joe. Hey, you want to hear a good idea? Why don't you make a swinging door like in the movies, huh? Maybe change the name of the place, Pellucci's Western Saloon. Hey, how about that? Hey, McNulty, how about that? I'll have it done first thing in the morning. Ah, oh, that's great. Then every time I come in, I'll push open a swinging door and I'll think, I did this. Wait, whoa, you're not putting me on, are you, Joe? McNulty, the only thing I'd put you on is a slow freighter heading with the other side of the world. See ya, Joe. Yeah, I'm out of here. Relax, boys, you're about to see something you ain't gonna believe. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, well, make it quick, huh? With this little gizmo right here, I can stop trains, buses, planes, subways. There ain't nothing in this world I can't stop. Yeah, what about your mouth? I gotta pour myself a drink. Watch this. All right, now, uh, hmm. I'll move your beer over here. And put yours in front of him. And let's see. How about if I undo your tie like this, huh? <laughs> oh, and Joe, over there. Hey, why look, Joe, where's your glass now, huh? You're going to be pouring beer in your hand, huh? <laughs> All right, okay. Here we go again. Oh, what the... Well? Huh? Well? Ah, come on now, what do you think about that, huh? Think about what? What, what, what are you kidding? You, did, you didn't see what I just did? Out of the way, McMullen. I want to make it home by the bottom of the eighth. See ya, Joe. Well, you done it again, McNulty. You emptied my bar. You drive more people out of saloons and carry nation. Oh, I get it. Of course you couldn't see what happened. Of course you couldn't. How could you? You guys got froze. I'm the only one who sees what's going on. The only one. See? So I got the greatest conversation piece in the world. The greatest? And what does it do? It stops conversation. Well, so it shouldn't be a total loss. You should order up. But drink it fast, will you? The combination of you, the hot weather, and my business recession is more than I can take for one day. Hey, Pellucci, look at me. What are you, some kind of sadist? Do you know what you're looking at? A jerk. A jerk, I'm telling you. A jerk, a nutsy, that's what you're looking at. You want to stop there or go for double or nothing? It's a fact. What do I want this thing for? I want to get a little notice, that's what. Well, let me tell you something, Pellucci. When John D. Rockefeller got out of a car, why did people go up to shake his hand? I'll bite. Why? Because he had dough. That's why. Lettuce, the old Mizzou. J.P. Morgan walks into a bar. The head waiter almost breaks his neck trying to get a table ready. Why? I'll tell you why. Because J.P. Morgan was loaded. You think about that now. And you think about this. As of today, McNulty's gonna be loaded too. I'm gonna have a limousine drive me up here. I'm gonna have a chauffeur open the door. I'm gonna walk into this crummy joint of yours and buy about 18 rounds for everyone. Huh? Huh? And then, and then, just for a laugh, I'll buy you a mortgage. You don't mind if I don't hold my breath, do you, McNulty? Pellucci, old pal, take a good long look. The next time you see me, I'll be the new McNulty. Why don't you go the whole route and move to Honolulu? Pellucci, tonight I'll be able to buy Honolulu. I'd like to make a deposit to my account. You have to wait in line. I want to cash this check. All in large bills, ma'am. Next customer in line. Is this where I make a withdrawal? Yes, sir. How much would you like? Oh, I don't know. How much you get? Sir? I'll take small bills. Lots of them. Just need your bank account number. Right here. Oh, you want me to get them for you? Oh, sure. No problem. Well, let's see. Oh, a bag of fives. And some tens. And, uh, <laughs> some twenties while I'm at it. Yeah, let's see that how to do it. Oh, don't worry, folks, it's only money. <laughs> it grows on trees. That's what it does, right? It grows on trees. For me. <laughs> <sighs> okay, here we go. One, two, three! My watch! <laughs> uh, oh, uh, well, it better be shockproof. Hey, hey, start already, come on. Hey, what's the matter with this thing? Hey, uh, hey. Everybody can start moving again, okay? All right, come on, come on, here we go! Up, 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 come on, let's go, come on, get with it! Hey! Hey, uh, any, any, anybody know how to fix a watch? Come on, come on, anybody, anybody, give me a little help here! Joe! Joe, please, please do something, say something, go ahead, you know, insult me. Please, 
Please, won't somebody do something? Or say something? Hey, please! Don't anybody, don't anybody know where I can get a watch fixed? I'm begging you. Please. Hey! Hey! Anybody! Anybody! Please! Please do something! Say something! Anything! Mr. Patrick Thomas McNulty, who was given the gift of unlimited time, he used it and misused it, and now he's been handed the bill. Mr. McNulty, who now controls the earth and everything on it. From this point on, he will eat well, live well, and have everything at his beck and call. But the thing he wanted most, the thing that gave him the most acute hunger, his need for a sympathetic ear, this he will never have again. Tonight's tale of motion and the lack thereof, and a man named McNulty in a place called the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Kind of Stopwatch starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rick Peoples, Mike Baccarella, Guy Burrill, Meg Falcon, Maggie Carney, Rich Kamenick, Doug James, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Irene Olson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Address? Yep, 2719, Ye Old Curiosity Shop. This is it. Oh, officers, I'm so glad you're here. You the one who called, ma'am? That would be my husband. Jensen, the detectives are here. How do you do? Mr. Brown, what seems to be the problem? Appalling, absolutely appalling. They broke in through the storeroom. That was the first thing we saw this morning. The back door off its hinges. My husband almost had a heart attack. All right, take it easy. Was anything missing? A number of items, I should say. 
the sense of violation. Our entire stock will have to be re-inventory. For the insurance, you know. Quite a number of items, a large number. Well, then I guess we'll have to take some pictures. Dust for prints. I consider it a personal invasion. The complete and utter disregard for boundaries for one's private space. You folks have a list of what was taken. Oh, we wouldn't know where to begin. So many things. A uh, Queen Anne chest. What was in it? I don't know. We could never get it open. I was going to have a key made. Hard to say what could have been in it. Almost anything. Jewels, family heirlooms. We bought it as is at an estate sale. What else? Uh, a Louis the Fourteenth washstand. Our pride and joy. Two antique children's chairs. Five vases. Six Ming Dynasty. Two hand-carved teakwood cigarette cases with platforms. Approximate value? One hundred dollars. He means two hundred. A tray of rings, three sapphires, three rubies, three emeralds. All genuine? Well, the rubies are actually... All genuine. And there was a 19th century silver service for eight. I mean, 12. Isn't that right, Jensen? And a dining room chair made in 1778. Let me see. Three paintings in frames. Early Picassos? Huh, that right. What about the stuff that was in the window? Oh, well, nothing of real consequence. Don't forget the other tray of rings, dear. Remember? The Native American baskets and... and the camera. One camera? A very special camera. One of a kind. Make? Well, it didn't have a name on it. At least we never could make it out. Foreign lettering. Indecipherable. Probably ancient. Never saw one like it before. It was here when we bought the shop. It was imported. Very rare. Very, very rare. At least a hundred years old. Okay, let's see what we got here now. Um, let's see, see, okay. Uh, six vases, uh, five ceramics, a Native American basket, jewelry. A tray of rings. All paste. Six vases of the Ming Dynasty. I don't know what dynasty they're from, but it ain't Ming's. They're from a rummage sale and they're worth a couple of shucks apiece. Chester, will you pipe down and let me read the article? Wasn't Playing no good larceny is what it is. That's nothing but a list for their insurance company. Why those crooks? Police theorize that the thieves broke in sometime during the night. Mr. and Mrs. Jensen T. Brown, the proprietors of the antique shop, listed the following additional items as among the goods stolen. A Louis XIV candelabra. A phony candlestick holder. For Liberace. Two antique children's chairs. Two thrift shop chairs for midgets. And a set of U.S. Navy surplus tableware. Plus a chest worth maybe $25 tops. Hey, listen to this. The paper says there's three oil paintings by Picasso. Yeah, three posters in dime store frames. The guy who painted them thinks a Picasso is a foreign sports car. Two teakwood hand-carved cigarette cases. All right, knock it off, knock it off. Here's something they forgot to put in the paper. A camera? Big deal. Well, it looks like an antique. When I was a kid, you could have bought this in a five and dime. But now, I get it as part of a heist. Perfect. The whole haul is worth maybe 50 bucks. A fence will give us 10, if we're lucky. I could have shot pool for half an hour and made more. Aw, oh, come on, Chester. You want to take my picture? You think that thing works? Well, let's give it a try. Even if there's film in it, it'd be so old by now that What I... do you got to lose? Huh, Chester? Please. Please. Scene of the crime, a hotel suite that in this instance serves as a den of thieves. The aftermath of a rather minor event to be noted on a police blotter. An insurance claim perhaps a three-inch box on page 12 of the evening paper. There's just one small item to be added to the list of loot. A camera. A most unimposing addition to the flotsam and jetsam that came with it. Hardly worth mentioning, really, because cameras are cameras. Some expensive, some available at the corner drugstore. But this camera, this one is unusual. Because in just a moment, we'll watch as it injects itself into the destinies of three people. For it happens to be a fact that the pictures it takes can only be developed in the Twilight Zone. And now, back to the Twilight Zone with A Most Unusual Camera, starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Please, Chester, take my picture. Look at this crummy thing. Foreign writing all over it. No place to open it up. Where do you put the film in? 
Maybe it's already got film in it. Yeah, sure. From the Ming Dynasty. And you think it's still good? Come on! See? You look through the thing on the top here. Now, this must be the button here. Wait, let me pose nice. Hold it, baby. Say cheese. Ta-da! Perfect. Fits right in. Everything else for nothing, so we get a camera that's for nothing. You and your curio shops. My curio shops? You cased the place. You fingered it. You did all the planning. Oh, listen to Miss Culture over there, the patron of the arts. Never mind hock shop, she says. No, let's go up in life. Let's not go off a curio shop because curio shops have nothing but objects of art worth a fortune. And who touted me? The art lover over there. Two weeks of planning, a whole night on the job, and what do we have, Paula? 400 pounds of junk. Yeah? Room service. Wait a minute. Room service, huh? I didn't order no room service. It's the law. What are we gonna do? Quick, dump all the stuff out the window. Hold on, Chester. I called for room service, okay? You did? To celebrate our newfound wealth. What'd you order? A breakfast for two with all the trimmings. How are we gonna pay for it, Paula? This room is costing me a fortune. Coming! Just leave it outside the door. <sighs> oui, monsieur. Very well. I'm not even hungry. How can I eat at a time like this? Uh, maybe a little coffee is all I need. Look, Chester. What's that sticking up out of the camera? It's the picture. I told you it'll work. Hey, let me see that. Well, how do I look? I don't know. Picture came out fine, just fine, but... Isn't that nice? You take good pictures, Chester. Well, there I am, standing by the window. Did you get a good look at this? And so clear. No flash or anything. And look how clear it is. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me think. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with me? Paula, go over to the mirror. What? Go ahead. Now look in the mirror. You're missing a couple of buttons on your shirt? Go on. Now look. Hmm. We look nice together, don't you think? We ought to get some pictures of the two of us. Will you look? So? What's to see? What you're wearing. You like my nightgown, Chet? I got it special for you. I like the way it sort of clings to my body. What do you think? Right, right. Now, look at the picture. So, there I am, standing by the window wearing a... A what? A fur coat! Oh. Yeah, a fur coat, which you don't have. Huh. Looks like mink. One of those Ember Autumn Haze models. Real pricey. Could be sable. Nah, I don't think so. It's a mink, all right. Chester, what am I doing wearing a fur coat? I wasn't wearing a fur coat when you took the picture, was I? Of course you weren't. I don't have that kind of money. I don't even own a fur coat. Chester, what is going on? I got it. I got it! Got what? It's a gig! A gag? A gag camera, strictly for laughs. What do you mean? You know, like at Coney Island. Remember? It looks like you're wearing a costume or something. I don't think so. Sure. Inside, they got these ready-made pictures already developed. But the negatives have already got a picture on them, see? The only thing this takes is the face. But... We ain't in Coney Island. You know, like a carnival when you pose in front of those crazy cardboard things. You put your head on top of the cutout. Fat lady, sailor, cowboy, driving a car, you name it. And it looks real. That's what this thing is. Not bad. That's kind of clever. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Well, we might as well clear up the rest of this junk. If you say so, what are we going to do with it? Who cares? Stuff it down a garbage chute for all I care. Except for these phony Ming flower pots. Chester, what'd you do that for? Now we gotta clean it up. No, we don't. Leave it for room service. We're paying enough. There's one thing we didn't open yet. Yeah? That little chest over there in the corner. Did it come with a key? No. You'll have to open it in your own inimitable style. There ain't a lock ever made I can't, Jimmy. Anybody ever tell you you had a lousy disposition? If I have a lousy disposition, it's because I'm married to a nickel and dime heister who can't tell a real diamond from a baseball diamond. Baby doll, this suite is costing an arm and a leg, delivered and paid for by Mrs. Diedrich's son, Chester, from profits collected during a slew of years when you weren't even in the picture. So happens that I need you like I need a three-time conviction. Well, aren't you the clever one? Let's see what's inside. Chester, look! I'm looking, but I don't believe it. The most beautiful fur coat I've ever saw. Full length, too. Oh, so we scored something after all. Hmm. 
we sure did. And don't start giving me any of your cheap pizzazz about taking this to a fence. I wouldn't dream of it. Don't argue with me either. This is for little old Paula. Look at these, like, stripes. Different colors, all mushed together. How do they do that? I think it's called Ember Autumn Haze. Like the one in the picture. Right. Exactly like the one in the picture. Come back to bed. In a minute. It's the middle of the night. Sure is, and I can't sleep. What are you doing by the window? Getting some fresh air. Are you still worried about the camera? Shut up. Yeah, you are. You're playing with it, aren't you? What do you care? Leave the light off. It's hot in here. It's not hot. We got air conditioning. What's it to you? You can't just let it go by, can you? You want me to forget about it? Is that it? So it's a crazy camera. So it takes dopey pictures of things that aren't really there. That's not the point. Oh, yeah? What is the point? Sure, it takes dopey pictures. Pictures like like things that haven't happened yet but do happen. That's the point. So what do we do, Chet? One lousy picture and you get insomnia? It's a camera. That's all. Here, I'll show you. Did you just take a picture? There. See any lightning? What did you take a picture of? It doesn't matter. The wall, the door. All right, now drop it, why don't you? Let it alone. Forget about it. How can I forget about it? This thing comes from... from witches, maybe, or... or sorcerers. Look at the writing on it. It could be loaded with black magic or something. Then what are you loaded with? Do you see anything? Where is the man with the horns who comes in with a bargain for your soul? He's supposed to show up any time now, right? But he's not here, is he? Listen to me. It's a screwy camera. Period. Let's see how this one came out. Well? Here. You tell me. It's my brother Woodward, standing by the door. That's who it is. It's that cheap, no-good brother of yours. But that's crazy. He's in jail. Seven years for breaking and entering, and that was only a year ago. So it's impossible. So was the fur coat, right, Paula? Oh, no. No, Chester. It's throwing us a curve. Maybe it's somebody who looks like Woodward. Chester, I'm scared. Feel my heart. I'm palpitating. A little palpitating never hurt nobody, and what's to be scared about? The thing has obviously gone tilt or something. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Woodward's not here. Woodward can't possibly be here. Woodward won't be here. Woodward is serving time. He's 900 miles away in a cell block, and I don't care what that crazy camera shows us. Who's ever in that picture ain't Woodward. What's that? Shh! Somebody's trying to jimmy the door. Go see. Please, Chester. But be careful. Woodward! Hi, Paula. Hello, Chester. I didn't want to wake anybody, so I just, you know, use the old lockpick on the door. Hope you folks don't mind. Mind? Why would I mind? But, but you are in jail, aren't you? I broke out. Me and another guy. Hit in the laundry truck. <laughs> nice, huh? I thought maybe I could stay with you for a few days. If you really don't mind. You don't, do you? I was thinking, maybe if I was around, you two wouldn't fight so much. You still all the time fighting? Hey, what you got in your hand there? A picture. Yeah? Let me see. Well, will you look at that? Yep, there I am, standing right by the door. Wearing just what I'm wearing now, too. Same clothes. Ain't science wonderful? Do you know what you're saying? Sure I do. I think it's great to be able to get a picture of... of... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah? If I was outside the door... Uh-huh. And you was in here... That's right. But you already have this picture of me. Right. Standing right here. Inside the door. Yeah, and? Then, like, how come? (laughs) 
Sleep well, Woodward? Uh, yeah. <sighs> Thanks for letting me use the couch. Think nothing of it. A growing boy needs his rest. What are we going to do today, Chester? I don't know yet. But I got a feeling it's going to have something to do with that camera. I still don't see how we can use it. Neither do I. As far as I can see, it's strictly for laughs. Well, maybe we could sell it. For some big bucks. You know, there's rich people might want something like that. For what? Well, to... To, uh, I don't know. Find out who's coming to the front door of, of their office. Like a hidden camera. See who's robbing them blind. You're in advance. Try selling them an item like that. They throw you out on your duff. Or some company. They could take it apart and see how it works and make new ones. No way. You'd never get in the door. They'd say you were off your rocker or burn you at the stake, one or the other. What do you think, Woodward? Oh, good call, Paula. Ask the intellectual in the crowd. We could... We could... Sell, like... Tickets. Yeah, that's it. Set up a place, like, uh, a stand somewhere, to take pictures. Like at a carny, right? Or maybe, maybe we could, you know, like that. Thank you, Einstein. Now look, I'm gonna lay it on the line. What are we? What do you mean? I asked a question. What are we? What are we, Chet? You mean us? Well, we're... We're people. I guess. Sure, sure. But what kind of people? With three minor league heisters, grifters, con artists. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, that's it. Well, now we finally got something here that maybe might do good for somebody else. Like who? Science. Science could use something like this. For what? For people, you lughead. We got something here for humanity. Who? Human beings. The world. I'm not so sure we shouldn't just give this to humanity and... Do something good for the first time in our rotten lives. You got a leak in your attic? What's humanity ever done for us? Sure, Paula, sure. That's what I mean. Just what you said. what I say? That's the way we are. Everything for us. Not for anybody else. Yeah, we're family. Little, petty, selfish, mean. That's us. Well, I've risen above all that now. I say let's give this to the world. Here, world, a gift from Chester Diedrich. And his wife. And me too, Chet. Don't forget me. Yeah, 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 and Woodward. So here's a gift for humanity. A gesture is all, maybe. Just a gesture. But it shows the heart of Chester Diedrich and his wife and his brother-in-law. How do we... <clears throat> Woodward, do me a favor. Pretty through your nose. Huh? Why don't you go watch TV? Isn't there something you want to watch uh, to occupy that brain of yours? Oh, yeah. Sure. How do we know the things medical science could do with this? How do we know how valuable this will be as a scientific discovery? They'll name a building after us. Throw big society balls and charity stuff for us. I can see it now. The Chester Diedrich Foundation for the... The, uh, the... Terminal is something or other. In the Los Tendros opener, Hotfoot has just won it. Jerry's Flash second, Easter Baby third. This was Hotfoot's second win in three days. He paid twenty-four ninety, fifteen eighty, and six seventy. We now move into the second race. Shut that in off. I'm making plans. Oh, sure, Chet. Anything you say. Oh, where was I? Hi, society. I can wear my mink coat. Of course, I'll need a couple of new dresses and some matching shoes. Hold on. Well, maybe just one dress to start with. You know, a real evening gown with... I got it. You sure do, Chester. I never would have thought of that. I got it. Got what? I got it! The TV set! Woodward, you're a genius. I am? This camera takes pictures of things that happen, but haven't happened yet. Uh, I guess. Read my lips. It took a picture of Paula with a fur coat. Five minutes later, she had a fur coat. It took a picture of that door with nobody standing in front of it. And then you were standing in front of it. Follow me? Uh, no. All right, boys and girls. Now get this. We go to the racetrack, right? I'm starting to get it. We take a picture of the winner's board at the track before the race. I think I get it. The winner's board before the race. That's a great idea. But... 
I don't get it. Hold on now. We take a picture of the winner's board, and then we... we look at it and... Oh! Chester! Woodward, are we getting through to you yet? We take a picture of the winner's board. It's empty, see? Because the race hasn't been run yet. But that camera, that little old bugger over there, it takes pictures of things that happen five minutes later. So the picture we get will have the winning numbers on the board. We know what horses come in and what they paid. <laughs> now I get it. Come on, everybody, get your coats. Woody, my boy, grab one of mine and put on a tie so you can be in disguise. Oh, Chester, this is so exciting. That was the first race. We can get there in time for the last four. How much dough has everybody got? Uh, I got a 20 and a 10. That's 30. I know it's 30. I got two 10s and three 20s. Come on. Okay, and the old insurance, my $100 bill. That makes 180 and 30. You got anything for the pot, Woodward? Yeah, I got 10. 220 bucks. Is that enough? There's bound to be at least one long shot. Why, we can parlay this into a million if we work on it long enough. We can't lose, Paula. We simply can't lose. Come on, everybody ready? Chester, what about humanity? Humanity? Like you said, baby, what did humanity ever do for us? Let's get going. Give me the camera. Let me see. The camera. You brought it, didn't you? Right here, Chester. I was just teasing. I'll brace it on the rail to keep it steady. Oh, boy, Chet. Oh, boy, you got us an idea here. My ribs aren't bothering your elbow, are they? No, not at all. Then let loose of me. Let me get the picture. Did you get the board? I got it. Are you sure? I'm sure. Now what do we do? Now we wait for the picture to come out. Don't we have to develop it first? Take it to a drugstore or something? Oh, for crying out loud. No, see, it comes out of this little slot on the top. Yeah? Neat. Sometimes it takes a little while. How long? The race is going to stop pretty soon. All things come to him who waits. Oh. Which horse do you like? I don't know which one I like yet. On account of I haven't looked at the picture yet, okay? Uh-huh. I like the number five horse, Tinky Beggar. It suits you. Peanuts, hot dogs, get your red hots here. Over here! Oh, no. Wait five little minutes and you can buy all the hot dogs you want. Right now, everything we have goes on the horse. Which one? Well... Look at it. Six, three, and eleven. And look what six pays. Forty-seven, sixty to win. Hand me the racing form. Here you go. Number six, number six. Tidy two, that's number six. Okay, kids, we bet our money on Tidy 2. I don't like the looks of that horse. He's walking real slow. Will you get it through that thick skull of yours? We can't lose. Stay right here, and don't let anything happen to that camera. What's your bet, sir? Put it all on number six. The works. Number six it is. Here's your ticket. Thanks. Psst. Hey, Jack. Get out of my way. Not number six. That's tidy, too. The last jockey that horse had was Paul Revere. But I mean the original Paul Revere. Now, if you really want to make some dough, I got some information in my pocket here. The goods on the last two races, and all I need from you is cash. You and me could go partners and really make ourselves a bundle on this. I got a tip for you. Bet anything but number six so you don't lower my odds. See you later, Jack. Rounding the far turn, it's Tinky Beggar, Sir Minus, Pink Gloves, Bart Jr., Lady Deck. Coming in the stretch, Tidy 2 coming up very fast on the outside. Now in the stretch, Tinky Beggar, Sir Minus, and Tidy 2 is third. Tidy 2 moving up. Tinky Beggar and Tidy 2 back in there. It's tiny too! It's tiny too all the way! We did it! Now, just you feast your eyes on the numbers. Six, three, and eleven! 
Just like the picture said. Are we rich yet? We're getting there, Junior. We're getting there. Now let me set up the camera before the next race. Paula, you two go cash in. Here's the ticket. And don't drop it. Okay, Chester. I sure hope you got enough film for that camera of yours. Why, you know, Woodward? That's a very intelligent comment. Film. I wonder where you go to get film for a camera like this. Oh, but I wouldn't worry about it. Chester will figure it out, I'm sure. Want another glass, Chester? No, no. I'm on the phone. Yeah? Yeah, but when can I get a delivery on something like that? No, 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 no. I don't want the black one. It's got to be yellow with black upholstery. Spoked wheels, continental kit on the back, dual exhaust, power everything, the works. You got that? Now when can I get a delivery? All right, then order it. No, 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 no. I'll pay you in cash. Come over with the papers tomorrow morning. We'll settle it then. How much did you say it was? No, I'm not backing out. I was just thinking. Maybe I ought to get two. Huh? Well, you bring the papers. Fine. So long. It's the room service waiter. Are you done with your snack, Woodward? I ate the steak, but I can't finish all the chicken. I guess that'll hold me till dinner, though. Yes? I came for the dishes, madame. Right over there on the coffee table. Can you bring a couple of more bottles of champagne on the way back? Yes, madame. I can easily do that. Hey, get your hands off the camera. Let them look at it. Bet you've never seen anything like that, Pierre. Me no. Most unusual, sir. Isn't it, though? You don't know how unusual. But what do you do after your ten pictures? Is there any other way to get more film? Well, we've only had it for a little while and... We... What did you say? Yeah, what did you say about ten pictures? The inscription on the outside, it says... These are the proprietaire. That means ten to an owner. I presume that means you may only take ten. It's so odd. The lettering is definitely French, but I've never seen a French camera like that. As a matter of fact... Thanks. Bye. Uh, all right. How many pictures have we taken? There was one of Paula. Then one of Woodward. Six. We've had six races. That means we've taken... Eight. We've taken eight pictures. Chester... There's only two left. Ten. But how do we know what that means? Some frog waiter tells us it means ten, so right away we think we only got two pictures left? How does he know what it means? I bet you we could take as many pictures as we want. But we don't know. Chester, we can't take any chances. No, we can't. You know what we should do? We should sell it. Who rattled your cage? This don't even belong to you. You're strictly for charity, buddy. Now what we should do with it is go back to the track and bet two more races with it. Are you both crazy? What you do with it is hang on to it. Save it for a rainy day. Careful! You stop it. You're going to break the camera. It took a picture. You dropped it and wasted a picture. I didn't drop it. You did. Oh, palpitations. You and your palpitations, phony palpitations, and a stupid brother. Hey, look, I don't have to take that kind of guff off of you. All right, all right, have a drink. Give me the camera. What's in the picture? It's me. It was pointing at me when it went off, and it looks like... like I'm... She's screaming. Let me see that. Get your hands off. Why is she screaming in the picture, Woodward? I'll tell you why she's screaming. She's screaming because somebody's trying to do something to her loving husband. Some stupid ex-con with an idiotic idea about selling a camera to the highest bidder. And who doesn't care what he has to do to get it? Well, we'll see about that. Put the knife away. If she's screaming in the picture, it's on account of what some guy must be doing to her loving brother. You better put that knife away, Chester. You put her away. I'll take it and peel your skin off. <laughs> Try to take my camera. Try to cut me, will you? Stay away from the window. Watch out! <laughs> oh, Chester. Chester, my...
my poor darling husband. And Woodward. Woodward, my brother, my flesh, my very own flesh. I'll die. I will simply die. There's nothing left for me now. Except this suitcase full of money. How thoughtful of you, Chester. Well, don't worry about me. I'll muddle through somehow. We have to learn to live with tragedy. Poor Chester. And poor Woodward. My heart is simply... Simply too full to say any more. May you both rest in peace. Now, where is that camera? Here. One picture left, huh? One more picture to remember you boys. For posterity. Pardonnez-moi. Oh. How did you get in here? I have, uh, how you say, the key. There is something in the way of laundry that I should take, no? You got the wrong room, Jack. There's no laundry up here. I'm checking out. There is the matter of dirty laundry. And your two friends, they have checked out already. Ah, yes, I see them. Such a pity. Lying down there in the courtyard. So young. One moment full of life, vim, vigor, and the next moment, poof. What do you think you're doing with that suitcase? Doing? But, madame, I told you I'm here for the laundry. I'm, how do you say, cleaning you out. You're cleaning me out? And while you're doing that, Jack, what do you think I'll be doing? Well, I'll kill you, buddy. I'm going to be calling the cops. Uh, cops? You mean the gendarmes? <laughs> you will forgive me, but if you call the police, Madame will get herself into, how do you say, one fantastic bind. Dear lady, I know all about you. I did some shaking. You, your husband, your brother, you're wanted. So the money is up for grabs. Why, you little rat! And as for the police... I advise you to get out while you can. When they see what's in the courtyard down below, they shall be up here sans invitation. Translation, uninvited, if you catch my meaning. So you walk out of here with the loot, and I get nothing but a big fat goose egg? At your service. Now, as to the laundry, it may be back on Thursday, or maybe Friday, or maybe never. And the camera. But I am not a hog. I leave the picture with you. Sacre, no, this is a picture of the courtyard below. Well, sure it is. I just took it. And if you don't mind, I think I'll just keep it. As a souvenir. But how can this be? In the picture, there are more than two bodies. More than two? Then well, who else is down there? Watch your step, madame, the broken glass. You will trip and hurt yourself. <sighs> yes, there are more than two bodies, just as the picture shows. Uh, one, two, three, four. That is impossible. Wait, let me see. Oh, the camera... There it is. I can see it from here. If I lean out a few... Uh, uh, ah! Object known as a camera. Vintage uncertain. Origin unknown. But for the greedy, the avaricious, the fleet of foot, who can run a four-minute mile so long as they're chasing a fast buck, it appears to be an ally. But appearances are deceiving. It isn't at all what it seems. It's really nothing more than a beckoning come on for a quick walk around the block in the Twilight Zone.
Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A most unusual camera starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Elissa Fraden, Rich Komenik, Brooke Reed, Christian Stolte, Turk Muller, Roger Wolski, Carl Amari, and Doug James. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Yes. Hiya. Sorry, we're closed. Is this the Southside Loan Company? I said we're closed. Well, it don't look like it. Well, I was about to turn the sign around. This will just take a minute. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> well, see, that's just it. I, I can't come back tomorrow. Nine to six, Monday through Saturday. Say, you got a nice shop here. A little bit of everything, huh? Bring in the merchandise, no radios, typewriters, or fishing poles. I pay top dollar. You do, huh? I have to lock up now. Bet you got a lot of rings, jewelry, watches, stuff like that. All in the safe. Bye now. The safe, huh? What about this vase? Worth plenty, I bet. I told you. I'm closed for the night. What do you want, anyway? Just this. Oh! <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll close up for you. Now just point me at the safe and I'm out of here. Probably in the back room. Didn't even lock it yet. What a loser. Now you're talking. Diamonds? Gold? This is worth a fortune! What? What are you doing? Calling the cops? That ain't very nice now, is it? I finished you off when I had the chance. Now I gotta use the back door. Hold it right there. Put your gun down and throw your hands over your head. Not this time, screw. I ain't going back in the joint. Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Miss me! Eat lead, copper! The alley's a dead end. You ain't going anywhere. 
We'll see about that. Oh! Portrait of a man at work. The only work he's ever done. The only work he knows. His name is Henry Francis Valentine. But he calls himself Rocky, because that's the way his life has been. Rocky and perilous and uphill, at a dead run all the way. A thin, pale, stubby fox of a man who has eluded the hunter until tonight. He's tired of running, of wanting, of waiting for the breaks that came to others but never to him. Now he thinks it's all over, but he's wrong. For Rocky Valentine, a new career is just beginning. In the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Nice Place to Visit. Starring Hal Sparks with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Mr. Valentine? What? Mr. Valentine. Who are you? I'm known as Mr. Pip. Can I help you? Get your hands off me. I can do it. How do you know my name? It's my job to know everything about you, Mr. Valentine. I hope you don't consider me presumptuous, but I see that you're in need of your cop. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I guess not. White shoes, white suit, white hair, some outfit. Never saw a cop dressed like that. I'm your guide, as it were. <laughs> guide? What? Whatever you may desire. I'm at your service. <laughs> that, I need like a hole in my head. <sighs> I'm dizzy. What happened? You had an accident. Lost your step, so to speak. Some accident. Must have fell flat on my face. Don't worry. Soon you'll be as fit as a fiddle. Come along now. I'm sure you'll want to get out of those rumpled clothes. Clean up a bit. I told you, keep your hands off the merchandise. If I've said anything to offend you... Answer the question. Question? I want to know how come you know my name. <laughs> I believe I already told you. You told me nothing. We clue you, fatso. I don't like games. Oh, but that isn't true. You call me a liar? Not at all, sir. But according to my notes, you like games very much. Roulette, blackjack, poker, craps. Let me see that. Between the ages of seven and ten, you were quite fond of mumbly peg. Say, what do you want, anyway? One thing and one thing only, Mr. Valentine. Your comfort. My job is to see to it that you get what you want. Whatever it may be. Ha! Your heart's desire, as it were. It's a pretty big assignment, pal. I know. And I must say, I'm rather looking forward to it. I'm sure it will entail a good deal of activity. <laughs> now, shall we go? What if I don't want to? What if I got other plans? Then, of course, you don't have to. It's entirely your decision. From now on, what you ask, you shall receive. Yeah? In exchange for what? How do you mean? What do you get out of it? Oh, nothing at all, Mr. Valentine. I assure you, the service is free. Don't put me on, fat boy. Nothing's free. Nothing. Anything I ever got in this lousy world I had to take. You know why? Because there wasn't nobody going around passing out favors. I'm sure there wasn't. So what's the pitch? You want me to pull a job for you? Is that it? I'm afraid you don't understand. No? We'll see about that. Guess what I got in my pocket? I'm sure I wouldn't know. A 38, that's what. Take my word for it. If you like. Oh, wise guy, huh? Well, here's a good look. Okay, Santa Claus, hand over your wallet. But I don't have a wallet. Sure, sure. Tell me another one. Honestly. Wait, wait, Mr. Valentine. It isn't really a wallet you want, is it? I do carry petty cash. Take it out. Real slow. Certainly. Here you are. Give me that. Three, four, five, seven hundred bucks! 
Will that be enough for now? You got more where that came from? Oh dear, yes. <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> I don't believe this. Now, shall we go? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Fats. Yes? Well, try nothing funny. I wouldn't think of it. Here we are, the penthouse. Hey, now. You like it? Sure I do. Oh, I'm relieved. Some pad, all right. Lots of mirrors, a bar. Look at that stereo. This is class, man. Real class. Chinese modern, I believe they call it. I was afraid you might find the red velvet walls a bit much. Not on your life. Who's it belong to, some crooked politician? Why, it belongs to you, Mr. Valentine. That is, if you approve. You kidding? This is to die for. Of course, we can make any changes you wish. I wasn't sure about the pool table, but I thought we'd give it a try. Mr. Valentine, are you all right? You mean all this gets thrown into the deal? There's no need to negotiate. It's already in the deal. Look here. What? Didn't you notice what it says outside the door? Read the nameplate. Henry Francis Valentine. You see? This is now your residence. No kidding. Now, if you'll please follow me. And this is the master bedroom. Wow! That's a real king-size bed, huh? Emperor size. I dig the mirrors in the ceiling. Bathroom in there. Now then, I'm sure you'd like a change of clothes, freshen up a bit? Yeah, sure, but but first, first you gotta give me the pitch. I thought I explained. Come on, the gimmick, the angle, the catch. What do I gotta do for all this? Nothing. <laughs> I can't tell you any more than I already have, honestly. All right, all right, I get it. You're just a goon. I am? A messenger boy, servant. You work for somebody, right? Well, yes, in a way. When do I get to see him? See? Mr. Big, your boss. Oh, I really couldn't say. Okay, goon, that's fine by me. I can wait. So what's next? As I was saying, this is your wardrobe. I hope you'll find something that suits you. That's pretty funny. Suits. <laughs> Regular comedian. How many you got in here? Oh, dozens. Hundreds, perhaps. I haven't counted them. <laughs> something for every occasion. Any particular color or style? Nah. I don't care. You pick it. Oh, I could hardly presume to do that, sir. However, keeping in mind your taste, let me see. Perhaps a nice pinstripe, if the lapels that you're liking. That'll do. And to go with the dark material, a nice tie. I believe your favorite color is yellow. Mm -hmm. Splendid. It should go well with, let me see, a new pair of um, brown shoes, like the ones you have on. Well, sir? Make up your mind. What's the matter, you got no taste? My taste doesn't matter. Perhaps these, a smart black and white pair with tassels and pointed toes. Fine. I'll just lay your selections on the bed. Shirts, socks and underclothes in the drawer. Quite a large stock. And in this ebony case, a selection of jewelry and accessories. Jewelry, huh? Let me see. Cufflinks, Titax, rings, watches, a little bit of everything. I'll draw your bath. Yeah, you do that. You do that. All ready, Mr. Valentine. I've adjusted the water to medium hot. Hey, between you and me, Fats, who do they want me to bump off, huh? Must be somebody important, you know? A real VIP. Oh, no, sir. As I've already explained. I know, I know. It's free, because I'm such a good guy. I'll leave the room while you bathe. 
sit right there and wait. Yes, sir. I'll be out in a couple of minutes. Take your time. Please. Hey, Fats. Yes, sir. Don't try anything while I'm in here. I got my gun with me. One wrong move and your Swiss cheese, you understand? Perfectly. When I tell you, pass in my new clothes one at a time. Absolutely. And no funny business. Hey, hey, check out the new duds. Very impressive, sir. Everything fits. Of course. I'll say this, your guy sure knows his threads. Now, Mr. Valentine, if you'll follow me to the living room. What's all this? I took the liberty of calling room service. I thought you must be getting hungry, so... Would you order the whole menu? A little bit of everything. All your favorites. Steak, potatoes, spaghetti with meatballs, a hero sandwich, French fries, ketchup, chicken noodle soup, peanut butter and jelly, fried chicken strips, donuts, and a banana split. Won't you have a seat? Uh-uh. You first. No, thank you. I'm not asking. I'm telling. I want to see you taste everything. Oh, but I don't eat. So I was right. You're in on it. I haven't eaten in... Why? It must be two or three centuries. That's a good one. Eat! Or is there something wrong with it? No. Then chow down! I can't. I've forgotten how. Pretty slick. You give me a bath, some clothes, then poison me. I'll tell you something. You gotta get up pretty early to put one over on Rocky Valentine. You think you're smart, don't you, Fats? Yeah, you're smart, all right, but you're not smart enough. What are you doing? Just this. If you won't eat the food, you're gonna eat lead, big boy, because this here is the final course. You have me at a disadvantage, sir. I didn't expect the bullets to have such impact. I'll clean up the broken dishes. You got a bulletproof vest under that white suit, huh? Pretty slick. Okay, let's see how your head holds up right between the eyes. Mr. Valentine, please. Huh? I, I couldn't have missed, not at this range. That's just it. You didn't miss. Maybe there's something wrong with the bullets. Try that mirror over there. What in the... Mr. Valentine, perhaps you'd like a drink. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Where's the scotch? Here. Hold on. Where'd this whiskey come from? It wasn't here a minute ago. I know. I provided it in case. What do you mean you provided it? What are you, a magician? What's going on? This ain't no regular apartment. Where am I? You might want to sit down. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Valentine. Do you remember when we met earlier this evening? I told you I was, in a sense, your guide. And you said you needed a guide like a hole in the head? Yeah. Well, as a matter of strict fact, you had a hole in your head only a short time ago. What are you talking about? A bullet hole. The policeman, remember? In the alley. They yelled for me to stop. And I didn't, but they... You mean I'm dead? Why, yes! By Jove, you've got it! Then if I'm dead, all this stuff, the penthouse, the booze, the free clothes... I must be in heaven. You're my, you're my guardian angel, right? Something like that? Yes, Mr. Valentine, something like that. But uh, And I can have anything I want. Anything. Big talk, fatso. Let's see some proof. Proof? Real proof. Right now. I want money, moolah, simoleons, cold hard cash. I gave you what I had in my pocket. Chump change. I'm talking about real money. Make it a million. A million dollars? And 5G bills. As you wish. Okay, where is it? Look in that drawer. Under the desk. You put me on a million bucks. But what am I supposed to do with it? I don't, I don't want to spend it all by my lonesome. No. That's no fun. I need a chick. 
I take it you're using a slang term. A broad, a dame, you know, make sure she's stacked. Curves all over the place, you dig? I'm not sure. I... Let me spell it out for you. Beautiful. Oh, now I understand. So, when does she get here? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Who are you? I, I mean... My name's Lita. What's yours? Uh, <laughs> you did good, Fats. Real good. Thank you, sir. Do you mind if I dance? Go right ahead. Mm. When I hear music like this, I just... Oh, I don't know. I get this feeling and I have to move my body. Me too. May I have this dance? Mm, I thought you'd never ask. Hi, you doll. Hi, yourself. Call me Rocky. Now I know I'm in heaven. <clears throat> Will there be anything else? Not right now, Jeeves. Very good, sir. But hang around. I might need you later in case I want more. Of course, Mr. Valentine. No more bets, please. No more bets. Hurry up, Rocky. Yeah, what are you gonna do? Are you all finished? Not on your life, sweetheart. How about 33 red? 33 red! Yeah! Hey, the gentleman in the pinstripe suit. Rocky, you're the man. The bat. <laughs> How about that? I win again. Hey, Fats! Something I can do for you? No, something I can do for you. Put your money on the table, right there. 14 black. Rocky's hot tonight. Am I right, dolls? You sure are. He is. He's a winner. I'm afraid I don't have any money. You don't? Well, what do they pay in? Halos or something? Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Combinations, odd and even. Okay, let's go. No more bets. Come on, come on. 14 black. 14 black. Yeah. That makes what? 80, 80 grand. Closer to 100. In an hour. How about that, Bats? Is Rocky hot or is he hot? He is most definitely hot. Hey, Lita. What, Rocky? Open your purse. Go cash these in for me, okay, babe? Sure. Hold on. Yeah? A hundred G's, sweetheart. I count real good, get me? Don't worry, Rocky. Be right back. What now, sir? Come on, let's see what's shaking with the cubes. I got this table spooked. Very well. The dice table is this way. No more bets. Oh, there's a slot machine. You want to play, doll? Can I? Sure. Here's a silver dollar. Wait a minute. I'll put it in for you. I got the magic. Jackpot! I told you. <laughs> Would you like me to carry them for you? Yeah, sure. And give the ladies a tip. Very good, sir. Seven out. Line away. Oh. Step aside. Let me show you how it's done. That, sir? Here's your money, Rocky. Put it on the line. All of it, sir? Why not? When you're hot, you're sizzling. Money talks. Get your bets down. Hard ways, horn bets, any craps. Breathe on them for me, doll. Sure, Rocky. New shooter coming out. Yo, 11. <laughs> Here you go, doll. Go get yourself a new dress or something. Something skimpy. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Rocky. How much loot we got? Approximately 200,000. Bet, sir. Let me see. Give me a proposition. How much for another 11? 16 to 1. Put everything on 11. Maybe you should hold some back, Rocky. Don't make me laugh. I'm going to buy and sell this joint. Same dice. Yes, sir. 
Get some for me. If you say so. Same good shooter coming out, looking for a point. Yo, Alev, winner, winner, frontline winner. I'll have to get you a briefcase for your winning yourself. You do that, Fats. Get two, get a whole bunch of them. I ain't stopping now, not the way my luck is running. Never had a night like this. Play your bets. Okay, buddy, buddy, let's do it again. Same bit, same bet. Hey, I'm dry as a bone. Anybody get me a drink or what? I'll get it for you, Rocky. Me! 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 Pressing 11, all bets down. Come on now. Like the song says, luck be a lady. Move your car, please. This is a no parking zone. Uh, whew! Making money really takes it out of you. Uh, where's the loot? I have two briefcases, sir, and the ladies each have one. Good, my arm's sore. They're heavy. I don't mind. Where are we going now? Now get your car, sir? Yeah, big convertible, pink and white. And be careful with it, you hear me? Yes, sir. Loading and unloading only, no parking. Huh, something bothering you, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, him. The policeman? He's only doing his job, maintaining order. Lousy screws. Think they're the king of the hill just because they got a badge and a few lousy inches? How do you mean? Every cop I ever see is about six and a half feet tall. Look at him. Lording it over everybody. Oh dear. That was indiscreet of me. I should have realized. Not your fault. Oh, but it is. I'll fix it for you. Officer? Yeah? Come over here for a moment. Yeah, what do you want, mister? Better? Sure is. Hey, screw! May I help you? Your hat's on, crooked trooper. Now get out of my sight, your mother's calling you. Here's a kick in the pants to get you moving. I'm going. I'm going. Ha 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 ha! Look at him running on those little legs. I sure showed him, didn't I? <laughs> Your car, sir. Ah. Oh, okay, kid. Here, you keep the change. Oh, that's a hundred dollar bill. Knock yourself out. Come on, let's blow this joint. I'll drive, if you like, sir. I like. <laughs> okay, Fats, put the pedal to the metal. Whatever you wish, Mr. Valentine. Broad's in the back seat, hang on. Should we fasten our seat belts? Maybe we're better. It wrinkles my dress. Hey, what do you say we open her up and see what this baby will really do? Very well. We're gonna crash. Not on your life. I got all the luck tonight. Punch it, Pip. <laughs> Man, this is really living, huh? In a manner of speaking, Mr. Valentine. In a manner of speaking. Where's my pad? Just at the end of the hall. Fats, do me a favor. Yes? I want to get rid of that heap we've been driving. Is anything wrong? It seems to go fast enough. Yeah, but the ashtrays are full. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a note. Change car. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is it, Mr. Valentine? We forgot the suitcase is full of dough. Oh, yeah. He's right. I set mine down and... No need to worry. After all, you can win it back tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Hey girls, go on inside. I want to talk to Fats. Okay. Sure, Rocky. We'll wait up for you. What's on your mind? How about tomorrow we look up some of my old buddies, like Mike Fink and Mac Gorman and Silky Armstrong? Hmm. What's the matter? Didn't they make it? Oh, it isn't that, Mr. Valentine. It's... Well, you see, all of this is your own private domain, as it were. It was made for you alone. What about the broads? I mean, they're extras, like in a movie? In a sense, yes. Everyone here is, except, of course, you and me. Oh. Well, we'll just party it up tonight anyway. You too, of course. I'm not permitted, sir. 
Why? Angels ain't supposed to have fun? Come on, who's to know? Sorry, sir. Man, you really pulled rough duty with this job, didn't you? It has its compensations. If that's so, let me ask you a question. Go ahead. Something's been kind of bugging me. Don't get me wrong. I ain't ashamed of my life. You know, anything I did, well, I, I did it because I had it. You understand? Perfectly. Of course, I ain't saying I was the greatest guy in the world. Maybe I made a few wrong moves, but, you know, like a shrink said one time, I'm sort of a victim of my environment, you know? Can't get away from that, right? Whatever you say. I never got a break, you know, never. Old man a drunk, old lady a tramp, no lousy dough in the house. I mean, what do they expect? I should grow up to be president? The thing I want to know is, how come they let me in here? I thought this place was for school teachers and like that. Oh, we have some school teachers here, Mr. Valentine. Well, must have been something real good I did once, something that made up for everything else, huh? Yeah, maybe that's it, but what was it? What I ever do that was good? So, uh, how do I find out? We have a hall of records. It isn't far. Perhaps you would like me to take you there. They open now? They're always open. Let's go. Wh wait, what, what about the dolls? Don't worry, sir. Something tells me they'll fend for themselves till you get back. Right this way. I'll ring for the elevator. Will you look at this? The files are over here, sir. It's the biggest room I've ever been in. You can't even see the ceiling. Strictly speaking, there isn't one. Valentine. Hmm. The V's should be in one of these cabinets. How'd they get all the fog on the floor like some kind of movie? I'm afraid the movies are only a pale imitation. Here, this should be the one. V. 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 Ah, here it is. Henry Francis Valentine. That's me. Born Brooklyn, New York, cried a lot as a baby. I did? At age six, tortured small dog. Well, why not? It bit me. At age seven, began stealing toys from Dime Store. Age eight, organized street gang known as the Angels. <laughs> How about that? Great bunch of kids. That's what we called ourselves, the Angels. Can you believe it? Age nine, broke into bicycle store. Age 10, beat up smaller child, hospitalized with injuries. Hey, what is this anyway? Your permanent record, sir. But it goes on for pages and pages. Nothing but all the bad things I ever did. It's thick as a book, I don't get it. Get what? You don't think there was a mistake, do you? Not likely. Then don't figure, where's the good stuff? I wouldn't worry, sir. I'm sure the record is quite complete. Well, hey, if it don't bother him, then I guess I ain't gonna let it bother me, you know what I mean? I believe I do. Seen enough? Yeah, plenty. What now, Mr. Valentine? I don't know. Maybe fool around with the dolls, maybe go and shoot some craps first. I'll bring the car around. Nah, I, I can catch a cab. I got some thinking to do anyway. Very good. If you need me, just pick up any phone. Dial 1-800-PIP. Sure thing. I'll see you, Fats. Place your bets, hard ways, any craps. Put it all on double sixes. All of it? You heard me. Yes, sir. All bets down. Same good shooter. Coming out. Twelve. Midnight. Winner twelve. Say, uh, you want to stay up all night? What? Double sixes. Midnight. Let it ride, sir? No, forget it. Your chips. Yeah, sure. Lucky 13. 13 it is. No more bets. 13 red. Pay the gentleman with the yellow tie. I can't believe it. How to shoot away at a uh, Don't you want your chips, sir? Mail them to me. Okay, pick up your hand. That's it. How many cards you want? Um, I'm okay. How about you? I don't need any either. Lita, how many? I think I'll play these. Dealer stands, Pat. What do you got? Huh? 
Now's the time when you lay them down. Oh, oh. Let me see. I got a full house? Great. What do you got, doll? Um, I'm not sure. I'll tell you. Looks like a straight flush queen high. Oh, is that good? It's great. It's just great. Lita, show me your cards. But everybody will know what I have. It's okay. Yep, you got her beat straight flush king high. I win. Not so fast. Any other game you could bet the farm. But here, read them and weep. I got a royal flush. You win again, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, I know already. That's all I ever do in this nutty place. Win, win, win. Is there anything else you'd like us to do? There must be something. Now get out of here, all of you. Sick of looking at you. Can we come back later? Don't call us, we'll call you. Go on, scram. Now what am I supposed to do? Play tiddlywinks? <sighs> Maybe a game of eight ball. Nah, straight pool. What's the good of that? One shot and I run the whole table. <sighs> Where's the phone? 1-800-PIP. Yes, Mr. Valentine. What can I do for you? You can get yourself over here right away. I got a bone to pick with you. Really? Stop all that creeping around. Why don't you use the front door like regular people? Anything you say, Mr. Valentine. Anything I say, anything I say. Will you knock it off? Is something wrong, sir? No! Nothing's wrong! Everything's peachy! Look, I've been here for a month and I can't take it anymore. I don't understand. I'll spell it out. I'm bored, fatso. I'm bored. There's no excitement around here, you dig? No kicks. But the gambling. I thought you enjoyed it. I do, but when you win every time, that ain't gambling. That's charity. I could arrange for you to lose occasionally. Would that help? Yeah, maybe. No, no good. I'd know. Perhaps you miss your old vocation. Now you're getting warm. There's a nice bank you could rob. It's on the corner. Or would you prefer a jewelry store? Bank's okay, I guess. Fine. Now, as to the getaway car, we have quite a wide selection. Something inconspicuous, I imagine. Any chance I'll get caught? Certainly, if that's what you'd like. Let me make a note of it. Look, don't bother. Look, Fatso, I don't know how to say this, but it just ain't the same thing. What's the kick in knocking off a bank if everybody's in on it, huh? Even the dames. I never thought I'd get bored with beautiful dames, but... See, I wouldn't expect an angel to understand this. Scoring with a chick doesn't mean anything if she's set up in advance. I mean, everything's great, really great. It's just the way I always imagined it. But see, I tell you, Fats, I don't think I fit in here. Oh, nonsense. Of course you do. No, I'm serious. Somebody must have goofed. Look, I'm going to go nuts if I have to stay here another day. I, I just don't belong in heaven. I, wa I want to go to... I want to go to the other place. Heaven? <laughs> Whatever gave you the idea, you were in heaven. Mr. Valentine, this, this is, is the other place. <laughs> <laughs> Portrait of Henry Francis Valentine. Small-time crook, grifter, thief, and worse. A scared, angry little man who never got the breaks he thought he deserved. Now he has everything he ever wanted. And he's going to have to live with it for all eternity in a place called the Twilight Zone. More from The Twilight Zone after this. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of The Twilight Zone radio dramas, and I'd like to take a moment to thank you for tuning into our show. We've been producing these radio versions of the classic Twilight Zone TV series since 2002. And if you're a regular listener, you know that our radio versions are based on the original TV shows we've all come to know and love. But I'm excited to announce that very soon you'll start to hear brand new stories that are not based on the original TV shows. We're commissioning writers to produce fresh new story ideas that will star many of your favorite Hollywood stars. So be sure to stay tuned for them. Also, 
I want to stay in closer contact with you, so I've started a producer's blog on our website at www.twilightzoneradio.com. On my blog, you'll get weekly updates and the latest news and information on our Twilight Zone radio dramas, the stars we've recently signed, the new story ideas you can look forward to hearing, when your favorite episode will be aired, and much, much more. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can download three free shows or any of our past shows for only $1.95 each. Plus, you can purchase CDs of all of our shows in our Twilight Zone store, find a radio station in your area playing our broadcasts, ways to contact me, and much, much more. So be sure to log on to www.TwilightZoneRadio.com, and I'll see you in the zone. A Nice Place to Visit, starring Hal Sparks with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Nick Sandys, Doug James, Laura Russell, Fernette Lebo, Amber Lake, Jeff Lupatin, Vince Amari, Kurt Nabig, Rosalind Alexander, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. This is Joey Crown. Who? Joey Crown. I called before. Can you speak up, sir? I called a couple of times and I left a message. Do you have a reservation? Me? No, not exactly. I mean, this is Joey Crown. The trumpet player. I'm having trouble hearing you. Did Baron get my message? I don't know about any message. The band's on now. I can hear that. Boy, can I... And the second set is at 10.30. Do you want a table? I don't need a table. Tell Baron I'll fall by if I can. <laughs> you know how it is. I got a gig all the way across town. How do you spell your name? Just tell Baron that Joey Crown's coming. Okay, sweets? Man, oh man. <laughs> Just wait till he sees me. Hey, Bobby, what's happening? Name? You know me. It's... Wait a minute. Who are you? You have a reservation. Hey, pal. We've been waiting for a half hour. He got in line. How you doing? Sorry, folks, but I'm supposed to be inside. Hold on. I gotta check the list. I'm not on the list. See, I got a gig here tonight. Oh, you're in the band. Well, not in it exactly. Baron knows I'm coming. He'll let me sit in. I'm sure of it. First show's sold out. If you want to put your name down for 1030... Just tell Baron, all right? He'll count me. Hey, fella. Hang on. There's been a little misunderstanding. No, I mean, I know you. You do? Didn't you used to be Joey Crown? Used to be? What do you mean, used to be? Crown. Crown. Ah, uh, sorry, man. You're not on the comp list. If you want to wait in line... Hey, hey, hold on. See this? It's a trumpet case. I'm not some piker. I played with Baron lots of times. I used to work the page three and the gate. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Ask Artie. He owns the joint. Meet Joey Crown, a man who made music, or used to. A little man with a funny rubber face whose life is a quest for decent billing and other impossible things, like flowers in concrete or 
trying to pluck a note of music out of the air and put it under glass to treasure. Because it is a treasure to him, and if the truth be told, to a lot of people who heard him play when he was hot, when he could take a tune and turn it inside out with a dented, beat-up golden horn. His solos were the stuff legends are made of, until he took a turn for the worse. For a while now, the only notes to come out of his trumpet have been, well, slightly sour and off-key. Joey Crown, who in just a moment will decide to leave the earth for a steady gig in another kind of club, one located in an out-of-the-way place we call the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Passage for Trumpet, starring Mike Starr with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Take five out here if you want, Mr. Barron. Ah, sure thing, Artie. You guys just played a smoking set. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks. I came in early on the bridge. You did all the changes. <sighs> nice set, boys. Was it okay? I couldn't tell. That sounded good to me, just the way I like it. Sure was. Man, you guys know how to swing. Who's that? Uh, too dark to see. I think it's... Hey, Joey. What do you say, Barron? <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, what do you think? I brought my axe. What for? I thought you might need somebody with a horn. I already got my sideman, Joey. Sure, sure you do. But I was thinking I could sit in. You know, for the second set. Uh, not tonight. Just a few choruses. Maybe some other time. Why not? You know how good I can play. Easy, Joey. But why? The last time you played trumpet for me, you lost it up. I did? I had to share you with a bottle. A bottle? Me? Oh, you got the wrong guy. You and that horn don't belong together on the same stage anymore. You mean six, seven months ago? Oh, that was just a bad night. I forgot what it tastes like. I'm on the wagon now. Way up. That right, Joey. Who's your brass section? Right here. Meet my new trumpet player. Yeah? That was him? Yeah, that was me. Don't get me wrong. He sounded great in there. Really cooking. But what do you think I am? Some kind of a lush? Listen, Baron, I know what that stuff does to me. I ain't an old man yet. Me and my horn got a lot of years left. I could be a number one boy again. Club dates, sessions, the whole bit. Hey, take it easy. What do you think I'm going to do? Chuck it all the way in some bum habit? Be serious. Listen, man, this is one mellow horn, and I got sweet music in me. A whole lot of it. You know yourself, when I open the case and pick that thing up and blow, I can make them cry. That you can, Joey. I remember. So what's the big deal? I can come in behind your man on the bridge. Then I sit out while he takes his solo. Then we trade choruses and I... You dropped something, Joey? That's not mine, honest. I never saw it before. I... It was in your coat pocket. I saw it the minute you walked up. Come on, boys. Let's go back in. No, you come on, Baron. What are you trying to do to me? All I need's a chance. Okay, it's showtime. Go on. I'll be right there. All I need's a chance. One shot. That's what you need, all right. <laughs> a shot. Better make it a double. That's not what I mean. Oh, don't worry about the mess, Joey. Somebody will clean it up for you. They always do. I'm sorry, Baron. But if you knew what it's been like to... One thing I don't know. When a guy has so many friends, why would he hang out with his worst enemy? All right, all right. I get it. I shouldn't have come here. We've been doing all right at the club. Sold out most every night. So let me lay some green on you. And your share. For old times' sake. Keep your money. Hey, hey, for old times. Come on, man. When you had the magic. Remember? Harry James and Max Kaminsky and Berrigan and Butterfield and Diz and Miles. Man, you had a little bit of all of them. And you traded it for some bad booze. Well, you got took. That was no kind of a deal. You got the crummy end of the stick. I don't want your charity, okay? I got one question for you, Joey. Why'd you throw it all away? Maybe because... Because I'm sad all the time. Because I'm nothing anymore, and I know it. 
Because from now on, I'll live and die in a crummy one-roomer with dirty walls and cracked pipes. I'll never have a girl because I'm an ugly little gnome. I'll never be anybody again because half of me is that horn. I can't even talk to people without it. That's my language. Go easy on yourself, Joey. Oh, but when I'm high, Baron, when I'm high, I can't see how dirty the walls are. I, I don't see the cracked pipes. I don't even know the clock's running. That the hours are going by. Then I'm Gabriel. I'm Gabriel with the golden horn. And when I put it to my mouth and blow, it comes out jewels. It comes out a symphony. It comes out the smell of flowers and summer nights. It comes out... It comes out beauty. When I'm drunk, Baron. Only when I'm drunk. Take care of yourself, son. Oh, man. I got so much misery. I, I got so much sadness. I'm nothing. I'm just plain ordinary nothing. Oh, I'm so tired of hanging out. Polluted city air. All right, Joey, it's showtime. Some more. What are you doing up here on the roof? Well, I suppose I could ask the same of you. I wanted to be by myself. Don't you know it's the middle of the night? Yes. Couldn't sleep either, huh? Would you please play a bit more? I can't play. Why do you say that? I thought it sounded beautiful. What do you know? Well, I don't know much about music, I admit. But it had so much feeling. You have a gift. Once upon a time, maybe, but... That was a long time ago. Use it or lose it, right? What? You wanna... <laughs> of course you don't. You look like a nice girl. A real nice girl. You haven't answered my question. What is this, a quiz show? Why can't you play? I just can't. Got it? Mm, is it because that bottle's empty? Not yet it's not. You wanna know why? Okay. The reason I can't blow that horn anymore is that too much of me is in there. Too much of Joey Crown. Is that your name? It was. It's a nice name. I like the sound of it. You don't know who I am either, do you? You don't know anything. I'm sorry, I just like the way you play. Well, I have played my last note. Yes, ma'am. My very last note. No more. Well, I think that's what's sad. Then I'm sorry. I'll just have to disappoint you. It's been very nice making your acquaintance. You look like a nice person. A very sweet person. Thank you. You're new here. You come out from Iowa or Cincinnati or someplace like that, and you don't know anybody. I could have shown you around. I could have taken you places where they play some nice jazz, you know? All we'd have to do is ride the subway down to the village, walk around... This place is everywhere. On every street almost. There was a time, there was a time when you could have heard me play. Now, it's too late, so 
Go home, lady. Go back to where you came from. Because you'll never make it here. This town's too tough for people like you. Go on. It's, it's been nice talking to you. Yeah, it's been a ball. Now do me a favor. Get lost. Way to go, Joey. Every time something nice happens, you go and wreck it. What's the matter with you? You're stupid, Joey. Stupid. You know something? This town's too tough for me, too. So wake up. Time for something else, Joey. Anything. Time to get out. Or die. Oh. Wait a minute. What the heck is that? Nobody ever played that good, not even Joey Crown. Nobody on this earth. Hi, Ned, how's it going? Back again. I need some cash. You and me both. Look, Joey, I can't keep loaning you money on that beat-up old trumpet. What do you mean? You know this horn. It's got a tone you wouldn't believe. That's the trouble. They all sound great when somebody's playing them. Look around. I got enough instruments to equip Sousa's band. I need another bugle like I need my taxes raised. But this horn's been around. It's got character. I played it at Newport. I played it on so many sessions you couldn't count them all. Go over there and flip through those records in a box. I bet you got 20, 30 albums I'm on. You name it, this is the horn. The same one. Ah, trumpet is a trumpet, Joey. It's the man who plays it. That's what counts. Otherwise, it's just a pile of brass. 20 bucks. What? You gave me 40 last time. Like you said, it's been around. The case has got dents in it. Listen, Ned, I'm serious. So am I. What I need is enough to get a bus ticket out of the Port Authority. Taking a little vacation, huh? Atlantic City? At this time... I'm leaving for good. Twenty bucks won't get me out of Jersey. Then you're not coming back. Not in your life. This is the new Joey Crown. I'm turning over a new leaf. If you're selling, twenty-five. That's my best offer. Take it or leave it. Okay, okay. Twenty-five. All right. Sign here. Just think, Ned. After today, you won't have Joey Crown to kick around anymore. This is the last time you'll see my ugly mug in here. You can count on that. Now hurry up before I change my mind. You want to kiss it goodbye? I already did that. Changing jobs, huh? Yeah. I'm going to start a new career. Digging ditches. So you uh, don't need it anymore. That's right. Like I don't need lungs. See you in the funny papers. Then if you're sure... I'm sure. I'll go ahead and put it in the window. Wait a minute. You put a sign on it. 75 bucks. Nothing personal, Joey. Business is business. A man's got to make a profit these days. Sure, but you only gave me a third of that. Uh, guys like you just don't get it. I mean, what's money to somebody who plays jazz all night? Sleep until noon. What kind of responsibilities you got? Nothing, right? Not a thing. Yeah, nothing. A big fat zero. Hey, mister, watch where you're going. Get out of my way. Hey, don't cross the street like that. Mind your business. Hey, buddy, get out of the way. Leave me alone. Watch out. You think I care? You're gonna get killed. Oh, my gosh. He just walked right out in traffic. Like he could care less. Somebody call an ambulance. Stand back, folks. The paramedics are on their way. Oh, I'm sorry about that, officer. I, I don't know what happened, but I can assure you I'm not what you'd call drunk. He's not breathing. Give the policeman room. No rush on that ambulance. He's gone. What are you talking about? I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. There was this big truck that went by, and man, let me tell you, it gave me a kiss. I, I don't see it now, but uh, I'm not drunk. You can ask Officer Flaherty. This is his beat, and he'll vouch for me. I'm not the kind of guy who goes around walking on red lights. Okay, folks, party's over. What is going on? I'm okay, I tell you. Something like that, it shakes a guy up. 
I need a smoke. Hey, man, you got a match? What's the matter? You can't hear me? I'm not a bum. I just want a light, that's all. Excuse me, buddy. You wouldn't happen to have a light, would you? Hey, fella, do you have a... Some town, all right. Real friendly. I gotta sit down someplace. Step right in, folks. First show starts in ten minutes. Hey, Mac. What's playing at the Bijou today? Anything good? Tickets, please. I asked you a question. What's the movie? Everybody inside. Snack bar straight ahead. Seat to the left and right. Okay. I'm buying a ticket, see? I'm no freeloader. You wanna sell me a ticket, miss? I got money. Hey, where's the girl that always works here? I gotta tell Gracie what happened to me. I just tangled with a Mack truck, and the next thing I knew... Yeah, two tickets, please. Yes, sir. Here you are. What, am I invisible? You don't want to sell me a ticket? Why not? My money's as good as the next guy's. If you don't want to sell me one, then I'll just go see the manager. What do you think of that? Where's Vincent? He's an old friend of mine. Vince? Where are you? Anybody? That's what's wrong with this town. Nobody's got manners anymore. You think I was some place that nobody ever heard of, like I'm some kind of untouchable. I mean, at least when you talk to people, they could say a couple of words when you ask them for a match or a ticket or something. What's the name of this flick anyway? Really scary stories. Ah, looks like a winner. What is this, a horror movie? No thanks, I gotta get out of here. Excuse me, if you could move your feet a little. Sorry, I didn't mean to step right through your leg. Hey, what's going on? Where is everybody? You, behind the counter, can't you hear me? Are you deaf? Those people in there, they couldn't see me or feel me. I stepped right on one guy's toe. Pinch me, I'm real, ain't I? Wait a minute, is somebody pulling a gag? Vince trying to shake me up? Well, now look, miss, is somebody trying to... Look at me! Right behind you in the mirror. It's my reflection. I can't even see myself. So, I'm dead. Can you beat that? I'm DOA. Just plain old deceased. Two margaritas, Nick. Coming right up. And another round for table number two. You got it. Could you pour one for me while you're at it? Eh, uh, guess not. How does that go? Water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. <laughs> you get it, don't you? I'm a ghost, see? That truck must have done it after all. Understand? I'm haunting you. Ain't that something? At last, for the first time in his short, miserable life at Joey Crown, he was finally successful at something. Hey, Nick. Hey, how you doing, Mr. D? Yeah, how about a Manhattan transfer? No ice. You got it. Nick, huh? Charlie must be off. Of course, if he was here, he couldn't hear me either. None of you can hear me. And nobody can see me. I used to come in here a lot. I don't recognize any of you people. And you wouldn't have noticed me. I mean, I'm not the kind of guy anybody would notice. I guess I'm kind of like a little blob or something. But Charlie, Charlie used to give me a little drink now and then on the house. He was a real nice guy. You know what he did one time? You know what he did? He went out and got an old Buddy Rich record from way back when I was playing with him. And on the record, there's this long solo with me on the horn. And Charlie goes and orders it like a big surprise for me and puts it on the jukebox. <laughs> oh, would you believe it? Nice thing for old Charlie to do. When I was still alive. Thanks, Nick. My pleasure, dollface. Funny thing, though. I mean, if this is it, what happens next? I just go walking from place to place till it gets dark? You know, this could wear a guy down. I mean... Nobody to talk to, nobody to listen to. Not even a horn to play. Not anymore. Oh, excuse me. Am I in your way? Not that you care, huh? You can walk right through me, because I'm just a ghost. Plain old nothing little man, and a plain old nothing little ghost.
Hey, it's that trumpet player I heard. The same one. You're good. Real good. Thanks. I mean it. The tone's so clean and pure. You got some chops. Who's Baron? Oh, he took the night off. I see. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Yeah? You said thanks. That's right. Then, I can't believe this. You can hear me? Sure I can, Joey. I hear you just fine. You really hear me? I hear you. You see me? Very clearly. Ah, uh, I get it. Are you a ghost too? Not really. I am. I stepped in front of a large vehicle this morning. Is that right? It ain't good for the health, believe me. I'll bet it's not. Say, if you don't mind my asking, who have you played with before? Before what? Before now. What bands? Oh, I've played all over. Yeah, but with who? Dizzy? Miles? Those were great horn men. They sure were. Did you study at Juilliard, Berkeley? I guess you might say I picked it up on the fly, here and there. You sure got a great trumpet. The way it shines. Custom made, huh? You want to try it out, Joey? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd like to. You mind? Whatever you like. Joey? You call me Joey? Joey Crown. That's the name, isn't it? Yeah. But we ain't never been introduced. Not formally. But I know who you are. You play a nice trumpet. I know. I'm an expert on trumpets. You ain't no slouch on it, that's for sure. Go ahead. Not bad, Joey. Not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, ain't that something? I can play again. Now that it doesn't matter anymore. What do you mean by that? Now that I'm dead. How come you know who I am? You say you're not a ghost, you're not dead? Nope. And neither are you, Joey. I'm not? By no means. But what about that truck? What about it? And what about uh, the people in the bar, in the movie theater, the girl in the ticket booth, the people in the street? Oh, them. Well, you see, they are dead. But that doesn't make sense. How? They're the ghosts, Joey. They just don't know it. Huh? You're losing me. Sometimes, to make it easier, we have to work it that way. We let them go on in a life that they're familiar with, and they never know for a long while. But that's why they can't hear you. You're the one that's alive. But, but like I said, I stepped off that curb. That you did. And right now, Joey, you're in a kind of limbo. You're neither here nor there. You're in the middle. You're on a break between sets, so to speak. Waiting to go on in the real world or the shadow world. Which do you prefer, Joey? Which? Well, just what do you think? I want another chance. Think it over, now. I have thought it over. I, I used to think I was getting dealt from the bottom of the deck, but you know something? I just, I just forgot how much I had already. I forgot about the music I could make on the horn and how nice it sounded. I'd have to agree with you there. And going to Charlie's and talking to people, real people, and maybe uh, maybe going to the movies now and then. Cutting a record once in a while, walking in the park, hitting the clubs late at night, even when it was rainy or snowing and I had to bundle up like an Eskimo. I miss that. I really do. I never won a beauty contest, but I had friends. I had good friends. What do you think happened to all that? Somewhere along the line, I, I forgot the good things. That's what happened. I just forgot. You've got a choice, you know. A choice? One way or the other. It's not too late. Well, in that case, if I've got a choice, then I want to go back, understand? I want to go back. All right. You go back. Just like that? But, Joey, no more stepping off curbs. That was some stunt back there. From now on, you take what you get and you live with it. Sometimes it'll be sweet frosting and nice gravy, and sometimes it'll be sour and go down hard. But you live with it, Joey. I think I got it. Guess I better take my trumpet back. Oh, 
is. Sure, yeah. That's a nice talent you've got. You really think so? To make music, to move people, to make them laugh and make them cry, to make them tap their feet and want to dance. That's an exceptional talent, Joey. Don't waste it. See you around. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, mister. What is it, Joey? I didn't get your name. How's that? I didn't get your name. My name? Call me Gabe. Gabe? Gabe. Short for Gabriel. Goodbye, Joey. Gabriel. Hey, wait. Wait, I gotta ask you something. Hey, mister, watch where you're going. Get out of my way. Hey, don't cross the street like that. Hey, buddy, get out of the way. Watch out! You're gonna get killed! Oh, my God! He just walked right out in traffic. Like he could care less. Somebody call an ambulance. Wait, he's breathing. Uh, I'm all right, all right. Just, just let me get up. You okay, pal? I think so. Let me help you up there. Oh, you know you shouldn't ought to do that. Stepping off the curb like that. It's lucky I just grazed you. Don't worry about it. No harm done. He's all right. Oh, thank God. He could have been killed. Well, uh, look. I am 14 years without an accident. That right. I'd be obliged if, well, you know, no insurance companies, no doctors, nothing like that. So, um, how much do you want? For what? To keep this just between us. Name your price. My price? Well, let's see now. Uh, you got, let me see, 75 bucks? That all? Sure, sure, I got that much. I got more if you want. 75 will do. Okay, 50, 60, 75. Here you go, pal. Good luck to you. I gotta go now. Well, what do you know about that? Hello, can I... Oh, it's you. Hi, Ned. Change your mind already? Yeah, I changed my mind. <laughs> they come and they go. But you, Joey, you're the first one to go and then come back. I know, I know. I don't want to hear your argument. No argument. I guess I can let you have it. How much? 75? No, no, no. 25. You'll talk me back down anyway. How long has it been? Five minutes? Not even enough time to accrue interest. Go, go. The sign says 75, and 75 it is. A man has to make a living. Uh, you tempt me, Joey. Right is right. It's only business. What did you do out there? Win the lottery? Something like that. Goodbye, Ned. You won't be seeing me for a while. Hope business picks up. You too, Mr. Jazzman. But tell me something. Anything. What have I done to deserve such good fortune? Oh, nothing much. You've been my friend, is all. For quite a few years, and I'll never forget that. Uh, get out of here. Go on. play beautifully. What? Oh, hi. Hi there. I mean it, you know. Thank you. I gave it up this morning. And I'm taking it back. Me and the bugle, till death do us part. <laughs> I'm glad you changed your mind. So am I, you don't know. 
Still can't sleep, huh? Uh, I'm not used to this city. All the noise. I know. Like a regular symphony, isn't it? I guess so. <laughs> I've never been to New York before. I just moved in. Yeah. You'll get used to it. It's an okay building. Better than the other ones I've lived in. Sometimes you have to bang on a radiator to get the heat going. Why do you do that? Why? Because the super hears you and then he fixes it. If he doesn't, just let me know. I'll talk to him for you. Name's Joey, by the way. Joey Crown. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How? You told me before. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm sorry for that stuff I said. Don't be. My name's Nan. Pleased to meet you, Nan. I was hoping you'd come back. You are? You're the most interesting person I've met in New York. <laughs> yeah, sure. There's a lot of guys around here. Most of them ain't little apes like me. I mean it. The most interesting. And the nicest. I love your music. Honest? Honest. Will you play some more, Joey? Sure, I'll play some more. I'll play whatever you like for as long as you like. What's your favorite song? I, I don't think I have one. Well, I know a couple you might like. Well, that would be nice. You know, you might get to like it here. It's not a bad town. I'm sure it isn't. Maybe... Maybe you could show me some of it, Joey. If you have time. Me? Oh, I got time, all right. I got nothing but time from now on. I'll show you everything. The Battery, Central Park, the Village. I'll show you 52nd Street. And we'll hear some good jazz. I mean good. I'll take you to Charlie's. You'll like Charlie's. It's a great place. And you know what? You're not going to believe this, but he's got a record of mine when I was playing with one of the big bands. At least, I think he still has it. If he doesn't, there's a little pawn shop I know that has all kinds of records in back. And we can pick up a copy and bring it home and listen to it. Joey Crown, who makes music in the present tense. Who knows a thing or two about tunes and chord changes and how to play his acts. And who just discovered something about life. That it can be rich and rewarding and full of beauty, like the music he plays if he only takes the time to look and listen. Joey Crown, who finally got a cue and a clue in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Passage for Trumpet, starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Brooke Sanford, Jeff Lupitan, David Darlow, Kurt Nabig, Meg Falcon, Lynn Foley, Carl Amari, Sarah Marks, Chuck Somar, Vince Amari, Karina Karpolovsky, Bo Nortel, and Roger Wolski, with special trumpet stylings by Chuck Somar. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Mr. Poole. Morning, Mrs. Sullivan. Off to work? You know it. Oh, Mrs. Sullivan. Yes? I meant to drop off the rent last night. Oh, no hurry. It isn't due yet. I know, but I don't like debts. I'll make sure you get it this evening. That will be just fine. Well, have a good day at the bank. The same as every other day. Oh, excuse me. Were you going out? Just to bring in the paper. Oh, let me get it for you. You don't have to do that. No problem. Here you are. Why, thank you, Mr. Poole. You're the perfect tenant. Absolutely perfect. Paper, get your paper. You have the morning sports final? Sure thing. 25 cents, one quarter of a dollar. Here. Thanks, pal. Paper, get your paper. Who wants a paper morning final? One here, Marty. Sure thing, Mr. Poole. Always got a copy for you. Let me see if I have the right change. Yep. Here you go. Hey, look at that. Is something wrong? Your quarter. It landed on the edge. Didn't even fall over. Well, what do you know? That'll never happen again in a million years. This must be your lucky day. Oh, I hope you're right, Marty. A little luck never hurt anyone. What happened? That car, it hit him. Did you see it? Somebody call an ambulance. Mr. Hector B. Poole, resident of the Big Apple, the Glass Canyon, hoping to survive an assault on his senses, all six of them. Flip a coin and keep on flipping it. What are the odds? Half the time it will come up heads and half the time tails. But in one wild, freakish chance in a million, it will land on its edge. Mr. Poole, a bright human coin on his way to the bank in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Penny for Your Thoughts, starring David Eigenberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Stand back! Look what you did! I didn't see him, honest. He, he just stepped off the curb. Where's the ambulance? Oh. Oh. What happened? Easy, mister. You all right? Oh, I think so. Just give me a hand. Look, lie still. I I'll get a doctor. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't need a doctor. I mean, if you'll help me get up. I'll... You sure? You ought to take it easy. Yeah, at least get an x-ray. Uh... Why? No scrapes, no scratches, no broken bones. I seem to be fine. You should stay down. I would. Something like that, he could sue the guy's pants off. Pardon? Oh, I, I just said, uh, wait till you get to the hospital. You, you never know. No, no need for that, really. Oh, uh, you don't know how sorry I am, sir. Oh, uh, no harm done. I swear, I didn't see you step off the curb. If you were hurt, I could never forgive myself. You clumsy idiot. I wish you'd broken your fool neck. What did you say? I said if you were hurt, I could never forgive my... No, no, not that. The other part. I, I see no reason for you to be abusive. Abusive? I should have been more careful, but it, it was equally your fault. Are you certain you're all right, sir? I think so. Thank heaven for that. I'm simply trying to say how grateful I am that you weren't injured. Lame brain jaywalker. That asinine stunt took ten years off my life. Now, see here, I'm not Let a Let me brush you off. 
Where were you headed? I was on my way to work. Well, I'll be happy to give you a lift if you like. Uh, no thanks. Uh, it's not far. I think I'd... I'd rather walk. Watch stop this morning? What's that? <laughs> Must have. Not like you to be late. Oh, oh, yes. No, I mean no. I mean, no, it's not. It's 9-10. Well, something happened on the way. Did it? Uh, Bran, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Um, well, why are they all whispering? Who? The customers. What about them? It's just that... They're usually so quiet. I mean, nobody talks out loud in a bank, but this morning... What do you mean? You don't hear them? Hear what? <laughs> oh, I get it. Have a late night, did you? No, but you know, on the way here, I... I... Better grab some coffee. Miss Turner just put some on. Huh? Mr. Bagby. In his office. Where else would he be? Oh, thank you, Brand. Well, I better get started. Yes, you do that. Oh, I knew he'd crack sooner or later. Mr. Perfect. Hello? No, the vice president is on another line. May I take a message? Very well. Eileen. Morning, Hector. How, um, how long has he been here? A half hour. I wouldn't bother him, though. He's got an important call. All right, I'll wait till he's finished. Oh, Felicia, baby! You know I care, but... How would it look? And besides, Gladys has a nose for these things. <laughs> of course she would. I can see the headlines. Prominent banker divorces wife to marry chorus girl. <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 Felicia, you misunderstand. I love chorus girls. I mean, not all of them. Only you. Yes, yes, that's right. Look, how about this weekend? Just you and me. <clears throat> yes? Uh, Mr. Bagby? Come in. Hold on. Someone's at the door. Yes. What is it, Poole? Uh, Mr. Bagby, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I'd like to explain. Explain what? Why I was late, sir. Were you? Ten minutes, to be exact. Well, I didn't notice. Well, as you know, sir, my record for being prompt is spotless. I pride myself on attention to duty. Yes, yes, Poole. Everyone is aware of your devotion to the bank. Well, you see, a strange thing happened. A very strange thing. Yes, uh-huh. Get on with it, you simpering idiot. You think she's going to stay on the line forever? If you ruin my weekend with Felicia, I'll string you up by the thumbs. Your weekend, sir. What? Spoil your weekend. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. What are you mumbling about? Look, I've got an important call here. Very pressing matter. Get on with it, man. No, of course, I understand. He said weekend. Good Lord. You don't suppose he knows about Felicia? It's impossible. I've been so careful, so so discreet. There. I've placed her I've placed it on hold. Now then, you had something to tell me? Pool? Pool. Another time, sir. I can see that you're busy. I'd better get to my work. Poor Mr. Poole. He looks so tired and pale. I'm alright. Oh, 
Good morning, Mr. Poole. Good morning, Miss Turner. Did you say something? I didn't know I looked that bad. Oh, you don't. You look very well today. As do you. Oh, why, thank you. Would you like some coffee? Oh, uh, not just yet, but thanks for asking. Say something? No, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, good day to you, sir. Everything in apple pie order, I trust? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I bet you're the one who sent me that overdraft notice. No, sir. No what? I don't have anything to do with overdrafts. I work over there in the loan department. You do? Just see one of the tellers. I'm sure that they can straighten it out for you. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Uh... I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Pool? Yes. You know Mr. Sykes of Ajax Cement? Oh, yes, Mr. Sykes. How do you do? His loan has been approved. Uh, will you see that the papers are in order? Of course. When do I get the check? Uh, Mr. Poole will take care of that for you. Uh, here's the file. Certainly, Mr. Brand. Won't you sit down, Mr. Sykes? Everything's there. Oh, I'm sure it is. The check's for $200,000. I see. A loan for $200,000. That's quite a sum. Expanding the business, Mr. Sykes? That's right. Wrong. Uh, well, which is it? Huh? You are aware that this loan must be repaid within 90 days. Sure I am. In full. That's all I need. Put half on Lucky Lady in the six. Split the rest between Nimble Runner and Crinoline at five to one. Nobody will ever know I can pay back the loan with enough left over to save the company. It's gotta work. There's no other way. Or what? Bankruptcy? What did you say? Nimble Runner and Lucky Lady. Now look here, young man. And Crinoline at five to one? What? That's a funny name. I don't have time for this. Am I going to get the check or not? Everything all right here? It better be. I'm not sure. What's going on, Poole? Uh, something wrong, Mr. Sykes. I don't know, Mr. Bagby. I signed everything. Well, then what's the problem? He just told me he's borrowing the money to bet on the horses. What? That is what you said, isn't it, sir? I said nothing of the kind. And then he said that Ajax Cement was bankrupt. Ah, he's mad. Pool. Doubtless there's been a mistake. There certainly has. If you'll come with me, I'll correct it at once. I'll talk to you later, Pool. Uh, but Mr. Beck... In my office. Yes, sir. My job. He said... I heard the whole thing. I'm the one who took his application. What's going on, Poole? Will you tell me that? What? If... If I could tell you, I would. But I honestly don't know. How would you like that, ma'am? Can I have it once, please, and some quarters for the laundromat? Of course. 180, 190, 200. Just a moment, I'll get your receipt. I want it in the form of a cashier's check. Oh, I'll need to get it countersigned. Uh, money order then. Yes, sir. That can't be all I have. Check the balance again. I've already checked it twice. If you'd like a printout of your transactions... I would, yes, so I can compare it to my records. There must be some mistake. 401, 402... 403, 20 years, the same window, not one promotion. Nope, not me. Hello, Smithers. Oh, 
Hello, Mr. Poole. Don't worry, you'll get that promotion. Do you really think so? I mean, what promotion? Stick with it, you'll see. Yes, of course, b but how? Have a little faith. Finally happening. It is? Yep. Old nose of the grindstone seems to have flipped out. Who are you talking about? Poole. Who else? He's been acting goofy all morning. Well, why shouldn't he? He's entitled to once in a while. He does all the work around here. <laughs> Guys like that are all alike. Gutless wonders. Put the pressure on and they go to pieces. Know what I mean? I'm not sure that I do. You phony. Don't you know a real gentleman when you see one? Got any of that coffee left? Oh, uh, hi, Pool. Certainly. Here you are. Smells good. It's fresh. Nice and hot, too. You do all of the work and get none of the credit. You should speak up more and assert yourself. But I guess that's not in your nature. Miss Turner? Yes? There's something I've been meaning to say to you. There is? And I hope you won't be offended. Oh, I'm sure I won't. But, well... Yes, Mr. Poole? I want to thank you. Thank me? For your kind thoughts. I don't think I quite understand, Mr. Poole. Romancing the help, eh, Poole? Brand, please. Well, who can blame you? Miss Turner's the prettiest girl in the new accounts department. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. Yeah, a lot of action around the old coffee station lately. That's no surprise. Not much chance for socializing on the job, is there? Brand, if I could get a word in. Yeah, go ahead. You were saying, Mr. Poole? She's probably a tiger. Let the sweet prim ones out of their cages and they revert to the jungle. That's enough, Brand. Hey, watch it! Oh, sorry. You spilled coffee all over my shirt. I'll get a napkin. It was an accident. No, it wasn't. You did that deliberately. He said it was an accident. I'll see you later about this pool. Good for you. I really didn't intend to do that. I'm sure you didn't. He was only joking. Maybe he was and maybe he wasn't. But he sure had it coming. Well, I suppose I should get back to my desk. Uh, yes, I suppose so. Or else it will be time for lunch. Will it? I mean, oh, it will. And then we'll all be having our lunches, won't we? I, I guess you're right. I mean, those who brought them. And those who didn't will go out somewhere. For lunch, I mean. Alone or together. Yes, yes, they certainly will. Well, back to the old grindstone. It's been nice talking with you. Nice talking with you, too. Bye now. Uh, bye. Oh, uh, Miss Turner... Mr. Poole? One more thing. I hope... Yes? I hope you... have a nice day. I feel the same way. Exactly. Such a gentleman. It isn't fair. It just isn't fair. I said, don't worry, Smithers. Who? Oh, Poole, uh, were you speaking to me? Mr. Bagby's a fair man. Mr. Bagby? Yes, I'm sure he is. Good things come to those who wait. What's he watching me for? Oh, no reason. Don't let it distract you. They'll be sorry. Not much longer now. At 4.30 this afternoon, I go into the vault like I always do. I'll take my briefcase with me. No one will suspect a thing. I'll fill it with currency and be on a ship to Bermuda by nightfall. <laughs> yes, indeed. All that money. As much as I can carry. I wonder how long it will take them to discover it's gone. It's not possible. Smithers? Oh, 
Miller. Hi right there, Mr. Poole. Got a minute? Sure do. Pretty quiet morning. Is that what you call it? Well, as supposed to payday, then everybody and his brother shows up. Get a little rowdy sometimes, trying to cut in line and everything. But I keep him in order. Teach him respect for the uniform. <laughs> you can count on me. I know I can. That's why I wanted a word in your ear. What's up? How long have you been a guard here? Uh, quite a few years now. Get my pension before long. And that gun in your holster, is it, is it the same one you've always had? Sure is. Nothing beats a 38. Keep it oiled up real good. You could use it then. I mean, if you had to. Well, what do you think I got it on my belt for, Hector? To hold my pants up? Good. That's good. Uh, why you ask? I'm not sure, but I suggest taking up a post by the door, keep your eyes open, and don't say anything to anyone just yet. I get you. Mum's the word. There he is. Was he waiting for me? Hello again. Miss Turner. I was just going back to my desk. Perfect timing. Isn't it? I, I mean, it is. Miss Turner, may I speak to you? Any time at all. What I have to tell you is very important. Yes, Mr. Poole? Not here in front of everyone. Dreadfully important. Come with me. Where are we going? Somewhere private. I like the sound of that. Mr. Jones's office is empty since he transferred. Next to Mr. Bagby's, no one ever goes in there. Perfect. That seems like a good idea. If you're sure you don't mind. As long as you can spare the time. Mm, this won't take long. Take all the time you want. Well, what is it? You'll think I'm crazy. Is something wrong? Terribly, and I don't know who else to talk to. I'm here. Miss Turner, I keep hearing voices. People talking, their lips don't move. But I can hear their voices clearly. I've got this ringing in my head. Oh, no. Well, it's, it's not what you think, Miss Turner. I mean, I, I can read people's minds. I don't know if I can help you uh, with a thing like that. I'll prove it to you. Think. Think something. Anything at all. Well, I have to hand it to him. This is an original approach. Why did it take him so long to gather up his courage? Because it only happened this morning. What did? At least that was the first time I noticed it. He didn't notice me until this morning? No, not you. The voices. Mr. Poole... They won't stop. Perhaps you should lie down for a few minutes. Mm, maybe later. I'm trying to tell you something. I know you are. No, this is serious. Do you think I enjoy hearing people's thoughts? I'm sure I have no idea. Well, try to imagine. It's like seeing people with their clothes off. Which people would that be? Well, uh, Miss Turner, I, I have reason to believe that someone may try to rob the bank this afternoon. Mr. Brand was right. He's coming unglued. No, I am not unglued. It's true. I mean, at least I think it is. You heard them say that. Well, in a manner of speaking. Well, then, in that case, you should do something about it. But what if I'm wrong? You have a responsibility to the bank, to the stockholders and depositors. I suppose I do. We could talk about it over lunch. I mean, one could, two people, whoever they might be... If they wanted to, that is. Otherwise, just one, alone, talking about it to himself. Uh, of course, that might be a bit lonely, for some people at least. Unless... There's no time to waste. No, definitely not. I have to get out of here. Why? I mean, what's your hurry? Have we finished our conversation? I, I thought... I've got to tell Mr. Bagby. From now on, Mr. Poole... You may call me Helen. Come in. Mr. Bagby. Oh, there you are, Poole. I want to talk to you. Sir, I... I'm worried about you, Poole. About me? But, but, sir... I've always considered you one of my best men. So why, Poole? Why what? Just tell me straight out. We lost the Ajax cement account this morning because of that nonsense a while ago. Something wrong at home. 
The wife, perhaps? I'm not married. Oh. Well, something's bothering you. Yes. Have a seat. I'd prefer to stand. Then out with it. Well, I, I don't know how to put this, Mr. Bagby. Speak up, pool. I'm with you. You won't believe me. Of course I'll believe you. You're as honest as the day is long. Well, you've been like a son to me. Well, a, a son-in-law, at least. If you were, which you're not, legally speaking. But nonetheless... Mr. Bagby, Mr. Smithers is... is... Smithers? Well, what about him? He's planning to rob the bank. Say what? See, I told you. Would you mind repeating that? Smithers. Old Mr. Smithers? Old Mr. Smithers. He's sitting on his stool right now, planning it out. At precisely 4.30, he's going into the vault. He does that every day. Exactly. But this time, he'll have his briefcase with him, and he'll fill it up with banknotes, as much as he can carry. And by tonight, he'll be on a boat to the Caribbean. How do you know? Um, I heard him talking about it. But well, he's one of our oldest and most trusted employees. Well, well, he was here when I took over the bank. I absolutely refuse to believe. I swear it, sir. He has it all worked out. Wait a minute. I take your point. Who's the one who ends up stealing the company funds? Isn't it always the most trusted employee? The man you'd least suspect? The man who's completely reliable for years until that one moment when everybody relaxes their guard and... Gotcha! He strikes! Good work, Poole! I wish it weren't true. I sort of admire Mr. Smithers. He's always there, steady as a rock, going his own way. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't overheard it myself. Well, no time for sentiment. Quick now, tell me the details. Um. Um. Well... At 4.30 on the dot, it starts. Okay, and Mr. Smithers will finish counting out his drawer as he always does, by the numbers. Thank you, folks. Good night now. Don't work yeah, too hard. And as soon as we lock the doors... See you Wednesday. You take care now. Good night, Rich. He'll close up his cage. Count down the drawer. 73, 74... 75, plus the bills. He'll stand up and go to the vault with the deposit, as he always does. The last teller, with his briefcase. He'll be back there alone to lock up the vault. Only this time, things will be different. When he comes out, his briefcase will be heavy. Very heavy. Miller, may I see you a moment? Yes, sir. Rich, let me out, please. Okay, be right there. I'm waiting. Gotcha. What? I'll take that briefcase. Here, here. What? Shall I cuff him? Not till we see the evidence. Looks pretty heavy to me. Dump it on the desk. I'm your witness. Sure thing. What do you think you're doing? What does it look like? Your mistake, Mr. Smithers, was in assuming that we were all asleep. A great mistake. But nothing gets by this institution. As a matter of fact, I've had my eye on you for a long time. Uh... You sure this is his briefcase? Of course it is. Duly noted. He admits it. <clears throat> One half sandwich. Clip-on necktie. Change of socks. Comb. One book. Had a profit from Armageddon. And uh, seven ballpoint pens. Where's the money? Has everyone gone insane? What money? Pool! Where's that idiot pool? Here, sir. So he was going to steal the money. He was going to take a trip to Bermuda. That was his story, huh? Mr. Bagby, I heard him. And who was he talking to, Mr. Poole? Well, he wasn't talking to anyone, not exactly. Oh? What was he doing? Sending smoke signals? He was... thinking. He was what? He was thinking. 
Well, that explains everything. Mr. Smithers, please forgive us all for this unfortunate intrusion. Well, I, I guess we all make mistakes. I should have known that what I was told was impossible on the face of it. Poole, do you know what I'm thinking? I'm fired. Kindly clear out your desk at once. Mr. Smithers, I don't know what to say. I'm very sorry. Return Mr. Smithers' possessions and let him pass. Right away. How did you know? What? It's true, of course, Mr. Poole. Yes, it's a little dream of mine. Have you ever had a dream? I have, often. People look at me and all they see is a funny little man, frayed and old, and they never know. I have the dream almost every day. I had it yesterday and the day before that. Oh, I don't always plan on Bermuda, though. Sometimes it's London, Paris, Fiji, beautiful, exotic places, thousands of miles from here. Places where there are no ledgers to keep, where I'm not a little man with no future and no past. I think of filling my briefcase with the bank's money, but I never go through with it. Do you know why? I've lived with it too long. I'm old and set in my ways. And besides, Mr. Poole, I'm a coward. Smithers, please. Will you open the door now, please, Rich? Sure. Uh, take care of yourself. Can I help you with anything? I've got it. I guess this is goodbye, Miss Turner. It may be a blessing in disguise for your career, a man with your abilities. Much more than mind reading. Strange delusion. But with the proper medical care, it'll go away. It's not a delusion, Miss Turner. There, you see, I can read your thoughts. But how? Until this morning, everything was normal. I was happy. Well, it, at least I wasn't unhappy. I had my friends, my job, and now this. I thought it was a gift. Well, it's no gift. It's an embarrassment. It's been nothing but trouble to me. I never imagined people were the way they are. You know, we do things without thinking about them, and we think things without the slightest intention of doing them. I've learned one thing. People are not what we think they are. Pool! Oh, thank heaven I caught you. That was the Ajax Cement Company on the phone. Mr. Sykes has been arrested. I know, for gambling with the company money. I tried to tell you that earlier. Two hundred thousand dollars if that loan had gone through. Mr. Pool, <clears throat> about your job. It's still yours, if you're interested. Why, that windbag. Mr. Pool, if you can really hear me, you're wasted in that job. If you let him take you back on the same terms, you're crazy. Everybody knows you should be in charge of the accounts department. Well, what do you say? Well, everyone knows I should be in charge of the accounts department, Mr. Bagby. In charge? Good. That would mean he'd move into Mr. Jones's old office. That would mean he'd... I'd move into Mr. Jones's old office. Now, really, Poole? This is absurd. What am I standing here wasting time for? Don't let him bamboozle you. Felicia's waiting. Man, oh man, what a weekend this is going to be. Stand up for yourself. He needs you more than you need him. Uh, would you excuse us, Miss Turner? We have some business to discuss. All right, if you're sure. I'm sure. Business? What business? The business of Felicia and your wife, Gladys. What? I know all about it. I know where you're meeting her and when. What's impossible? No one knows about the trip or the apartment on Riverside Drive. Riverside Drive, Mr. Bagby. Am I right? 
Oh, all right, you win. In charge of accounts in the office next to mine. You won't say anything to anyone, will you? Not a word, Mr. Bagby. Not a word. Oh, and I forgot, there's one more thing. At the bank's expense, I'd like you to buy a round-trip ticket to Bermuda. Have it made out in the name of J.L. Smithers. I think he'd like a vacation. Are you out of your mind? Mr. Bagby? Oh. One ticket to Bermuda. Shall we go, Miss Turner? If you like. I'd go anywhere with you. But I wish you'd call me Helen. Have a good night, folks. We'll try. May I see you home, Helen? Well, I don't know. Of course you can, Hector. What do you think I've been waiting for? Paper, get your afternoon paper. Latest stocks. Oh, just a second, do you mind? Not at all. Oh, hi, Mr. Poole. Well, was I right or was I right? Was it your lucky day? I'd say so. Uh, give me a paper, will you? Sure, this one's on the house. Oh, no, no, no. I don't like to owe anybody. Heads. You win. Hey, why'd you do that? I had that other quarter standing up all day, and nobody knocked it over till now. Well, I guess if you're the guy who stood it up, you're the guy who can knock it down. There goes your luck. Could be it's just beginning. Paper, get your late edition paper. What was that all about? Oh, nothing. Wait. What is it? Think something, Helen. Think anything. Oh, I am. Believe me. Did you get that? No, I didn't. I didn't hear anything at all. It's gone. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> if you say so, dear. <laughs> Toss a coin, any coin, and one time in a million, it will land on its edge. But all it takes to knock it over is a slight vibration, a light blow, or even a vagrant dream. Mr. Hector B. Poole, a human coin on edge for a brief time, in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Penny for Your Thoughts, starring David Eigenberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Michelle Graff, Doug James, Jamie Barron, Jeff Lupiton, Kurt Nabig, Joby Cerny, Frenette Lebo, Peggy Roeder, Alex Sopner, Carl Amari, Karen Olson, Tracy Hernandez, Christina Verba, and Vince Amari. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. 
To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Marvin? Yes, sir. What do you think you're doing? Um... Moving the table, sir. Why, whatever for? The party, Mr. Fitzgerald. Party? What party? Mrs. Fitzgerald, sir, for her birthday. Oh, good Lord, is that tonight? I understand that it is. You instructed me to see to the arrangement, sir. Ah, so I did, so I did. I suppose you'll transform this apartment into a veritable wonderland. Paper streamers and the like. No, sir. Just a buffet for the guests, as soon as the delivery boy arrives downstairs. The guests? Those on the list, sir. Small gathering of your closest friends. Then it'll be a very small gathering indeed. Sit down, Marvin, before you fall down. Very well, sir. On second thought, fix me a drink. As you wish. Now, I suppose I must go out and purchase a gift for the poor girl. Unless you've taken care of that for me. You uh, you left no instructions in that regard. Well, you might have simply asked her what she desires for the momentous occasion. But I couldn't. Then she'd know. Ah, all right. Let me see. What does she need? Books? No, too many of those. All they do is gather dust. A trinket? A bauble? Diamonds are quite dear these days. If I might offer a suggestion. Why not? Well, Mrs. Fitzgerald has expressed an interest in music. Oh, she has, has she? What does she know about music? I will not have popular ditties polluting my environment. Not recording, sir. I believe she'd like to play. (laughs) What? A glockenspiel? A, A kettle drum? You'd have to ask Mrs. Fitzgerald, but she did say it has powers to soothe the savage beast. That's breast, man, the savage breast. Do you see any beasts around here? Uh, If you don't mind, sir, I'll repair to my quarters for a while until the provisions arrive. Did you put soda in this drink? Oh, I, I, uh... I've told you, Marvin, no soda. Make me another one at once, and this time do it properly. Yes, sir. Mr. Fitzgerald Fortune, theater critic and sending at large, on the day of his wife's birthday. If he knew what's in store for him, however, he would make it a point not to attend. Because before the party is over, an extraordinary instrument will play what might be called those old piano roll blues. An opening night that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Piano in the House. Starring Michael York with Stacy Keach as your narrator. How do you do? If you don't see a price tag, ask. <clears throat> I am Fitzgerald Fortune. So? The drama critic. Uh huh. Isn't rudeness a handicap in your line of work? What's it to you? 
I saw the name of your shop, Treasures Unlimited. I stepped through the door, fully expecting to encounter some sentimental old biddy wearing an ostrich-plumed hat and a moth-eaten feather boa. Instead, to my sincere delight, I believe I've discovered a fellow misanthrope. What's that? A man who despises people. I got work to do, mister. Putting up stock. And I am meant to be writing a review this very hour for tomorrow's edition. So why aren't you doing it? Life intervenes. <sighs> Looking for something in particular? A gift for my wife's birthday. Well, you're in the wrong place. This isn't a gift shop. It's a junk store. <laughs> exactly. You see, my wife has the absurd notion that she wants to learn to play an instrument. Unfortunately, she hasn't a trace of talent. How do you know that? Hmm? If you've never heard her play. I believe I know my own wife. However, I've hit upon a rather droll solution to her dilemma. Do you have, by any chance, one of those old-fashioned pianos that plays itself? A player piano? Funny you should ask. Amuse me. I just picked one up at an estate sale. Over here. It's kind of beat up, though. Splendid. Needs a good toning. <laughs> Nonsense. My wife will believe it to be an antique and cherish it all the more. Would you play something, please? I can't play. Takes these paper rolls. Came with a whole bunch of them. Right in the piano bench. Ah, like Maninoff's prelude in C sharp minor, Stephen Foster, UB Blake, even the Prisoner's Song. Hmm. Quite an eclectic assortment. You're taking a lot of my time, Mister. You are taking an equal amount of mine. Let's try this roll, shall we? Number QRS eight eight five six. I'm in the mood for love. Okay. There we go. What birthday does this make for the little woman? Hmm? Your wife. Oh, her 26. So young. You must be a man of great personal magnetism to have attracted one of that age. I am. How utterly romantic. Youth, wisdom, hand in hand. Oh, how I'd like to see you both together. Ah, and for her birthday, you're giving her the gift of music. How touching. What is the price of the piano? You are taking your young bride out somewhere tonight. A quiet nook, where you can be lost together in the midst of this great city. Looking into each other's eyes. How much? Where's the tag? Ah, and worth every penny. A bit of restoration to take care of the finish. The mechanism still works, so on. Since it's a birthday present, let's say... Ooh, take 20% off that. No, no, make it 40. Forget the sales tax. Done. I shall require delivery before 6 o'clock this evening. The address is on my check. Certainly. I wouldn't want a lady to be disappointed on her birthday. How oh, remarkable. And what's that? Are you aware of how susceptible you are? I am. To the power of music. Isn't everyone? To some degree, I suppose. Okay, okay. You got a sale. Now, you gonna stand around all day taking my time? No, I was just leaving. Well, nobody's stopping you. There's the door. Tell me, are you sentimental about anything else besides birthdays? Birthdays? They're a lousy waste of time and money. Huh. It was the piano, wasn't it? <laughs> Extraordinary. Good day to you.
Marvin? Marvin! Oh, uh, good evening, sir. Take my hat and coat, please. Very good. Oh, the piano arrived, I see. Uh, about an hour ago. I took the liberty of, of dusting it, sir. Marvin? Yes, Mr. Fortune? If you're going to wait on the guest tonight, then do something about your face. My face, sir? Yes, Marvin. A party is supposed to be a happy occasion. Could you manage to look a little less miserable than usual? I, uh... I will try, sir. Do that. Anything will be an improvement. You may make my evening martini now. Right away. Is that you, Gerald? Yes, Esther. Hello, darling. How was your day? Oh, fine. The museum again with a friend. Been going there quite a lot lately. I have. You said you wanted me to improve my mind. Indeed. One can never know too much. And what else would you like me to do? Well, there is one thing. And that would be? You might consider letting Marvin go. What do you mean? Show him the door. Give him the sack. In short, find a replacement, and as soon as possible. Oh, really, Gerald? I'm quite serious. What has he done now? It isn't anything he's done. It's his appearance. He seems the same as always. Well, that's the trouble. It's the way he looks. I can't bear coming home only to be confronted by that lugubrious expression on his face. I find it unspeakably depressing. Don't you? Not particularly, Gerald. Look at him, like a hound dog, ready to burst into tears at any moment. Surely we can find a servant who's more cheerful to have around. Keep your voice down. Why? There's no need to hurt his feelings. The man has no feelings. He's a clod. Gerald. You haven't commented on the piano. I was about to. You don't care for it? I love it. I really do. Have you tried it yet? I didn't know how, so I decided I'd wait until you got home. I knew you wanted to play. That's why I got it for you. Hardly any need. Hmm. The piano plays itself. Oh, you noticed. Wasn't that considerate of me? I thought I'd save you the trouble of all those tedious lessons, only to find out at the end that you had no gift for music. I see. Well, darling, aren't you moved by my thoughtfulness? Thank you, child. Let's have a demonstration, shall we? If you like. Marvin, is this thing plugged in? Yes, sir. Good. You see, these paper rolls are punched with holes. All you do is select one, insert it, and throw the switch. The paper passes over the slots and the keys move up and down as if someone were playing them. What fun. Quite the rage in the old days. Your drink, sir. In a moment. Now then, for example, here's one called Smiles. You open the panel, press it into place like this, start it on the take-up reel. <laughs> yeah, they don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> What on earth is the matter with you? Oh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. Marvin, are you all right? I'm very well, thank you, madam. Oh, but you're smiling. Am I? You most certainly are. That's probably because I'm happy. Have you been drinking my martini? No, sir. Well, then what do you have to be happy about? Everything, sir. I make good money, got a nice place to live, my health, money in the bank. I like my job. Well, you can't. I treat you atrociously. Oh, you don't bother me, Mr. Fortune. You, <laughs> you tickle me. What? Oh, yes. Sometimes it's all I can do to keep from laughing out loud when you have one of your tantrums. I get a kick out of it. When you go around, you know, flicking the table to be sure I've dusted, or or checking the silver to see if it's polished. Oh, I 
You, you are funny, Mr. Fortune. Am I? Yes, quite. Downright hilarious, if the truth be told. <laughs> Why, Marvin, I've never heard you speak like this. <laughs> Nor have I. Well, well, there's plenty more where that came from. I've got a million of them, sir. A million of them. Well, out with it, man. You're quite the comedian today. <sighs> Sorry. Sorry if I spoke out of place, sir. Well, on the contrary, Marvin, I'm glad you did. Will there be anything else, sir? Not at the moment. You may go now. Very good, sir. What a strange thing to happen. Wasn't it, though? An odd moment for us all. Most definitely. Who'd have thought that behind that gloomy exterior, the man was concealing a sunny nature? I can't imagine how it happened. I believe I can. I'd say it was because of something extraordinary that has come into our lives. Something absolutely extraordinary. So, what really happened, Gerald? Marvin behaved so strangely a moment ago, and then he stopped suddenly. Well, perhaps it's not so strange after all. I've always believed that we have two faces, the one we wear and the one we keep hidden underneath. The problem has been to find some method of revealing that hidden face. I suppose it helps if you know what particular hidden face you're looking for. But now it appears that I at least have the means. I don't understand, Gerald, and I'm not sure I want to. See you in a while. Esther, wait. Let's try another one. I have to get ready. No, no, not yet. Let's play something uh, a bit more intense. Some other time. Bear with me, Esther. An experiment, if you will. Well, what do you think of this one? I don't know what you want me to say. Go on. Don't hold back. What you're really feeling. I, ca I can't. You can. But... Uh, Let's hear it, darling. Now's your chance. You... You... Spit it out. You... Beast. That's the girl. For six years I have controlled myself, but I can't keep it in any longer. I was a stupid, naive child when I married you back in London. I thought you were a great man, but you aren't anything of the sort. You're a sadistic fiend. You take pleasure in humiliating me before your oh-so-clever friends for one simple reason. Because you enjoy hurting me. I've stood your cruelty all these years, but I won't stand for it anymore. Are you sure you're feeling well, my dear? I'm feeling very, very well. Better than I've felt in years. It's a great relief to tell you what I really think of you. It's been bottled up for so long. Go on, please. I'm listening. I thought you needed me. I thought you needed my love, but you don't. All you need is to have someone around to bully and torture whenever you feel like it. I've tried to love you. Heaven knows I have tried, but I hate you. I honestly hate you. <laughs> Bravo. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. May I congratulate you on a remarkable performance? Had it been on stage, my dear, I would have given you a superlative review. I, I don't know what possessed me. I do! That was your hidden face. I've suspected for years that beneath your unemotional facade, you were an hysterical little girl, and I was right. But how? Haven't you seen what's in the record shops these days? There is music for every conceivable occasion. Music for a rainy day, music for a romantic dinner, music to read by, music to dance by, music to dream by, music to do everything under the sun by. Could it be that this anachronistic old piano, the product of a more sensible time, has provided music to help us expose our hidden selves by? I, I still don't understand. 
Well, it's quite simple, really. Marvin was hiding his inherently happy nature, which was revealed when he heard happy music. You were concealing hysteria, and when you heard hysterical music, you couldn't hide yourself either. You mean the piano? That's exactly what I mean. I seem to have bought you a more interesting birthday present than I imagined. A kind of sonic lie detector, if you will. I wonder what other people are hiding. Our friends, for example. Gerald, please, promise me not to play the piano at my party tonight. I mean, to let it play itself. I promise no such thing. I wasn't looking forward to the festivities, but now I believe we may be in for a... Most amusing evening. Good evening, Marvin. Good evening, sir. Won't you come in? Greg, how nice to see you. Marvin, take Mr. Walker's coat. Yes, sir. I'm truly pleased that you could join us. You're unusually cordial tonight. That isn't a smile you're wearing, is it? I brought it out of storage in honor of Esther's birthday. I trust you've done the same. Not I. Smiling isn't among my plans for the evening. Drink. But of course. Oh, I'll make it for you. Marvin takes forever. I'm delighted to hear that you share my distaste for birthdays. Birthdays, anniversaries, and certain holidays I overlook whenever possible. They imply some degree of human involvement, the sort of thing I'd rather avoid. Is that true? I've been given to understand that you're something of a ladies' man, quite thickly involved, in fact. You've been misinformed. Have I? I'm much too selfish to fall in love. And you're miserable. Admit it. Not in the least. I value the peace and quiet of my bachelor's existence. It lets me write my plays without interference from anyone. How is the new play, by the way? Brilliant. Unfortunately, you'll never have the opportunity of panning it, as you have my other plays. No? Why not? It won't likely be performed any time soon. I thought you said it was brilliant. No, it is but I'm locking it away with orders that it not be produced until after my death. You see, it concerns a romantic triangle, and the three principles are rather well known. That shouldn't matter. Not if it's a good play. I'd rather not hurt anyone. I'm old-fashioned that way. Ridiculous. A great play is worth any amount of pain to any number of people, least of all three. Not these three. Sorry, old man. My mind's made up. Well, I'm sure you'll do as you see fit, as usual, regardless of anyone's opinion. For better or worse, I'm afraid. Where's your better half, by the way? Still at the makeup table, trying to obliterate the last few years of her life with powder and paint. Come, I'll show you a toy I found for her. Well, well. I haven't seen one of these old jobs in years. Mm, neither had I. Does it play? Remarkably well. Let me demonstrate. It's just this little switch here. Isn't that something? Romantic, wouldn't you say? Hmm. Is Esther pleased with it? She hasn't expressed any great enthusiasm. That doesn't sound like Esther. Has she heard this particular song? Not yet. Be sure to play it for her. She'll understand. Understand what? What you tried to do for her. Usually she's so grateful for any small sign of affection. I think that's one of Esther's most lovable qualities. Is that right? Her ability to accept a bouquet of daisies as if they were the rarest of orchids. I remember once I gave her a small turquoise ring. It didn't cost much. You gave her a ring? Yes. She accepted it as if it were the Hope Diamond. 
turquoise ring. Oh, yes, she came home from a trip with it. She'd been to Mexico City. But I seem to remember that uh, she went alone. What? Oh, she did. Strange how we ran into each other down there. A stranger still that Esther never mentioned it. Would you call that rather an odd coincidence? Not really. Jerry, has it ever occurred to you that I'm deeply in love with her? <laughs> My dear Gregory, you are about as capable of passion as a head of lettuce. And Esther could not rise beyond the level of a cast-off shoe. Don't speak of her that way. I will speak about her any way I please. She's my wife, or have you forgotten that? She may be, but you don't know her at all. Esther is full of love. Is she? Her skin is warm and soft as velvet. The scent of her is enough to drive a man wild. And her hands are so gentle, sweet to kiss and to hold. She is honey and gold and and summer days and singing and the feeling of being together. Gerald, no, turn it off. <laughs> I'm sorry you did that, Esther. I don't know when I've been so entertained. And you, Greg... Why would you say such things? Uh, sorry, Esther, I, I don't know what came over me. It's just as well. I never enjoyed deceiving you, Gerald. My dear, you are incapable of deceiving me. I've known for years your capacity for doing any number of sordid little things. The only revelation tonight has been the specific details of an unsavory affair. I'd better leave. Oh, don't be a schoolboy. We're in for a grand time this evening. Ah, our other guests are arriving. Before I welcome them, Esther, may I wish you a happy birthday? I hope that your next 40 years will be equally rewarding. What are you up to? Why, nothing, dear. Simply being the perfect host. I'll, I'll get it, sir. Don't bother, Marvin. I prefer to do the honours myself. Jerry, please don't play the piano again tonight. It's not something to fool around with. I'm not fooling around with it, Esther. I'm using it. With deadly accuracy. Hi there, Jerry. What happened to Marvin? Uh, here, Miss Moore. Good evening. Marge, dear, do come in. Marvin will take your wrap. Well, don't just stand there, Gerald, devouring me with your eyes. I know what's on your mind. Oh, kiss me, you fool. Like this? Oh, that's better. Marge, I'm quite vexed with you. You are? You promised the next time we saw you, you'd be svelte as an antelope. And what am I now? Oh, don't answer that. <laughs> I've been on more diets than a jockey has horses. Somehow they always throw me before we reach the finish line. Esther, happy birthday. Hello, Marge. I have a present for you. Margie. And you? I'm not even speaking to you, handsome. You haven't called me in months. Somebody else been taking my place? As a matter of fact, yes. We've just had a most illuminating discussion about Greg's new romance. Gerald, don't tell me who she is. I may go after her with my claws. Worse yet, you could sit on her and mash her to death. <laughs> Same old Jerry. <laughs> Now, who's going to make me a drink? Marvin will take care of you. I believe another stagecoach has arrived. Jerry, are we early? Oh, not at all. You're just in time. Darling, you look positively radiant. How do you do, Mr. Fortune? Pleased, I'm sure. And uh, you are... Oh, this is Roberto, my escort. Ah, I would never have guessed. And how is everyone at the Last Chance Ranch these days? Oh, Jerry, <laughs> behave. Come in, come in. You might want to fasten your seatbelts, though. Something tells me this may be an evening to remember. Ooh, how exciting. What do you have in mind, charades or strip poker? Something even more revealing than that. How about a game of ultimate truth or dare?
pick up the empty glasses, will you, Marvin? Yes, sir. Everyone, let me have your attention, please. What's he got in mind? Over here, by the piano. Some sort of surprise. That's it. Take whatever chair you like. If there aren't enough seats, the floor will do. This should be fun. Don't worry, it's quite clean. Oh, not for me, thanks. I'd never be able to get up. <laughs> now then, the hour has arrived for fun and games. Well, about time. Being friends of Esther's and mine, you are perhaps inclined towards such intellectual pastimes as pin the tail on the donkey and spin the bottle. Now you're talking. I want to be it. Not this time. I've decided that tonight, rather than cater to your juvenile side, we might try a more adult game. I'm hungry. When do we cut the cake? Compulsive eaters will find hors d'oeuvre within arm's reach. Now, for our game, I shall need a volunteer. For what? You can't trust Fitzgerald. No telling what he's got up his sleeve. Must we, Gerald? Indeed we must. Hold up your hands. No one? Very well, then. In the absence of a volunteer, I shall have to conscript someone. How about Marge Moore? OK, Svengali, I'll play along. What's the caper? Nothing physically demanding, my dear. I merely want you to listen to some music on the piano. What kind of music? Let me see. How about, um, Claire de Lune? Isn't that beautiful? Look at her. She's going into some kind of trance. <laughs> this is going to be good. Talk to me, Marge. Tell me what you're feeling now. My name is not Marge. It's not? What is your name? Tina. That's a pretty name. Tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? Who are you, Tina? A little girl. And what do you like to do, Tina? I like to dance. Good girl. Would you like to dance for us, Tina? All right. <laughs> Shh. Thank you, Tina. You may stop dancing now. That was fun. Tell me, do you always dance? Only when I'm Tina. And who are you the rest of the time? Might it be Marge? Sometimes I pretend I'm a snowflake. Really? White and tiny and perfectly formed, I float on the air of a pale blue moonlit night. I am never lonely. I am beautiful and I am loved. I see a man with his hand outstretched to receive me. A very handsome man. He sees me and knows that I am beautiful. Beautiful. I drift down until I reach his hand. I am enclosed in warmth. I... I melt with love. What? What? Where am I? Never fear. It's all in fun, my dear. What have I done? Nothing. Only an amusement for our guests. Why? Because I asked you. You were very compliant. But why me? Now, now, I chose you because I thought you could take a joke. Jokes are supposed to be funny. You think I'm funny, is that it? Not at all. Jerry, haven't we had enough of the piano? Not quite. I thought we'd perform one more listening test. 
For what possible purpose? To call forth the person who lives within someone else. And who might that be? Oh, I've been trying to make up my mind. What would be entertaining? A politician? A poet? A Broadway producer? Alas, I fear that there are none in our midst. Still, we must go for the big finish. So before the curtain falls, why not hear from the devil himself? What? <laughs> Gerald, please. The only question is, in whose breast does he reside? No one here, surely. This is ridiculous. Is it? Where's your spirit of scientific inquiry? There's nothing very scientific about this. A cheap parlor trick to embarrass people. Easy, Greg. We're all friends here, aren't we? Nonetheless, I doubt that I shall get a suitable volunteer, but it doesn't matter. Esther, put this roll on the piano. What is it? Faust. If there's a devil among us, we'll know it soon enough. I don't think I like this. Why not? Are you the Prince of Darkness? Hardly. Then bear with me a moment longer. It might be edifying, a process of elimination, if you will. Esther, the piano. But... Now. Very well. And you thought this would be a typical birthday party. I think we'd better be going. Oh, but the game's not over. I think it is. Really? It's late. Just another minute. You'll see. It'll be worth it. Don't. I have to. Not that role. Something else. Greg, thank you. You've just given me an idea. Esther? Yes? We're waiting. Here. It's ready. What is it? Brahms, I think. Yes, his lullaby. That's not what he asked for. Gerald, I seem to have made a mistake. Will this one do? Gerald? Gerald, can you hear me? What's good for the goose, I always say. Speak to us, devil. Go on, out with it. I am I'm a afraid. Do tell. And what are you afraid of, devil? I'm afraid of the dark. You're no devil. Listen to your voice. You're a frightened little kid. That's supposed to be a secret. It is, huh? Do you have another secret? Go on, tell us all your secrets, Jerry. This moment will never come again. For once, you're center stage. You have an audience in the palm of your hand. Yes, Jerry, tell us. I'm afraid of you all. Afraid of people. But why? Who are you, really? A small boy. I've stayed hidden away inside, but now I can't hide anymore. And what do you like to do, little boy? Hurt people. I can't stop from doing it. It's all I like to do. Why am I not surprised? Did you know, I envy you, Marge. I'm too afraid to, to embrace the world as you do. And in my envy, the boy tries to hurt you. Who else do you envy? Greg, are you here? Yes. I've tried to hurt you, too. I've given bad reviews to your plays when I should have given praise. I've coveted your talent because I had none of my own, and so I hurt you in every way I could. For once, I have to agree with you. I think we'd better go. I think that's a good idea. Thank you all for coming. Yes. I'll call you. Take care, Esther. We love you. I'm sorry you had to see this. Good luck. Esther, I've hurt you most of all. You came to me with love, but I couldn't accept it because it frightened me. I never learned how to return love except as a child does, with shrieks and blows and indifference. It must have been very, very difficult for you. Good night, Esther. Call me if you need me. But I do. 
Wait. Where are you all going? I don't want you to leave. Come back. Esther, come with me now. Will you do that? Yes. Yes, I will. Let me get my coat and purse. Don't leave me. If you do, I'm going to be very, very naughty. Ready? I'm ready. No! No, please! They were laughing. I'm sure of it. Nobody laughs at me. I'll show them. I'll show them all. See, I'm being bad. Very, very bad. Stop that hideous music. Make it stop. There. What do you think of that? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Fortune. What's happened? What's happened? What have I done? Where... Will there be anything else this evening? Are you laughing at me? Are you? Oh, no, sir. I'm most definitely not laughing. Because you're not funny anymore. Marvin! Marvin! Wait! Not you two! Don't leave me! Don't! Don't! Mr. Fitzgerald Fortune, critic, man about town, and cynic at large, whose wit shows no mercy at all for those who cross his path, which means the rest of the world. A man who went searching for a hidden cast of characters and instead found what is concealed within himself as the house lights dim just off the Great White Way at an empty theater in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Piano in the House, starring Michael York with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner Jr. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Christian Stolte, Renee Matthews, Doug James, Herb Graham, Meg Thalkin, Rosalind Alexander, Rick Vargas, and Kurt Nabig. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. A Quality of Mercy, starring Robert Nepper with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by Sam Rolfe. Heard in the cast were Roderick Peoples, Kip Karstedt, Jeff Lupatin, Joby Cerny, Roddy Chong, Joseph Orunda, and Doug James. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Man, oh man. They get it? Way off. What are they doing? Lobbing them in by hand? One more time. Baker Company. Baker Company. You missed the target. That's what I'm telling you. Well, try it again. Short. 500 yards. Sergeant Casserano says it was 500 yards short. That's right. Still. Tell him to raise it up. Sergeant says to elevate it. They say they can't elevate it anymore. What are they using? A slingshot? Listen. If you can't aim higher... Give me that. How do you expect it? This is Baker Company F.O. Good going, boys. Yeah, I've seen what you did. A big fat nothing. You wrecked five acres of rice paddies and you torn up a beautiful grove of palm trees, but that's it. What's it to me? Let me tell you. We're sitting out here on our duffs on a hill in the middle of nowhere and you know what we're doing? We're having a little discussion. Yeah, that's right. Maybe you can help us out. We're trying to decide whether you got something in your religion against sending a shell into a cave. Or is it too hard for you? Because if it is... <laughs> you tell him, Sarge. Oh, those jokers. What? Say again. Bypass? Oh, now that's more like it. Because all you accomplish today is to tear up five acres of real estate and keep a handful of Japanese soldiers from falling asleep. Yeah. Well, I got a question for you. Anybody know how long it takes an enemy to die from insomnia? Same to you. Oh, we'll keep in contact, all right. You sure they're on our side? Makes me wonder sometimes. Give me a light. Here you go, sir. So what's the word? Did I hear you say bypass? They're gonna keep fire until late this afternoon. At least that's what they say. And then if they can't smoke them out, we'll just have to bypass it and move on. That's what I like to hear. Amen. I'm feeling better already. Me too. I'm getting cross-eyed looking through these binoculars. When they say flanks, I say thanks. I don't know about the rest of you, but I got no big urge to run headfirst into anything anymore. Not at this stage of the game. That's for sure. still there. Nothing but a hole in the side of a mountain looking right back at us. They, they can see us, but we can't see what's in the cave. And we're supposed to take that thing? Buddy boy, when two airstrikes and a whole afternoon of lobbing shells don't accomplish anything, then that means you better say your prayers and start counting your cartridges. But, Sarge, I, I thought you said... Th Put it this way. I got what you call a nodding acquaintance with the bottom of this barrel. And when they can't budge an enemy with the big stuff, that's when they call out the queen of battle, the ever-loving infantry. Ain't we the lucky ones. What do you figure we got left, Sarge? Before it's over, I mean. Month? Doesn't matter what I think. Maybe less, huh? Don't ask me. We got them ringed in all over the place. The poop is, they're as good as finished, even in Okinawa. Then why are we still fighting? That's the trouble with these little crumbs. I just don't know when they're licked. Maybe they ain't human. Or maybe they just don't get it. Think about it. There they are, holed up in a miserable cave, half-starved, half-beat to death. And nobody bothered to tell them it's the bottom of the night. They already lost most of their ball club, but they keep on fighting. Why? Yeah. Why?
It's August 1945, the last grimy pages of a dirty, torn book of war. The place is the Philippine Islands. The men you've just met are what's left of a platoon of American infantry. Their dulled and tired eyes, set deep in dulled and tired faces, can now look forward to a miracle, the moment when the nightmare comes to an end. Or so it appears. For they've got one more battle to fight, a crazy, illogical standoff in the final days of a particular hell known as World War II. And in a moment, we'll observe that battle firsthand. August 1945, the Philippines. But in reality, it's high noon in a place called the Twilight Zone. And now... The Twilight Zone and our story, A Quality of Mercy, starring Robert Nepper with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There we go again. Hit anything this time, Sarge? I tell you what, I'm not even going to bother to look. You check it out for me, all right, Anacek? Feet sitting here. Where's the field glasses? Be my guest. Well, oh well. What do you know? You see something down there? Sure. I see a white flag. Yep. Now they're coming out of the cave. And guess what, boys? They got something for us. Uh, looks like... Uh, Oh, wait a minute. There's a pretty little geisha girl leading the pack. And she's carrying a tray full of rice. And a hot towel. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> gotcha. Hey, hey, hold on. There is something coming. Who is it? Don't know. Uh-oh. I think I see a gold bar on his helmet. Give me those glasses. Oh, man. Just what we need. A brand new Louis. All spit and polish. Ain't he handsome, though? All right, men. Try at least to look like Army. What for? He won't last long. Well, looky what we got here. That uniform's so new, it ain't never been washed. Brand new holster, too. Well, that's what I call a pistol. No kidding. Pearl handle and all. Sent us a real tiger this time. Five bucks says it's never been fired. Which of you is Sergeant Cazarano? <clears throat> that would be me. I'm Lieutenant Cattell. Sir. I'm taking over your platoon. Out of fact. What's your situation here? We're observing for a mortar company, Lieutenant. So I've been told. That cave down there? A bunch of the enemies holed up. Been trying to get them out for two days. No luck? Nothing doing. Your binoculars, please, Sergeant. Here you go. Hmm. Tough situation. I guess you know what that means. Sir? We have some mopping up to do. We? Yeah, you heard me. I'd say we'd do best to go at it frontally. Frontally? Yeah, just move right in and wipe them out. Hey, Lieutenant. You sure you got the right platoon? What about it, Sergeant? Well, now, uh... Call the rest of the company together. The rest of the company? On the double. Where are they? Back of the CP. This is it? All six of us. In that case, we'll have to go it alone. Say again? Something wrong with your ears? Go it alone? With a half dozen men? No, I'm begging the lieutenant's pardon. You just inherited a good group, but, but not that good. This is infantry, sir. Not kamikaze. He doesn't have the wrong platoon. He's got the wrong army. Your name is what? 
Uh, Watkins, Lieutenant. Andrew J. Are you accustomed to talking to an officer on your back? Matter of fact, sir, I'm not accustomed to talking to an officer in any way. And why is that, soldier? We've lost our last three platoon, Louis, and I guess you could say there's been a space of time in between. Well, you've got another one assigned now, and you're going to have to learn to live with that. Starting with this reminder. When you address an officer, I want to see you stand up on your feet like a man. We've been on the line 33 days, Lieutenant. Your point is? Not much sleep. You know what that's like? You have my sympathy, Sergeant. But my job is to lead this platoon, and I plan to do exactly that. My way. Then maybe you'd better tell us. Just what is your way? When I tell you boys to jump, you'll jump. When I tell you to stand up on your feet, you'll do so. And if I tell you to head toward that cave, guns port and bayonets fixed, that's exactly what you're going to do. Double time. Any more questions? Begging the lieutenant's pardon. Any more questions? <sighs> no, sir. Good. What are your orders, lieutenant? Since we don't have a clear line of sight into the cave, and since there's no cover between here and there, we don't have a choice. We'll have to move down into the open, and just go ahead and take it, full frontal. What about it, Sergeant? You want my opinion? I'm willing to discuss it, in terms of military strategy. In military terms, Lieutenant, it goes like this. First off, you better muddy up that gold bar on your helmet so it doesn't shine too bright. Otherwise, you got yourself a target they can shoot at right in the middle of your head. Then you better take off the one on your collar and stick it in your pocket. I'm asking you for a chronology. And I'm giving it to you. The enemy happens to be half-starved and half on its knees, but they're not dumb. They're tough, shrewd, and they got eyes. We lost three platoon officers already because they made a motion of command with one of their hands. That's what the Japs look for, a person in command. I'd intended to remove the insignia. But what about the cave? What do you know about it? Not much. We saw some of them run in, holding each other up. They're in bad shape. No telling how many were already in there. But they got a machine gun, and somebody's pretty good with it. But not good enough to stop a full-on attack. Well, maybe we'll have to do that, eventually. But as far as I'm concerned, the war don't have to end by dinner time. I'm aware of that, Sergeant. I say we sit on it for the rest of the day and see what some 105s can do before we make a final plan. You might be right for someone who's used to taking his time, but it strikes me that we could move in there right now and wipe them out inside of an hour. Get close enough to lob grenades and pulverize them. If you want to get the job done instead of loafing, that seems to be the one thing this platoon is extremely good at. <laughs> Lieutenant, how long have you been out here? What's that got to do with it? Oh, not a whole lot, I guess. But you make it sound like a football game. It ain't a football game, Lieutenant. It's one long gut ache. With some torn up, mangled boys fresh off the farm, and it's gonna take a long time to forget. You ain't been shot at yet, Lieutenant. Remember that. How would you know... And you ain't shot nobody either, have you? You beat me over here, Sergeant, I'll give you that. But when it comes to killing Japanese, I think you'll find I'm a highly trained and very efficient officer. Yes, sir. I'm sure you are. I was well-schooled in tactics and equipment. I'd say you could all use a refresher course around here. Maybe so. You, soldier. Yes, sir. Let me see your rifle. Uh, right here, sir. That's a filthy piece, soldier. Well, there's a lot of mud around here. That's no excuse. I want clean weapons in this platoon. That's number one priority. The worst thing that can happen is for your weapon to jam. Now break them down and clean them, because we're here to kill Japs. Or did you forget? That's our job, and by God, we're gonna do it. This outfit better shape up fast, or I'm putting you all on report. It sounds pretty gung-ho. Yeah, real bloodthirsty. Think he wants us to scalp him, too? You have something to say? Me? No, sir. What is it with you men? No sleep? Or no guts? You tired of killing Japs? Is that it? Or don't you have the stomach for it? Listen, sir. Let it go. No, when I got something to say, I'm gonna say it. Go ahead. Let's hear it. 
We're 24 months up on you, Lieutenant. We've seen a lot of blood and heard a lot of screaming from both sides. You've got a big deal about doing some killing. We'll fall in on that order, don't you worry. But you can't order us to like it. We've seen enough dead men to last us for the rest of our lives. The rest of our lives and then some. We'll do some more killing for you, Lieutenant. All you want. Just don't ask us to cheer about it. We'll see about that. Radio operator. Here. Get me base camp. Sir? Tell them to hold mortar fire. On my order. For now, prepare to attack. We're going to take that cave head on. Whether you farm boys like it or not. Give me your binoculars, Sergeant. You can't see anything down there. It's too dark. It won't be dark when the shells hit. I want to see how close they come. You think they're going to make it this time? I'm betting on it. I told them to elevate exactly three degrees. Oh, why didn't I think of that? With the side of that mountain blown out, they won't have any place to hide. The cleanup will be easy, Sergeant. Even for you. Piece of cake, Lieutenant. Piece of cake. Still short. Yep, that's what it looks like. Casarano, does flamethrowers arrive? Yes, sir. Good. I figure we can move in behind the next barrage and get within 50 yards of the opening. Just like that. Flamethrowers can do a lot of damage, can't they? They can. What about phosphorus grenades? Oh, them too. If you put them in the right place. But... But what? I wouldn't want to get hit by one. We're not talking about you, we're talking about the enemy. Right. Well, wait till dawn, then move in. Check with company for the mortar barrage so we'll be ready to go. Okay, sir. I'll tell the men we're going in. You'll have to double time this one, Sergeant. That is, if you want to keep up with me. Oh, we'll keep up. But... Something you want to say to me, Sergeant? No. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm sure. I'm not your cup of tea, am I, Sergeant? I guess you got a little too much vinegar for me, Lieutenant. That's what it takes in wartime. You know, sir... What? We could bypass it. Bypass? Where did you get an idea like that? There aren't 20 men in that cave. Most of them are sick, or injured, or half-starved. They're probably out of their minds by now. But they're Japs, aren't they? They're men. They're dirty little cowards. Are they? You've got a funny group here, Sergeant. And you're the oddball of the bunch. If I may make an observation, the way I size you up is this. You've either got battle fatigue, the whole lot of you, or you're chicken. Maybe a little of both. Maybe neither. I don't rightly know. But the way I size you up, Lieutenant, is... Go ahead, say it. I'd like to hear this. Pea green shave tail right out of the panhandle. Scared to death he won't bag his limit. Or worse, all shook up because he's afraid somebody will peg him as a Johnny-come-lately instead of a rough, tough killer. I think that should do. You ask, you get told. You can't have it both ways. I said that should... You want to prove your manhood, Lieutenant? Okay. But it's too late to get your choice about how to do it. It's down to one lousy cave full of sick, pitiful, half-dead losers. And a handful of dirty, bone-tired men who've had their craw full of this war. You're a lousy soldier, Casarano. And that goes for the rest of these poor, sensitive, sad, sick boys you want to bottle feed. Did someone forget to tell you that when you fight a war, you fight a war? And that you kill until you're ordered to stop killing? I got the message, Lieutenant. Roger Wilco. I hope so. The message that there's always somebody like you who squeaks in just before they close the door. Somebody who has to grind his axe before you can give that final order, no matter what. You listen up, Sergeant. What's your pleasure, Lieutenant? How many more have to die before you get satisfaction? Offhand, I'd say all of them. 
I don't care where they are or who they are. If they're the enemy, that's it. First day of the war or last day of the war. They get it. Keep the binoculars. You're gonna need them. You've broken your foot glasses, sir. I know. I... What? I said, it appears that your binoculars are broken, Lieutenant. Give me those. Wait. Who are... Sir? I said, who are... What are you? Sergeant Yamazaki. What? These men, they're all... All... Soldiers, sir. Your soldiers. What? We await your command, Lieutenant Yamori. Sir! Well, where are you going? Not that way, sir! Not that way! Toward the mountain! Look! He runs down the hill! To the cave! No! It's too dangerous! He must not! Watch out! <laughs> Lieutenant! Stay down! Did you get him, sir? I don't know. Dirty little... Kazarano! Hold your fire! It's me! There he is! Get him! Lousy chap! Take a bite off this! <laughs> Lieutenant! Stay where you are! We will return to fire! They got us trapped in here. We'll never get out of this cave. Oh yeah? Watch this. Eat lead, creeps! Lieutenant Yamori! Run back now! Keep your head down! Which way? Can't tell. Which way do I... The hill. Is it hurt? Lieutenant Yamori? What? That was. That was exceedingly brave, sir. To attack the Americans single handedly. Americans? What are you talking about? The Americans in the cave. Twenty or thirty of them. Most of them wounded, but nonetheless armed. Very dangerous. Like animals. Aren't that many? Are you... Are you alright, sir? Where are we? In the clearing, sir. At the top of the hill. I've seen you before, but I can't... Who are you? Who am I, sir? Sergeant Yamazaki. Are you alright, sir? Are you feeling well? I asked you a question. Question? What are we doing here? What is this place? Why... Why Corregidor, sir? Corregidor? When? When, sir? You mean... What is the day's date? May 4th, sir. May 4th! Can't be May 4th. No? It's August. Don't you understand? August. August the 6th. Uh, I humbly ask the lieutenant to forgive me, but I must correct him. The date is May 4th. <sighs> May 4th when? What year? The year 1942, sir. Is the... Is the lieutenant all right? A bomb to the head? Uniform and wearing. It looks just like... Like all your uniforms. Perhaps a touch of malaria. Did you call me? Lieutenant, sir. Your rank. You called me something else. You called me by a name... Yamori. Your name, sir. Lieutenant Yamori. <laughs> no. No! No! What happened to me? 
What's going on here? What's happened? What is wrong with this man? I don't know, Captain Nakagawa. Yamuri, are you sick? <laughs> no. No. I require an answer, Lieutenant. I ask if you were sick. He's dead. And I am sick. We will be moving out soon. If you are too ill to move, you leave me no choice. We shall leave you here. Leave me? We have no transport for the wounded, as you well know. So, we will very shortly move forward, and you shall remain here. My name... My name... My name isn't... On your feet when an officer speaks to you. But my... My name isn't Yamuri. I swear to you. Something's... Something's happened. My name isn't Yamuri. My name is... Silence. Place this man under arrest. Yes, sir. Lieutenant, please, get up. I gave you an order, Sergeant Yamasaki. Men? I, I'm all right. Forgive me, sir. I... You what? I was. I was feverish for a moment. I forgot where I was. Ah. I'm all right now. You're sure of that? Yes, sir. I'm sure. I'm, I'm very sure. Very well. Sergeant, we move out in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, sir. Unfortunately, the artillery was unable to do its job. We shall attack the cave in force. Ready to move out. Sergeant. Yes? The cave he mentioned. Are you feeling better now? Yes, but the cave. He means the one where I was just... The cave with the enemy. Put a new clip in your rifle. Let me help you. Which enemy? The American enemy, sir. The stupid fools who don't know when to give up. Here, fix your bayonet. My... The captain does not like to take prisoners. The captain? Yes, Sergeant. Prisoners, sir. What? What about the prisoners? You know my policy. Yes, sir. But what if uh, they surrender? What about the wounded? I doubt that there will be any left to surrender when we are finished. Yamori! Sir? You will take the first section. Move forward as quickly as you can. Then drop down 50 yards in front of the opening. But, sir... Watch for my signal. We will cover you with automatic fire for two or three minutes before you make the frontal attack. Sections two and three will follow. Understood? Yes, sir. I didn't hear you. I understand, sir. Be very sure that you do. Now, go and prepare your men. Your section, sir. Which? Over there. The captain expects you to lead them into victory. Come with me for a moment. Where, sir? Away from the others. Look down there. The cave. Yes? You said... You said something about their being wounded inside? I think so, Lieutenant. When they ran inside, they were carrying each other. I don't think there are more than 20 or 30 men. Not even that. It shouldn't be too difficult. They are only Americans, not good fighters. And they are very weak. Poor, starving soldiers. Please, 
You mustn't speak that way. The captain... Don't they know when to quit? If they have wounded, what's the point? They can't go on this way. If they surrender now, there might be a chance. What did you say? Nothing, Captain. I didn't hear. What did you just say? Repeat it. Just if... If they're wounded, sir, perhaps... Perhaps what? If we gave them a chance to surrender first, or... Or what? If we left them there. Left them? Bypassed the cave completely, and moved on. Bypassed them. Is that a tactical judgment? I think it is. Or is it some nugget of compassion for the enemy unearthed by your fever? They are wounded. They're running out of supplies. They can't do much harm. Neither can they sink a battleship from this position. But their forces can. That is why we must destroy them. But if they have no more strength to fight... A reminder, Lieutenant. The identity of the men in the cave. They are Americans. They are enemy. Wounded, healthy, walking or lying down. They are enemy. The Japanese army does not bypass. The Japanese army attacks. The Japanese army wipes out its opponents to bring an end to this war. They're wounded. They're beaten and they're wounded. Their forces have suffered heavy losses. The rules of war rules. Lieutenant Yamuri, it is odd that you should require this reminder. But the comparative health and well-being of the enemy, his comfort or his discomfort, the degree of his anguish or his incapacities have no bearing on military action. These things have no more to do with a tactical move or a decision of command than the fortunes of an anthill that you step on when we move forward to attack. But they're not ants. Correct. They are enemy. If when we enter the cave they are lying on the ground, crying in agony, pleading for mercy, I can assure you I will have no more compunction about making them a head shorter than I would about stepping on that anthill. Captain, they are men. You are not listening. They are enemy. This is war, and in war you kill. You kill, Lieutenant. Do you understand? You kill until you are ordered to stop killing. No! Now, pick up your broken field glasses and prepare to attack, or I will have you shot. Sir. Sections, assemble! Sergeant Yamazaki! Sir! You will handle the first section. Sergeant Hino! Hi! Take the second section. Lieutenant Ishimoto! Hi! Yours is the third section. Now, we move out! Lieutenant Yamori, let me help you to your feet. I will take care of him, Sergeant, when we return. Yes, sir. Captain, what you do to those men in the cave? Will it shorten the war by a week? By a day? An hour? Enough. May I ask the captain, what is his pleasure? How many have to die before he receives satisfaction? Offhand, Lieutenant Yamuri, I would say all of them. I don't care who they are or where they are. If they are the enemy, they are to be destroyed. First day of the war, or last day of the war, we destroy them! Rest now, Lieutenant. I will be back. Your field glasses are broken. I will take new ones from the Americans. My... glasses... my... binoculars... Yes, I, I broke them when I, when I, when I.
Anytime you say, Lieutenant. What? What? What did you? Looks like you can't use those binoculars now, though. Binoculars? To help you with a duck shoot. No, well, we'll just have to follow your orders blind. <laughs> blind as a bat. Sergeant. Sergeant. Casarano? Of course, when we start firing, there'll be flashes. Wait a minute. Maybe that'll be enough for you to lead the charge, just like San Juan Hill, huh? Of course, we'll be going down, not up. Wait. Hold on. Maybe he wants to put it off. You want to hold the attack till later? No. Uh, yes. I, I mean... What do you mean, sir? Casarano, uh, something... Something happened. Yeah. You broke your glasses. Now you can't see down there. Tell you what, I'll get you a new pair of one of them Japanese, if we make it inside. No, you don't understand. Those men in the cave... Men now? Hey, boys, he called them men. And all this time I thought they were the enemy, to be destroyed just like that. Yeah, like animals. What do you do with animals when they get in your way? You kill them, right, Sergeant? Right. You slaughter them. You kill, kill, kill till they're all dead. Then you dig them up and kill them again. Ain't that right, Lieutenant? No. There's not going to be an attack. Those men are wounded, starved. There's no point in... in... Hold it. You hear that? Jeep on the road. Hold fire. Lieutenant Cattell here? I... He's right here. I have your orders, Lieutenant. Orders? You're to pull off the hill, sir. Who says? Colonel Hagen, that's who. Well, why would he say that? Considering he just sent a new lieutenant to lead the charge. I... <laughs> Don't you guys know? Know what? Guess you haven't heard. <laughs> Air Force dropped a bomb on Japan this morning. So? A big one. I mean, the granddaddy of every bomb ever made. A, uh, I think they call it an atomic bomb. What about it? Well, they figure this is going to end the war inside of a few hours. The Emperor is ready to give up. Well, ain't that something. All units are to pull back to base camp and wait it out. See what happens. Some kind of announcement coming any time now. I'm gone. Is this it? All right, boys, you heard the man. Get your gear and move out. Oh, man. I'm going to get me the biggest steak you ever saw. First thing I'll hit for is a hot bath. How about it, Lieutenant? You with us? Or do you want to stay here and fight it out all by your lonesome? Uh, with you. Something on your mind, Lieutenant? Yeah. Yeah, something. I'll bet. But I wouldn't fret it if I was you. There'll be other wars sooner or later. Other caves. Other human beings you can knock off. I, I hope not. God help us. I hope not. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven on the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Shakespeare, the Merchant of Venice. But applicable to any moment in time, to any group of soldiery, to any nation on the face of the earth, or, as in this case, to the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. 
Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Why are you driving so slowly, Miller? Sorry, sir. The traffic is unusually heavy today. I can see that. But can't you speed it up a bit? I wish I could, Mr. Gordon. Ever since we crossed the bridge, it's been bumper to bumper. Well, then try an alternate route. This is the alternate route, sir. But it doesn't look very promising. Oh, I'm going to be late. She doesn't like it when I'm late. No, sir. I better call home. A capital idea. It's busy again. Yes, sir. There's something wrong with this phone. The batteries are going haywire. Would you like to try mine, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Pa pass it back to me. I'll dial if you like. What number? You know the number. My apartment, of course. I'll give it here. Very good, sir. Who is she talking to? Perhaps she's calling your office. Well, this phone isn't working either. What did you do, sir? Throw it out the window. Cheap plastic contraption. But it was an excellent phone, sir. You bought it for me last week. Then I'll buy you another one. Now get me home. Yes, sir. May I suggest... The ice bucket is full. There's a bottle of your favorite scotch. Not at this hour. It'd only slow me down. Have enough trouble keeping up with her as it is. Quite. Oh, Flora, please don't be cross with me tonight. I'll be home, dearest, I swear to you, just as soon as I can. Of course you will, sir. Such a lovely girl. I'm very fortunate, you know. Most certainly. A man of my years. If I may say so, Mrs. Gordon is very lucky, too. I'm sure she appreciates how lucky. Yes, yes, I'm sure she must, but sometimes I wonder what it's like for her alone all day at her age. Poor thing. Hello, concierge. Yeah, this is Mrs. Gordon. Um, could you send up some chili cheese fries and a Coke? I'm starving. Just put it on the tab. Don't worry, Harmon will pay you. See, we were going out to dinner, but now I don't know if he's ever going to get here. Picture of an unlikely lady-in-waiting and her knight in not-so-shining, shining armor. An aging man who leads his life, as Thoreau said, in quiet desperation. Because Harmon Gordon is a slave of love, and has been, most unfortunately for him, ever since his heart was captured by a woman some forty years his junior. And because of this, he runs when he should walk. He surrenders when simple pride dictates he should take a stand. He pines away for the lost morning of his life when he should be enjoying the evening. In short, Mr. Harmon Gordon may not know it yet, but what he seeks most desperately is a fountain of youth. And who's to say he won't find it? Because this just happens to be in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Short Drink from a Certain Fountain, starring Adam West with Stacy Keach as your narrator.
Flora. Flora Dare. Over here, Romeo. Oh, there you are, darling. What happened to you? Please accept my apologies. The traffic was backed up all the way from the office. How come I'm not surprised? You'd be late for your own funeral. And what did you do today? Go shopping again? Oh, I had a ball. An absolute swinging time. I only ask in passing, my dear, because I'm concerned. Oh, let's see. I had breakfast, and then I had lunch, and then I fired that stupid maid, and then I waited for you. Whether you realize it or not, big boy, that routine gets old fast. Very old. I'm truly sorry. Well, all in all, Harmon, it was one of those days that makes you want to jump off a bridge. Earth to Harmon, do you read me? There's still time if you care to go out. Yeah, and do what? Dinner at the tavern. <laughs> Whoop-de-doo. I thought you liked the food there. How about the rainbow room? Well, I suppose, if you prefer, it is awfully noisy there. At least we could hear some music. You want music? But I bought you all the latest recordings. I want live music, any kind. I don't care, as long as I can dance. Dance? Matter of fact, I feel like dancing right now. You do? Will you dance with me, Harmon? Well, I, I suppose. Come on, baby. Let's see what you've got. Let me take off my hat and coat. Oh, come on. Loosen up. Let it move you. Feel that beat? I'm, I'm trying, dear. Move it, Harmon. I'm doing my best. What's wrong with you? I can't keep up. Shake your booty. Now move your arms like this. Flora, please be more careful. It was just a piece of glass. It was a very old piece of glass. Worth what, 89 cents? Hardly. This, this was a wedge wood. Big deal. I'll buy you six more just like it. I'll even have the concierge gift wrap them for our anniversary. Then we can sit around and play old records. Sounds like a hot night to me. What's that tune you like? Come to the church in the Wildwood? Oh, a real toe tapper. You keep forgetting that I'm no longer a varsity end. <laughs> Were you ever? Furthermore, if my doctor had witnessed that little burst of activity just now... Oh, that's always your excuse. It's not an excuse. My heart... If you keep telling me about your heart and all your aches and pains, Harmon, I'm gonna run out and get sick. Would you mind putting that cigarette out, dear? I've asked you not to smoke. Why not? Bad for your heart? You might start a serious fire. Honey baby, one of these fine late evenings, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Torch this whole mausoleum. There are things here that mean a great deal to me. Like what? That eyesore I knocked over? It was... it was my mother's. Oh, spare me. It was worth very little except for... the sentimental value. That's a word you may not understand, Flora. Sentiment. It means the capacity to love. Listen, big boy. If I don't fill the bill anymore, just say it loud and clear. In case you forgot, there are 14 flights a day to Reno, and I'd love to be on any one of them. But if I am, you're gonna pay. Big time. Flora, darling, I am not angry. I, I simply wish that, well, that you'd be a little more careful and considerate. Somebody should have wished that five years ago when you and I signed the papers. I knew you were old, Harmon, but I didn't know how old. You better watch yourself, honey. If you ever take me to a swinging weekend in Egypt, I might just run away with a mummy. Know what I mean? I'll just, uh, just wash up a bit and we can go out to dinner. Oh, you do that. We'll make it your night, baby. We'll go someplace wild, like the Elk's Lodge. Flora, Flora, darling. What's happened to us? That's it. Flora. I told you, I don't want to talk about it anymore. But Flora, dear, I told you I was tired before we left. Flora, dear, I told you I was tired. You're always tired. It's not something I can control. These pills I take. I didn't ask you to run the mile. I just asked you to go dancing or to the movies or someplace, any place but here. 
We went dancing on Monday evening. We've been to the movies twice this week. I only thought... Thought what? That you could take my mind off what a miserable bore you are? Well, let me tell you something, honey. I only thought that, well, just one evening, only one, we could quietly watch television or read or have a conversation. It's a fine art, you know. The two of us with no one else around. Something to bring us closer together. And you think that's all it takes? This is so like you. The Late Late Show, after we have a game of chess. That's not what I mean. Sounds really great for senior citizens at the old folks' home. But for your information, sweetie pie, I don't have my reservation there yet. They won't let me in. I still have my own teeth. Flora, try to be reasonable. And don't tell me how you picked me out of a chorus line and introduced me to the finer things in life. Your idea of the finer things is to hold hands in church and listen to the organ music. Flora, you know that isn't true. Take my advice. Get yourself a nice glass of warm milk and curl up with an almanac. Whatever it takes to get you through the night. Because this time, it ain't me, babe. <laughs> Forgive me. I know it's late, but is Dr. Gordon still in the lab? He is? May, may, may I speak to him, please? This is his brother calling. Yes, I'll wait. Now then, Leonard. Yes? Which monkey would you say is dominant in this group? I guess the largest. Look again. The largest monkey is seated in the corner of the cage doing absolutely nothing. Doesn't seem very dominant now, does he? You're right. Now, notice the small one in the center of the group. The young one? He has the food and water to himself. No one's challenging his position. But doesn't that go against the normal rules? Of social organization? Not where the young are concerned. And the cause of this new hierarchy, Leonard, is the Gordon vaccine. He's been injected for three weeks running now. His appearance has changed, and the others can see it. They may not understand, but they respect it. They have to. They share a responsibility for his well-being. I see. Dr. Gordon. The implications... I mean, if this process could be extended to other species, other social structures, the results would be... Just a moment. Yes, Julie, I thought I told you no more calls. I'm sorry, sir, but it's your brother. He asked me to ring through. Harmon? Well, what do you know? Put him on. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Gordon. Raymond? Harmon, is that you? I hope I'm not interrupting. Are you all right? You sound a bit under the weather. Oh, fine, fine. Look, Raymond, I was just wondering if, if you could come over this evening. Tonight? Well, I don't know. I was just training a new assistant. How about lunch tomorrow? I'm afraid that won't do. I, I know it's late, but I'd like to see you. Why so mysterious? If it's something to do with your health... No, no, no. Everything's all right. Everything's fine. It's just that, well, I, I'd like to talk to you. I see. Raymond, please, please come over. I'm at my wit's end. I must talk to you. Very well, then. Thank you, Raymond. You don't know how much this means to me. Relax, old boy. I'll be there as soon as I lock up. What is it, Doctor? Nothing serious, I hope. No, no, nothing serious. But if I'm not mistaken, there may be a slight problem of social organization in my own family. Drink all right? Perfect. Good. Uh, that's good. You look tired, Harmon. Do I? Yes, Harmon, tired and depressed. Now, do you want to tell me about it, or shall we sit here and play 20 questions for the rest of the evening? <sighs> Been pretty rushed the last week or so. Flora asleep? Yes, yes, she went to bed about an hour ago. She asked, she asked to be remembered. Oh, she'll be remembered. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. Merely an observation. You know, you really ought to, ought to get to know her better, Raymond. She's really a, a fine girl. Did I say otherwise, Harmon? No, but I know you two haven't been exactly close as a brother and sister-in-law should be. 
Harmon, would you do me a favor? Anything. Two favors, actually. First of all, don't sell me on Flora. Don't even try. You know what I think of her. And this isn't backbiting now. This is what I've told her to her face, so I have no compunctions about saying it aloud. Saying what? Let me finish. I could forgive her her appetites, Harmon. I could forgive the fact that she's made out of asbestos and doesn't have a heart in her body. You're being unfair. But I cannot forgive her for what she's done to you. She's turned you into a frightened, quaking, damned fool who dotes on her, gives into her whims, and runs after her like a poodle. That's item one. Raymond, please. My second favor is simply that from now on, after you've had your battles, you not call me at odd hours of the night. I don't do this often. Once is often. Twice is endless. Harmon, we're very close as brothers go, don't you think so? Yes, despite the difference in our ages. Maybe that's why. You've always been my big brother. And you know there isn't anything in this world that I wouldn't do for you if it's in my power. But you can't expect me to run over here like a St. Bernard every time you get frozen halfway up the mountain. You make me ashamed. Don't be. She's a predatory little alley cat, and she's always been that way. I knew it the first time I saw her, but... I can give you only so much solace, so much sympathy, and then it begins to stick in my craw. Now, what is it you want tonight? Just just someone to while away the hours with you? Or is there something more specific? Uh, the things you've been working on at the Institute. Go on. The cellular injections, you've been successful with them, haven't you? Oh, no. You're out of your mind. Desperate I am. Out of my mind, I'm assuredly not. But you must be, if you're thinking... You've made animals younger. I've read your paper, you've injected them with your fluid, and they've become young again. Isn't that true? Animals, indeed. Guinea pigs, white mice, hamsters. You've been able to rejuvenate glands, organs, sometimes the entire cellular structure. But we haven't even scratched the surface yet, Harmon. We're stumbling along in the dark. I want you to inject me. And I repeat, you must be out of your mind. We don't have a remote idea of what's involved here. The research is very impressive. All right, we've managed to rejuvenate a handful of small animals and rodents, but we're 20 years away from trying this on human beings. Why? Are you serious? We're dealing in the basic building blocks of life, Harmon. We don't have the remotest idea of how much damage might result in the long term. We don't know what we're doing to the basic metabolism of the body or the mind. God only knows what effect this has on the brain. Harmon, we're winging this, and we've killed as many as we've saved. You said you'd do anything for me. Anything within reason. This is within reason. I'm close to the end of my rope, Raymond. I've reached a point where it really matters very little to me if I live or die. Surely not. I want you to test this serum on me. Short of that, I can't bear getting any older. Aside from this, this pronounced death wish of yours, how would you like to spend the rest of your life as a mutated freak? Or a blithering idiot, or a mindless shell. This is not only possible, Harmon, it's highly probable. We couldn't control an experiment with a human being. It'd be catch-as-catch-can. I not only would take the risk, I'd welcome it. The answer is no. You don't know what you're saying. Nor do you. Then it's the same as a death sentence. Exactly right. I wouldn't try experimenting on a strange bum picked up off the street, let alone my own brother. Please? The answer is a firm, irrevocable no. In that case, I bid you good night, Raymond, and I thank you for coming. I trust you can let yourself out. Where are you going? Out onto the balcony. I'd like to be alone. Harmon? I said I'd like to be alone to collect my thoughts. Bear this in mind. As a physician, I can attest to the effects on the human body of landing on a concrete sidewalk after a 500-foot fall. It isn't pretty. And as a man, can you attest to the effects on the human heart when a man is deeply, dedicatedly, totally in love with a woman who can't stand the sight of him, the sound of him, the look of him? Have you any idea what kind of life this is for me? 
I know what kind of life it could be, and should be. You're a bright, charming, wealthy, discerning guy, and you've been warped and hammered out of shape by a flashy little piece of baggage who isn't fit to wait on your table. Whatever she is, and whatever she isn't, she's the only thing on God's earth that I care about. Do you know what it's like to believe your life is over and then suddenly, one day, to walk into a room and feel it begin all over again to see the sun in the sky, even though it's the dead of winter, to lie awake at night flushed with anticipation for a brand new day because she will be there. Don't do this to yourself. Listen to me. This is important. It matters. Ever since I was a young man, I wish for someone who'd let me show her the world, discover it with me. Because without anyone to share it with, the world might as well be buried under six feet of snow. Someone who'd be there, Ray, that's all. I wouldn't ask much in return, a kind word once in a while. She still has a love of life, believe me. Only I can no longer share it with her because I'm old now and getting older. The days run away and leave me further and further behind. And now it's too late. I beg of you, Ray, if you've ever cared for me, your brother, give me this one last chance. Give me a chance to save myself. And if I don't... Then you can conduct one final experiment. We'll find out who can reach the sidewalk first, a man in an elevator or a free-falling body. Oh, my dear God. You're serious. Good night, Raymond. I'm getting tired now. Let me think about this. Give me an hour or two. Will you be up? Are you coming back? I have to think first. Tell me you'll wait to hear from me. Give me your word. All right. But don't be long. Soon now, I'll need to rest. Would you like me to sit down? Yes. Roll up your sleeve. Easily done. I want to thank you for coming back. Don't thank me yet. I have to swab your arm. You'll feel a slight sting. There. That's it? That's it. All of it? It doesn't take much. A few cc's. And I may expect what? You may expect a miracle, but it's unlikely you'll get it. I want you to go to bed. Don't go to work tomorrow. Tell Flora you're taking the day off. I'll be back first thing in the morning. I'm keeping a very close check on you for the next few days. And when might I expect some... some change? Usually within six hours. That's when the first physical changes occur. As to... Mental changes. None of the rats or guinea pigs have articulated to us the exact feeling. <laughs> I'll be the first. You'll be the first. Making the assumption, of course, that you'll be alive. Oh, I'll be alive, all right. Do you want to know something? I shall not only survive, I'm going to become young again. I feel it. I sense it. I wonder if she has any idea what she's wrought, even the thinnest suspicion. Don't blame her. It was my decision. I make a promise to you, brother, that if you don't survive, or if you're damaged in any way, I'm going to take it out of her skin, piece by piece. She's going to donate a pint of blood for everyone she's bled out of you. This is no medical hypothesis. It's an oath. Relax, will you? I'm fine. Go to bed now, Harmon. I'll see you in the morning. Is that you, Harbin? Yes, Flora. Go back to sleep. What are you doing in front of the mirror? Just looking at myself, dear. Well, don't do that. You'll have a nightmare. Time to call it a day, lover boy. Or are you going to stay up all night? I like the sound of that. Up all night. <laughs> you know, I just might... Don't take all the covers when you get in bed. I'm trying to sleep. Of course you are, Flora. Pleasant dreams. Uh, I'm coming. 
morning, Flora. Why, if it isn't the quack himself, what do you want? Where's Harmon? He was last seen pounding a pillow. Some fun, if you ask me. Is he all right? What is this, ESP or something? I asked you a question. How is he? <sighs> He's okay. Boring, but okay. I want to see him. <sighs> then walk right in that room over there and blow a bugle. Maybe that'll get him going. He needs his sleep. I'll wait for him to get up. You do that. Take off your stethoscope and make yourself at home. You haven't talked to him this morning? I haven't talked to anyone. Not until you started pounding on the door. Do you know what time it is? What about last night? Did you talk to him last night? What difference does it make? He never has more than two words to say. But he sounded lucid to you? Look, Pally, I'm not the night nurse. I think you're in the wrong ward. Besides that, you bore me almost as much as Harmon. Now listen to me, you little... Get your hands off of me, Frankenstein. Harmon, how do you feel? Ugh. I'm not sure. Harmon, how do you feel? Poor little... Harmon? Is that you? Harmon, take your hands away from your face. Let's open the curtains and throw some light on the subject. <gasps> your face? What's wrong with it? Look at your... Your reflection in the window glass. Hmm. Oh, well, what do you know? Incredible what a good night's sleep will do for a man, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. Harmon, Harmon, what's happened to you? To the bags under your eyes, the lines. Are you wearing makeup or something? Makeup? No makeup, my dear. Just a few hours of sound, refreshing sleep. You look... You look different. Do I? You look wonderful. You look so, so young. What have you done to yourself? Ask my brother over there. Don't ask his brother. His brother doesn't know. <clears throat> How do you feel, Harmon? How do I feel? Like $10 million tax-free. That's how I feel. You know what I'm going to do for you, Ray? I'm going to let you take me on a tour. They can write you up in all the medical journals. That won't be necessary. But first, you'll have to give me four weeks. Flora and I are going to take a little ocean trip. Would you like that, my dear? Oh, an ocean trip? Oh, you bunny rabbit, you. Oh, Harmon, darling, when do we go? I've given it some thought. I think we ought to check out whatever sails tonight. Unless you'd rather fly. Honey, baby, I am flying. Boat, plane, who cares? Oh, I don't know what's happened to you, but I'll clue you, Big Daddy. I don't even care. Whatever it is, I like it. I like it very much. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'd better plan on any trips, at least for a while yet. Oh, blow it out your black bag. I'm going to get fixed up for you, honey. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Where do you want to go, Australia, Fiji, the Hawaiian Islands? Where? You name it, honey, and I'm there. I'm serious, Harmon. You can't go running off. Not now. Just look at it. My reflection in the glass. Please, sit down. No, wait. What? I, I, I don't believe it. I'm still changing. My hair is black again. Jet black. And what's this? A, a little mustache, and it's black, too. I want Flora to see it. Not just yet. But this is astounding. I haven't worn a mustache since... Since you were 30 years old, which is precisely the age you look now, at least at this moment. <laughs> this is fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm getting younger, what, every 20 minutes? When I woke up this morning, I looked 45. Now I look 30. If I keep going at this rate, I may get drafted again. <laughs> <laughs> that is... Uh, what's the matter? Don't you get it? That's just it. I do. If you keep going at this rate, I think we're in deep trouble. Raymond, this is beyond conception. You can't imagine what it's like. I feel... I feel light all over. I can breathe again. No fatigue, no heavy, dull tiredness. I feel as if... as if I've been lugging a case of concrete on my back and somebody just cut it away. Let me see your face. I don't know whether you realize this or not. But you've just altered not only my face, but the face of mankind. You've written a whole new chapter in medical history. I said, show me your face. 
Uh, where's my mustache? Well, what's going on? I wish I knew. But more than that, I wish I knew when it would stop. Or if it will. Why don't I make us some coffee now and we can... Harmon. Harmon, you've changed again. I know. I'm... I'm even younger. Oh, what's going on? What is going on here? Raymond, it's starting again. I feel it. I feel it happening inside. I still feel it. You'd better get back to bed. Yes, yes, I think I will. I think I'll go back to bed now. Harmon, I want you to tell me what's going on. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Let me go, please. What's happening to you? Your robe, it's too big. Why, Harmon? Take your hands away from your face. You've got to tell me what... No, Flora. Oh, no! Let him alone, Flora. Let him have some privacy. Well, are you going to tell me now? Sit down, Flora. What is it? What's happened? I've been working on a research project. What kind of project? A cellular serum. Up until last night, I had only tested it on animals. Harmon insisted I try it on him. What does it do? As far as I can tell, it stops the body's aging process. Beyond that, it will, in some cases, rejuvenate cells and tissues. In layman's terms, it might make a person younger. Younger? Let me have one of those cigarettes, will you? How much younger? We were never able to ascertain how much, once the serum took effect, or how long the process would take. But now, I believe we know. I don't understand. I suppose there are variables to consider, but in the case of Harmon, the process took approximately ten hours. You mean it's over? That's right. The changes have finally stopped. I want to see him. You shall, but you're not to wake him. He's in shock, and this sleep is precisely what he needs. I want to see him right now. Do you? Suddenly so solicitous. Very touching. Don't you try to stop me. Flora, as of right now, as of this very moment, you'll have some adjustments to make. What are you talking about? I want to see Harmon. From this point onward, you'll have to readjust your entire life. Oh, this is some kind of trick. I want to see my husband. Look at me and listen. Uh, let me go. Harmon is sleeping, but when he wakes up, he's going to need your help. Help? What kind of help? Let me see him. I'll let you see him, but I think you'd best get oriented first. I don't need anything from you. Are you beginning to understand? What is that in there? The ground rules have changed. The world no longer begins and ends with Flora. It isn't just Flora's wishes, Flora's temperament, Flora's capacity for anger, Flora's needs. Now it's something else. Something very different. Take a good, long look. I don't want to! That's very nice, but you have no choice. You've got a responsibility, and you're going to honor it. You're going to take care of Harmon now. He's going to need you rather desperately. Now look at what's sleeping in your bed. Yeah, there, little fellow. Go back to sleep. The world isn't such a bad place. You'll see. Oh, Flora! If you're leaving, my dear, make note of the fact that the clothes you have on are all that you take with you. You're out of your mind. If you think I'm going to spend the rest of my life taking care of that grubby, thumb-sucking little baby in there... That's precisely what you're going to do. Short of that, Flora, my dear, you leave the premises as you came, unadorned. The furs, the jewelry, and everything else my brother gave you, that remains here. You can't make me stay here, and neither can he. There's other fish in this ocean, mister. Indeed there are, but you're not married to them. You happen to be married to my brother. That's crazy. Not crazy, Flora. 
Bizarre, perhaps, but very much a fact. And if I find out that he's left alone with maids, governesses, nurses, you're going to find yourself back on the chorus line. What? Do you understand, Flora? He's to get attention now, the attention he deserves. I don't mean intermittent, sporadic moments between nightclubs and beauty parlors. I mean morning till night. Won't he... Won't he grow? Yes. As of right now, he will grow. A little bit older each day, just as any little boy. It isn't fair. Isn't it? The two poles of life where respect is most needed. But it's the second one that's often short-changed. You'll experience the process together. He'll be growing older, and so will you. Until you're both truly old. A little poetic justice, don't you think? That now you should finally have to drink from the same cup. That you should have to watch his youth encroach on your age. And the most anguished part of it, and the most illogical, is that youth always defeats age and then despises it for losing. Never realizing, my dear, never giving it a thought, that when tomorrow comes, there's always someone younger just outside the door, waiting to come in, forever waiting to come in. <laughs> But everything's... Everything's on his side now. You see, my dear? As one gets older, see how wise they get. Shh. Harmon Gordon is sleeping. He's taking a little nap. He'll wake up soon and impatiently demand a lollipop or a stuffed toy or some other form of attention. Youth is like that. It demands. If you don't believe it, ask Flora. Ask her any day of the ensuing weeks of her life as she takes notes during the coming years and realizes that the worm has turned. The oppressed has become the persecutor and youth has taken over. It's simply the way the calendar crumbles in the twilight zone. <laughs> Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Short Drink from a Certain Fountain, starring Adam West, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling from an idea by Lou Holtz. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, Christian Stolte, Doug James, and Lynn Foley. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition. It lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area we call the Twilight Zone. Where is he? 
We should start anyway. Uh, pass me the coffee, Bob. How long are we supposed to wait? Gentlemen, I called you here for a meeting, but I don't have all day. You try my patience, Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. I want the figures on the account now. I'll try to reach him again, sir. Put me through to Jake Ross's secretary. Yes, I'll hold. Williams, we're still waiting for your Mr. Ross. I'm trying to get him now, sir. Is this Jake's office, Joni? Uh, yeah, 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 I'm fine. Mr. Williams! I know he's out to lunch, but there was a conference called for 2 o'clock and it's 2.30. Yes, Mr. Misrell's office. Where is he? All right, then check. Tell him to get his keister back here fast. Well, where is your protege with the multi-million dollar automobile account? She's, uh, she's calling around the usual places, Sardis East to Colony. Don't be an idiot. He's due any moment, sir. Probably stuck at a big client lunch or something. More likely a big martini. Or three. Or four of them. Mr. Mizrell, I assure he you He was that... too young to put on this account. I told you that, Williams. Much too young for so large and important an account. See? I knew it. Here's Jake now. Message regard Williams? Give me that. We have been here now for 34 minutes, Mr. Williams. This is... This is a note from Jake Ross. Would you be so kind as to share its contents with us? I can tell you the sense of it very quickly, Mr. Misrell. It's Jake's resignation. He's... He's moving to another agency. And? And he's taking the automobile account with him. That account represented a gross billing of millions of dollars a year. And how many times have you promised it to me? This is as much a shock to me as it is to you, Mr. Mizro. Don't con me. It was your pet project, yours. And it was your idea to give it to that little college greenie. Get with the program, Williams. Get with it, boy. I'm sorry. So what's left? Not only has your pet project backfired, but it sprouted wings and left the premises. I'll tell you what's left for us in my view. A deep and abiding concern about your judgment. Please. This is a push business, Williams. A push-push business. Push and drive, but personally, hands-on. You don't delegate responsibilities to little boys. I don't feel well. You should know that better than anyone else. Oh. I, have, I have to leave now. It's a push, push, push all the way. All the time. Right down the line. Hey, you don't look so hot. Well, what's the matter with him? Why don't you just shut your mouth, fat boy? And who precisely are you addressing? Who do you think, you ugly, bloated, self-important old... I'll clean it up, Mr. Misrell. He didn't mean that, sir. I closed two new accounts. If I may, uh... Oh, no. Uh, excuse me. Please, excuse me, all of you. This is Gart Williams, age 38. A man protected by a suit of armor all held together by one bolt. Just a moment ago, someone removed the bolt and Mr. Williams' protection fell away and left him a naked target. He's been cannonaded this afternoon by all the enemies of his life. His insecurity has shelled him. His sensitivity has straddled him with humiliation. His deep-rooted disquiet about his own worth has zeroed in on him, landed on target, and blown him apart. Mr. Gart Williams, ad agency exec, who in just a moment will undertake a desperate search for survival in the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone. A Stop at Willoughby, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Oh, hi, Mr. Williams. You have some messages. I put them on your desk. Thank you, Helen. Are you okay, boss? 
Just, uh, let me sit down for a minute. You don't look so good. Well, the ulcer's acting up again. Oh, no. Don't worry about it. I'll be fine. You should take it easy. I can get you some lunch. Uh, no, thanks. Sure? Something plain? I think I'll, I'll go home early today. Oh, good idea. Well, can I get you anything first? Yeah. Anything at all? A sharp razor. What? And a chart of the human anatomy showing where all the arteries are. Tickets, please. Ticket? Hmm. Oh, right here. How are you tonight, Mr. Williams? In the absolute pink. Cold winter this year. Seems to get darker earlier than it ever has. That's the way of the world. The rich get richer and the days get shorter. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Here's your ticket. Enjoy the ride. Tickets, please. It's a push, push business, Williams. A push, push business. You gotta get with them, boy. A push, push business. Push, 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 push. Got to get with it, boy. You got to get with it. Got to get with That's it. That's enough. Is anything wrong? What? What? Oh. Oh. No, no, no. I, I was just thinking out loud, I guess. Oh, I was afraid you were speaking to me. Not at all. Sorry. It is a boring commute, isn't it? It's easy to doze off. Yes. Yes, it is. All that darkness outside. You can barely see the landscape. To tell the truth, I never paid much attention to it. But uh, well, now that you mention it... I used to read, but I got motion sickness. So now there's nothing to do but wait for the next station, and the one after that, and I don't even know where we are at the moment. I can't see any lights. What's the next stop? <laughs> I've lost track. That's funny. It is? Lost track, track. Oh. At least we're not off the track. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Give it time. Well, I suppose we could be anywhere. Wait, do, do you hear that? Hear what? What's happening? M Miss? Where are you? Willoughby! This stop is Willoughby! What do you mean, Willoughby? Where's Willoughby? That's Willoughby, right outside. There's no place called Willoughby on this line. I've taken this train hundreds of times. Where's the woman I was talking to a minute ago? Woman, sir. This car's empty. And the light. Why is it so bright outside? Well, why wouldn't it be? Sun's out. The sun? It's summer. That's what she is. Mid-July. And a real warm one, too. <laughs> no, it's not. It's November. What is going on? Why are you dressed that way? That ridiculous old hat, the uniform. Where's the regular conductor? Willoughby, five minutes stop. W wait, what is this place? Already told you, Willoughby. But that's impossible. Take a look for yourself. But those clothes, the horses. What is this, a practical joke? No, sir, it's Willoughby, July 1888. Nice place, don't you think? And there's the woman I was talking to. Uh, where did she get that parasol? Uh, you'd have to ask her. Getting off? Well, this isn't my stop. Uh, miss, you there? Why, hello, Mr. Williams. Good day to you. Uh, ho hold on, can you tell me... Shall I open the door? Uh, no, I... You ought to take a look around sometime. Peaceful, restful, where a man can slow down to a walk and live his life full measure. If you're not getting off, you'd best take a seat. Yep, right on schedule. All aboard! Pardon me, sir. I, what? 
Oh, uh, what did you say? I didn't mean to bother you, but I didn't want you to miss your stop. Is this it? No, no, that's all right. Uh, you got back on. I did? Oh, I, 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 I must have dozed off again. I don't blame you. At least you got a little rest. I guess I did. A little rest and an idiotic dream. Why do you say that? Ever hear of a town named Willoughby? I don't think so. Willoughby where? Willoughby, Connecticut, I guess, or Willoughby, New York. Not on this run. Are you sure? There's no Willoughby on this line. Westport, Saugatuck, next stop. Hello, Gart. Jane. I didn't hear you come home. That's all right. I figured you'd notice sooner or later. Oh, I see. So that's how it's going to be. If you say so. What are your plans this evening? Do you care? So you're going to get quietly plastered and sing the old college songs. No, no. No songs. I'm all sung out. Then you're just going to get drunk while I sit here and watch. You can join in if you like. No, thanks. I don't have anything to celebrate. Neither do I. It was just one of those days. I guess it was. How would you know? Bob Blair's wife phoned. She said he'd been in a meeting with you. You got hysterical or something. She called to find out how you were. They were all very solicitous, all the boys at the meeting. The kind of free-flowing compassion that spells relief for everybody because it means I'm the victim, not them. That's a big word with you, isn't it? Victim. Pour me another drink, will you, Jane? Would you spare me your little homilies for once and just give me a simple, honest answer? Did you throw away your job this afternoon? Did you wreck your entire career? It appears not. Mr. Mizrell phoned before I left the office. And? He has found it in that giant, oversized heart of his to forgive me. Forgive you for what? What's the difference? That gracious, somewhat obese gentleman will allow me to continue in his employ simply because he's such a human-type fella, real people person. And one small additional reason, if I were to go to a competitive agency, I might take a lot of business with me. Go on. That's it. That's all of it. I'm tired, Janie. I'm tired and I'm sick. <laughs> then you're in the right ward. We specialize in people who are sick and tired. Gart, I'm sick and tired of a husband who lives in a permanent state of self-pity. A husband with a bleeding heart sensitivity. He unfurls like a flag whenever he decides the competition is too rough for him. Some people aren't built for competition, Janie. Or big, pretentious houses they can't afford like this one. Or rich communities they don't feel comfortable in. Comfortable? Let me get this straight. You're not comfortable here? That's the one thing. Country club memberships that they wear like a badge of status. And you would prefer... I would prefer, if anyone cares, a job, any job at all, where I could be myself. And who's that? You know, where I wouldn't have to climb on a stage and go through a masquerade every morning at nine and mouth all the dialogue and play the executive and make believe I'm the bright young man on his way up because I'm not that person, Janie. You've tried to make me that person, but it isn't me. You're right. It isn't. It isn't me at all. And I'm not very young. I'm a soon-to-be-old, very uncompetitive, rather dull, quite uh, uninspired, average type of guy with a wife who has an appetite that won't quit. And where would you be if it weren't for my appetite? I know where I'd like to be. And where is that? A place called Willoughby. A little town I chartered inside my head. A place I manufactured in a dream. An odd dream, a very odd dream. Willoughby. It was summer, very warm. The kids were barefoot. One of them carried a fishing pole. Oh, please. And the main street looked like, like, like a Courier and Ives painting. Bandstand, old-fashioned stores, bicycles. I've never seen such, such serenity. It was the way people must have lived a hundred years ago crazy dream. Gart. You should have seen it, Janie, this Willoughby. 
It wasn't just a place or a time. It was like a doorway that leads to sanity. Nothing serious, Gart. It's just that you were born too late, and your taste is a little cheap. You're the kind of man who could be satisfied with a summer afternoon and an ice wagon pulled by a horse. My mistake. My error. My miserable, tragic error. To marry a man whose big dream in life is to be Huckleberry Finn. That's what you want, isn't it? Something like that. A place, a time, where a man can live his full measure. And what does that mean? I don't know, but I'd like to find out. It's what that conductor said. A place where a man can live his full measure. That's where I'd like to be. Yes? Mr. Williams? Uh, yes, Helen. You've got a 2 o'clock, a 2.30, and a 2.45. Is that right? So I was wondering, should I cancel the 2.30 or the other one? What? The 2.45. Which? Uh, oh, the 2.30 is the man from the baby food company. He's got an idea for an ad campaign, remember? And the one after that is about the frozen fish account. Uh-huh. Tough call, huh? No. Well, I mean, it is. No, I, I mean, I'm... I was just wondering. Which one to cancel? Uh, not that. What would happen, do you suppose, if I weren't here? When? For the meeting. Either one. Take your pick. Me? Or both. You want me to cancel both meetings? It's a hypothetical question, Helen. Oh, but you are here. Of course I am. But what if... What if one fine day I just wasn't? Well, I guess they'd have to wait around till you got back. And if I didn't come back? Then they'd reschedule. And if I never came back? Never? Ever. Not in a hundred years. Well, in that case, somebody else would get the account. Is that all that would happen? And I'd miss you. You would? We all would. Uh, it's almost two, so should I tell them you're not back from lunch yet? Who? The two o'clock and the two-thirty. No, uh, no, I'm here. You have their files? Somewhere. I brought them in. I'm sure you did. But if you haven't had time to look at them yet, maybe I should tell them to reschedule. That would be a lie. Not exactly. I can say you were at a long lunch. No more lies, Helen. Not in this office. I don't have the stomach for it. Hello again. It's you. Uh, please, have a seat. You look like you caught up on your sleep. Feeling better? Oh, tolerable. And you? No complaints. It is a bit of a grind, though, isn't it? These long commutes. Well, actually, I only take this train for the scenery. Some view. Mm-hmm. Huh? <laughs> the scenic route. If you like miles and miles of pitch black fields, you can't even see the towns. So there's nothing much to do but grin and bear it. It's an opportunity. It is? For conversation. Do you know... I've never spoken to another soul on this train. They're all so wrapped up in their own melodramas. Misery loves company. So, we might as well be miserable together while we're sitting here. Has to be more interesting that way. Did you ever... What? It's silly. But did you ever want to get off at a stop where you've never been before, just to see what it would be like? Which stop are you thinking of? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Pick one and see what happens. Hmm. Well, you'd be on your own. Nobody waiting. No car. I wouldn't mind. There's nobody waiting for me anyway. Would you? Not anymore. Forgive me. Did I say something wrong? Oh, it's just a... a <laughs> this is going to sound strange. I, I didn't mean to get personal. I, I think we're having the same dream. <laughs> what? Sharing the same fantasy, in a way. Remember the last trip when I dozed off? We spoke, and I asked you about the next stop. I was afraid you'd miss your station. You see, I, I dreamed we came to a station I'd never seen before. But you got off as if you lived there. I saw you outside, walking around. In the dark? It was a bright summer day. I'm beginning to like this dream. And did you get off the train so we could have an adventure? That's the problem. I wanted to, but I didn't. Why not? 
I wish I knew. Willoughby. What did you say? Well, last week you asked me about a town called Willoughby, Mr. Williams. Oh, yes. I looked it up. No such place, as far as I could see. You're sure? Every old timetable I could find. Nothing with that name. Not even close. Thanks, anyway. Where did you hear about it? Oh, I... I must have dreamed it. Probably did. Old-fashioned name. Sounds nice, though. It does, doesn't it? Nice place to visit, maybe. Don't know if I'd like to live there. You never know. No, you don't. Take it easy now, Mr. Williams. Next stop, Stanford. Stanford, next stop. Is that the name of it? Willoughby? It was. You know, it seems familiar. They used to have different names, these towns, a long time ago. It could be you read about it in a book. It could be we both did. I don't have much time to read. It's almost as if I'm remembering something. Don't tell me you believe in past lives. That's nonsense. <laughs> no, it's not that. But the name does sound familiar, and I do like the sound of it. I do, too. Willoughby. 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 What did you say? Next up, Willoughby. The woman who was sitting there. Woman, sir. In that seat, where is she? No other fares in this car, sir. But it was only a minute ago. Good day to you. Day? All out for Willoughby! It is day. Getting out, sir? Quick, what year is this? Why, 1888, sir. What else would it be? I don't know. I've been away for a while, have you? Lost track? Y yes, in a sense. Uh, how long is the stop at this station? Long enough to drop off and pick up. You have a ticket for Willoughby? No, I... Then you'd best take your seat, though it is a fine, balmy day. A place where a man can live his life full measure. Yes. Hello there. Hi. You did it. You got off. Of course. This is where I live. It's such a lovely afternoon. And I do believe I'll take a walk in the park with some of my friends. You're quite welcome to join us if you'd like. All aboard! Wait, the train started moving. Goodbye, Mr. Williams. If I can jump to the platform... Oh, no. Don't do that. I can make it. Too late. I can make it. Don't. It wouldn't be safe. Another time. Yes, a an another time. We'll make a day of it. people. A full car, Mr. Williams. Always is this time of day. There's your seat right over there. The woman I was talking to. I'm not sure that... I... Uh, she, she's not here now. Oh? Maybe she went to the club car. Or got off. Where? No stop so far. She got off at Willoughby. <laughs> you on that kick again? I told you there's no such town. I know. That's what you said. Sounds like a nice place, though. A real nice place. Tickets! Next time. Next time I swear I'm going to do it no matter what I'm going to get off it. Willoughby. Yes, Ellen? It's the big man on line one. Should I tell him he'll call him right back? Don't bother. I'll take it. Mr. Mizrell, morning, sir. I wanted to remind you, Williams, what we need here is an ad with pizzazz. Real entertainment. We've got to take the audience by the ears and give them a yank. Rock them and sock them. Give them the old push, push, push. My thoughts exactly. You've got to be bright, Williams. Bright with patter, hipness, and the whole thing push, 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 push. That's what the client wants. I'm working on it. Tomorrow morning, I'll need at least a preliminary storyboard. You know what I want, a solid format with some pops for the product, leading up to one big pop at the finish. And not just any pop this time, light, 
color, explosions. I see it as a field artillery attack. We show the audience with mortar fire. Lay down some tactical air support and establish a beachhead in their cerebral cortex. Then we send in ground troops and occupy the territory. There. What do you say to that? I'll do what I can. Do more than you can. With me, Williams, aspire. Dream big and then get behind your dreams big time. Push. Push. Well, I haven't seen the ratings on the show. No. Uh, no. No, but it was the time slot the sponsor wanted. Uh, hold on a second, will you? Y yes? They were what? No, wait, wait. Helen? Yes? What film outfit did the commercials on the Bradbury account? The negatives are all scratched. They're screaming bloody murder at me. I'll send a fax. Oh, and Mr. Miss Rell would like to see you in his office. I'm gonna have to check it out for you, okay? Mr. Miss Rell, sir, he got disconnected. He seemed rather insistent. Are you all right? You look so pale. Oh. I'd like to be... I'd like to be alone now. Not the ulcer again? Oh, please, just go. I'll be right outside if you need me. Janie, this is Gart, honey. Stay there, will you? Things are going to be different from now on, you'll see. I just want you to stay there. I'm coming home. Janie? Janie, please listen. I've had it, understand? I can't go on for another day, another hour. This is it. I I've got to get out of here, Janie. Janie, help me, will you? Please? Please help me. Janie? Janie? The scotch, Mr. Williams? No, thank you. Pretty empty in here today. Well, that's because it's too early. Most people don't hit the club car till after work. <laughs> Wait till the commuter run. They'll line up like kids in a candy store. I bet they do. You going home early today, Mr. Williams? Yeah. Yeah, my wife's waiting for me. Oh, she is, huh? That's nice. At least I think she is. You call her and tell her? That I did. I just hope she got the message. Oh, I bet she did. Gonna take her out for dinner and everything? If she's there. Well, if she's not, you can just kick back and watch the game. Have the place yourself. You win either way. <laughs> That's right. I'm the winner, not the loser. That's the way to look at it. Let me ask you something. You know that woman? Which one? She rides the train the same time I do. Except today, because I'm running ahead. Uh-huh. What does she look like? Well... She wears an old-fashioned long dress, and she carries a parasol. And... <laughs> in here? Oh, no. No, I'm sorry. No, not in here. That's not what she wears on the train. Only in Willoughby. Willoughby? Where's that? That's just it. I don't know. Ah, oh, forget about it. I don't know what I'm talking about. I just thought she might have come in here. Just till she gets to her stop. And not many women in here today. So I see. You okay, Mr. Williams? A1, top drawer. See you next time. Sure thing. If there is a next time. Oh, you changing schedules? I might take some time off. Good deal. Vacation, huh? That's right, a vacation, a long one. Ticket? You're early, Mr. Williams. What? Decided to call it a day, huh? Yes, uh, yes, you could say that. Well, enjoy the trip. Oh, a conductor. Something else? You wouldn't happen to have a light, would you? You want a cigarette? It matches in the club car. No worse than a drink, I guess, if that's your poison. But you can't light up here. You have to wait till we stop at a platform. Of course, I... I was just wondering if you could uh, bend the rules this time. It's been quite a day. I need to unwind before I get home. I used to smoke. Two packs a day. Had to give it up, though. Doctor's orders. Right. Said it was cutting years off my life. 
So I decided to stick around. You want to do that, don't you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I do. That's why I'm going home. There you are, then. I have another question for you. Yeah? That woman, the one I talked to. Which woman is that now? Have you seen her in the other cars? Can't say as I have. Would you take a look? If I see her, I'll let you know. Thanks. I appreciate it. Some people didn't go to work, though. Cold day. Yeah. You know, maybe that's it. Be colder tonight. That's what they say. Looks like snow. You keep warm now. I'll try. Next stop, Stanford. Stanford. Willoughby, next stop. Next stop, Willoughby. This is where I get off. Stop the train. Yes, sir. That's your station, Willoughby. Need a hand with your baggage? I don't have any. Nothing at all? Not a thing. Well, good day to you, then. Yes, it is. It really is a beautiful day. All aboard! Hi, Mr. Williams. Uh, hi. We're going fishing. Oh, I can see that. Catch some big ones today, huh? <laughs> the biggest you ever saw. Want to come? Uh, maybe some other time. It's pretty hot today. Yeah, we're gonna get a sunburn, then go swimming. That'll be fun. Come on, we got an extra pole, and there's plenty of fish. I'll bet there are. Bye, boys. Catch one for me, okay? Sure. Such a lovely day. Too nice to stay indoors. I want to hear the band. Yes, the band. I love the sound. So do I. Beautiful. Did you say something? Not really. I'm... Oh, it's you. Hello. Oh, it is you. I'm glad you decided to join us. I was on my way down to the park. Where? Oh, that's right. You just got here. Come with me. It's not far. I'll introduce you to all my friends, just as I promised. Then they'll be your friends, too. I'd like that. I feel as if they already are. Then later, perhaps we'll take a stroll by the lake. It's truly splendid with the moon and the stars and... I like it here right now, with you. The trees, the stores... The shops are my weakness, I must confess. <laughs> You've got some wonderful antiques here. Antiques? That beautiful grandfather clock in the window, for example, a classic. wonder how much they're asking. Oh, it's quite reasonable. I'm sure even though it's new. But it can't be. Come along now. We'll be late. Again. Again. It's no use. There's no pulse. Uh, it's a crying shame. He wasn't very old. You say he just jumped off the train? Right here, in the snow, in the middle of nowhere. Never saw anything like it. Poor Mr. Williams. He shouted something, ran out, opened the door, and that's the last I saw of him. Thought he went to have a smoke or something. Well, a heart attack, probably. Yeah, if the fall didn't get him. Well, he must have died instantly, then. At least he didn't suffer. Look at his face, like he's at peace. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. All clear, let's move it out. Where should we take the body? Out of the local mortuary for now. Willoughby's funeral parlor? That's the one, they'll hold him till somebody contacts the family. All right, let's put him on the stretcher. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, lift.
Mr. Gart Williams, who withstood the slings and arrows that come with life in the fast lane for as long as he could bear them, and eventually sought respite for his torment in the only place left open to him, under a gravestone who climbed onto a world that went too fast for him and then finally jumped off. Mr. Gart Williams, who might now tell us what really awaits us in the great beyond, because this too is very much a part of the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Stop at Willoughby, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Rich Komenik, Peggy Roeder, Turk Muller, Lynn Foley, Laura Russell, Tony Castillo, Roderick Peoples, Linda Ryder, Jeff Lupitan, Mike Aljadef, and Adam Tangway. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Blasted alarm. Let me sleep. Oh, all right, I hear you. It's 7.01 on a beautiful spring morning. What's so beautiful about it? And this is Mike Munn, here with some more sunshine music on your favorite listening station, Radio K-Rand. Oh, shut up! So, whether you're on the way to work or just waking up, relax. We'll be with you all day long, bringing you melodic masterpieces around the clock. Off, I say. I did not set this radio to go on at all. And before we start another set of timeless hits, here's a special message for one of our favorite listeners, Bartlett Finchley. What? Mr. Finchley, we know you're out there, so put on a happy face. Take some time to smell the coffee, and remember... We love you madly, but we'd love you even more if you'd get out. Nobody wants you here, so you may as well pack up and get out now. We'll see about that. Of all the outrageous gall. Operator, get me K-Rant. Yes, the radio station. No, I don't know the number. Uh, Kindly dial it for me. If you can spare a moment from your crossword puzzle. Okay, Rand, how may I direct your call? Connect me with Mike Munn. I beg your pardon? Munn, your asinine disc jockey. 
I'm sorry, sir, but there's no one here by that name. Of course there is. I just heard him on the radio. He took it upon himself to broadcast a personal insult directly and specifically aimed at me. We play all music all the time, sir. Do you know who you're speaking to? This is Bartlett Finchley. Yes, Mr. Finchley? And I will not be addressed in such a manner, on or off the air. Of course not, sir. Which manner? I'm sure you know full well what I'm talking about. The airwaves are licensed by the Federal Communications Commission, and they are not to be used for personal messages. I'm sure the FCC will be most interested in these blatant violations. They'll pull your license so fast it'll make your empty head spin like a top. But we don't have disc jockeys. We don't broadcast any messages at all. Only beautiful music 24 hours a day. Plus commercials, of course. Let me speak to your station manager. Yes, sir. Please hold. And don't you dare place me on hold, you high school dropout. Oh, for the love of... I don't have time for this nonsense. I will not have it. I'll write a blistering letter to the FCC that will knock this rinky-dink station off the air. Hello? I want to file a complaint. A very, very serious complaint about your broadcasting policies. Come off it, Finchley. What did you say? Get off your high horse and give it a rest. Or you're out of here. You low-life nincompoop. How dare you address me in that fashion? I'll have you fired on the spot. What is your name, you, you... Cretinous subhuman. Don't you hang up on me! Hello! 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 This is Mr. Bartlett Finchley, age 42, a practicing sophisticate and dedicated misanthrope who writes very special and very precious things for gourmet magazines, critical journals, and the like. He's a bachelor and a recluse with few friends, only devotees and adherents to the cause of tart sophistry. He has no interest save whatever current annoyances he can find to occupy his mind. He has no purpose to his life, except the formulation of day-to-day -day opportunities to vent his wrath on the mechanical contrivances of an age he abhors. In short, Mr. Bartlett Finchley is a malcontent, born either too late or too early in history, and who in just a moment will enter a realm where muscles and the will to fight back are not limited to human beings. Next stop for Mr. Bartlett Finchley, the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A Thing About Machines, starring Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. How are you today, Mr. Finchley? I'll answer that burning question after you tell me what's wrong with this electronic abomination in my living room. You mean your TV set? And also acquaint me with how much your current larceny is going to cost me. Well, let's see here. Two hours labor, new circuit board, new oscillator, new comb filter... How very technical and how very nice. Speak English, man. Well, you asked me what was wrong. Never mind the subterfuge. I presume I'm to be done once again for three times the worth of the bloody thing. Well, I didn't charge you for my travel time. The total. What is the total? Here you go, Finchley. Oh, surely you jest. All right, all right. I'll give you a break on the sales tax, seeing as how you're a regular. But, but this is the price of a meal in a four-star restaurant. With wine! Labor don't come cheap nowadays. And neither, apparently, does my peace of mind. I requested that the device be restored to working order, the alternative being more disruptions to my writing schedule. Well, you could just get a new one every time. Might be easier all around. Last time I was here, Mr. Finchley, you'd kicked your foot through the picture tube, remember? I have a vivid recollection. It was not working properly, like every other electronic contraption in this house. I tried to rehabilitate it. By wrecking it? After a certain point, that is the only option left. I disposed of a clock radio in a similar manner this morning. Unfortunately, I must view a cooking program this evening in order to write my review of their fare, which I'm sure will be abysmal as usual. 
if the television should choose to operate at all. Why don't you just horsewhip it, Mr. Finchley? That'd show it who's boss. What do you say we cease the small talk? Let's get down to the petty larceny and be done with it. I'll put it on your tab. Send me a check before I come out the next time. I sometimes wonder exactly what it is the purpose of the Better Business Bureau in such transactions. You got a complaint about my work? When they allow you itinerant extortionists to come back week after week, move wires around busily probe with ham-like hands, and accomplish nothing but the financial ruin of every customer on your route. We're not a jip outfit, Mr. Finchley. We're legitimate repairmen. But I'll tell you something about yourself. Spare me, please. I'm sure there must be some malnutrition analyst with an aging mother to care for whom I can contact for that purpose. Why don't you hear me out, Mr. Finchley? That set doesn't work because you obviously got back there and yanked out wires and heaven knows what else. You had me over here last month to fix your tape recorder because you'd thrown it down the steps. It did not work properly. Well, that's the point, Mr. Finchley. Why don't they work properly? Offhand, I'd say it's because you don't treat them properly. I assume there's no charge for that bit of analysis. What does go wrong with these things, Mr. Finchley? Have any idea? Have I any idea? <laughs> now that's worth a scholarly ten lines in your repairman's journal. Bilk the customer, but let him do the diagnosis. Well, the reason I ask that is because whatever it is that really bothers you about that television set and the radio and all the rest, it's something you're not telling me. Aside from being a rather incompetent clod, you're a most unreceptive listener. I've explained to you already. The television set simply did not work properly. And as for that original Marconi operating under the guise of a radio, it gave me nothing but static. You sure that was all that was wrong with them? I choose my words very precisely, thank you. Well, there you go. TV's okay again, for now. I'll send you a complete bill, Mr. Finchley. Of this I have no doubt. Finchley, what is it with you, anyway? With me? What with you and machines, that is. Any type of machine, as far as I can tell. Just curious. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. If it's something personal. I will file that idiotic question in my memorabilia to be referred to at some future date when I write my memoirs. You will fill one entire chapter. The most forgettable person I have ever met. It just so happens, you boob. It just so happens that every machine in this house refuses to cooperate on any level. They behave as if... There! You see what I mean? Enough! I said that will be just about enough of that. Stop! 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 Please! Miss Rogers? Oh, yes, Mr. Finchley? Let me see the pages. Yes, sir. Is that all you've done? That's all I've done. Two articles and one column almost completely retyped. Forty pages in three and a half hours. That's the best I can do, Mr. Finchley. It's that idiotic gadget of yours. Humming and clicking away. I suppose it's about to break down, too. It's perfectly fine for a typewriter if you'd let me use a word processor. My words don't need processing. They've already been diced and sliced by the most perfect processor known to man, the human brain, which in my case comes with a great deal of priceless expertise. But a computer would increase the speed. I wouldn't have to worry about ribbons, correction tape. The solution to that, Miss Rogers is increased accuracy. I'm extremely accurate, Mr. Finchley, and it's not my speed that's the problem. This is an old-fashioned, out-of-date technology. If you'd allow me to bring a computer in here... Oh, no! Not in my house! More unnecessary bells and whistles. 
Thomas Jefferson wrote out the preamble to the Constitution of the United States with an ink pot and a feather quill. It took him only half a day. Then why don't you hire Mr. Jefferson? Did I ever tell you with what degree of distaste I view insubordination? Oh, yes. Many times. Often and endlessly. What are you doing? What does it look like? I'll tell you what, Mr. Finchley. From now on, you can get yourself another girl. Somebody with three arms and roughly the same sensitivity as an alligator. Then the two of you can work together till death do you part. As for me, I've had it. And you are going where? Where? I think I might take in Bermuda for a couple of weeks. Or Mexico. Or maybe a quiet sanitarium on the banks of the Hudson. Now, Miss Rogers... Any place where I can be as far away as possible from the highly articulate, oh-so-sophisticated, bon vivant of America's whiners and diners, Mr. Bartlett Finchley. (laughs) Miss Rogers, you don't mean that. And surely you're not serious. You've even got me talking like you. But I'll tell you what you won't get me to do. You won't turn me into a female Finchley with a pinched, scornful little heart and a mean, petty, yellow jaundiced view of everybody else in the world. Miss Rogers, please. Please don't leave. I beg your pardon? Um, I wish you'd reconsider. Speak up. I can't hear you. I wish you'd... You'd stay. For a little bit longer. You what? I don't mean to work. All that can wait. Then why? I was just thinking. Well, we might have dinner. You're not serious. Or something, perhaps a cocktail. You are serious. I am. I'm not very hungry, and it's too early for cocktails. What's your trouble, Mr. Finchley? You sound like a half-hearted orphan whose idea of a lark is a square dance at the local Grange. I'm merely suggesting to you, Miss Rogers, that we observe the simple social amenities between an employer and a secretary. I thought we'd go out, even taking a show or something. How very sweet, Mr. Finchley. Thank you, but no thank you. Tonight, I'm taking a hog-calling lesson. You know what a hog is, don't you, Mr. Finchley? He's a terribly bright fathead who writes for gourmet magazines and condescends to let a few other slobs exist in the world just to take his rudeness and run back and forth at his beck and call. Good day, Mr. Finchley. Miss Rogers, before, before you go... Have a cup of coffee, or anything, anything at all. If you must know, I'd like very much, I'd like very much not to be alone for a while. Are you ill? No, not as such. Then what's the trouble? Does there have to be trouble because I... I'm desperately tired. I've hardly slept for four nights. And the very thought of being alone now, well, frankly, it's intolerable. Things have been happening, Miss Rogers. Very odd things. Go on. That that TV set in the corner. It goes on late at night. It just goes on all by itself. I see you got it fixed. And the clock radio I kept in my bedroom. It went on and off, too, of its own accord, whenever I tried to catch up on my sleep. I'll let you in on a little secret. There's a conspiracy afoot in this house, Miss Rogers. Really, Mr. Finchley? That's exactly what it is. A conspiracy. The television set, the radio, electrical devices of every sort. That miserable car I drive. Even the clock on the mantelpiece. There's no clock on the mantel. I know. I I threw it away. Why would you do that? What I'm getting at, Miss Rogers, is that for as long as I've lived, I've never been able to satisfactorily operate... Machines. Mr. Finchley, I think you ought to see a doctor. A doctor? Oh, the universal panacea of dreamless idiots. If you're depressed, see a doctor. If you're happy, see a doctor. If the mortgage is too high and the salary too low, see a doctor. You, Miss Rogers, you see a doctor. I am a logical, rational, intelligent man. I know what I see. I know what I hear. And for the past three months, I've been sharing this house with a collection of wheezy Frankenstein monsters whose whole purpose is to destroy me. Now, what do you think of that? 
I think you're terribly ill. I think you need medical attention. You obviously haven't heard a word I've said. I think you've got a very bad case of nerves from lack of sleep. By no choice of my own, I assure you. And I think that way down deep, you yourself realize that these things are nothing more than delusions. Now I know what you really think of me. That I'm to be pitied. That I'm a poor wretch. Not in my right mind. That... Think what you like. Now where are you going? You don't need company, Mr. Finchley. You need analysis. You're no better than a cogwheel robotic machine yourself. You have an iota of compassion or sympathy. Mr. Finchley, please, let go of my arm. I'll let you go when I get good and ready to let you go. Mr. Finchley, let's not make an ugly scene here. Now, come on, let me go. Mr. Finchley, let go of me! Get out of here and don't come back! With distinct pleasure and manifest relief. Don't ever come back. I'll send you your check. I will not be intimidated by machines, so it follows that no empty-headed little secretary with a mechanical expression is going to get away with anything either. Mr. Finchley, in this conspiracy you're suffering, this mortal combat between you and the appliances, I hope you get licked. Good riddance! What? More typewriting? Oh, you think you'll turn yourself on any time you feel like it, do you? Uh, let's see what you've written. Get out of here, Finchley. Get out of here, Finchley? Who are you to tell me to get out of my own house? You're a machine, a silly machine, an inanimate object. All right, that's it. This is war. You're not going to intimidate me. Did you hear what I said? You're not going to get away with it, you... machines! Nice day, huh? Define your terms. I, uh... I was only making conversation, Mr. Finchley. Just see to it that this elevator takes me all the way to my destination without a mishap. Nineteen floor. I'm surprised I got here in one piece. Pardon, sir? No matter. You wouldn't understand. You couldn't, since you choose to collaborate with these infernal contraptions all day long. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Finchley. Is it? I just meant... I know what you meant. The warm, languid weather outside. Fluffy white clouds scudding across a pale blue sky. The sort of day when a young woman's thoughts turn to romantic mush. Disgusting. Mr. Finchley, I assure you, I... Well, I'll have none of it. Do you hear? Excuse me. Editorial department? Ah, another telephone. Mr. Alexander Graham Bell's most loathsome invention. It undoubtedly knows my whereabouts at all times. Please hold. Mr. Finchley, did you want to see the editor? No need. I simply wish to drop off my manuscripts for the next issue, the reviews and the personal opinion column. Oh, and kindly note, the final pages are handwritten this time. How oh, did your computer crash? By no means. My typewriting apparatus is in the shop. Actually, I prefer this method. It allows me to make last-minute revisions directly from my hand to your eye, as it were. I'll tell them it's here. Then I shall take my leave. Out into the blinding white heat of the cruelest month. Reflux Publications? Iron Gourmet Magazine? Just a moment, please. You there! Why are you touching my automobile? I'm writing you a citation, sir. For what reason? Overtime parking. What? The meter ran out. That's impossible. You can mail in the fine or pay in person. There's something wrong with the meter. Surely you can see that. I see a red flag. That's a violation. But I deposited the correct coins. Maybe you did. Just not enough, that's all. On the contrary, I've been gone for 13 minutes. I inserted coinage worth exactly 30 minutes. Well, it doesn't look like it. Then the meter's not working properly. Take it easy. 
You don't want to break city property now, do you? It's already broken. Definitely and absolutely. It runs too fast. Any fool can see that it did not register a full 30 minutes after swallowing my money. If you want to contest it, court hours are 8 to 5, plus night court on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is a gross miscarriage of justice. I'm just doing my job, mister. Here's your citation. Have a nice day. One more mechanical abomination designed to make my life a living hell. One side, madam. You, sir, move your vehicle out of my way. Watch it, Mac. Watch what exactly, you imbecile? This is my lane. Park it, Pops. Move all the insolent. Get that rail trap off the road. Stand aside. Bartlett Finchley is at the wheel. I earned my first driving license while that bully was still in kindergarten. The barbarians are at the gates. Yet another red light waiting for some mother and her toddler to cross the street. Oh, look at them. Stuffed to bursting on cheeseburgers. What's wrong with you? Are you blind? I did nothing. Simply placed my foot on the brake pedal. On the gas, you mean? The car moved forward under its own power. Yeah, sure. You trying to kill somebody? I saw the whole thing. He did try to kill you. On the contrary, the motor car obviously malfunctioned. We're in a crosswalk here. Get his license number. You do that. The light is now green. Do I have your permission to proceed? Get that piece of crap out of here. Gladly. Pardon me, attendant. If I may be so bold... Yeah? When will you be finished with the repairs? On the old four-door? Soon, I trust. You've had more than enough time. Right. It's parked over there. Ah, my congratulations. And now for the bad news. What is this going to cost me? Nothing. For a brake overhaul? You mean no charge for the labor? I'll consider that a professional courtesy. I mean no charge, period. So you haven't completed the work? My good man, I can't wait around this gas station all day. There's nothing wrong with it. I checked the brakes, transmission, the works. It's an oldie, but there ain't nothing wrong with that car. Nothing? She's a classic. You know, you could sell that baby for good money if you want. But I distinctly felt the machine roll forward under its own volition. All the same. It's working perfect. Real cherry set of wheels you got there. I know a collector looking for something like that. I'll give you, say, 900 $900? The hubcaps cost more than that. Okay, a grand. Give me the keys. If you say so. Here you go, Mr. Finchley. But she's not going to last forever, you know. You ought to get back what you put into it. Buy yourself a nice new car. If you can hang on a minute, I'll call the guy. And waste even more of my precious time? Good day. Wait up! Ah! Oh. Now you deduce what's wrong, as I'm about to drive away. Eleven hundred. Cash on the barrel head. Oh, go tighten your fan belts or whatever it is you do in this incompetent establishment. Knuckle-dragging dolt. Uh, at least I can hear some decent music. Get out of here, Finchley. More abuse. Just go, Finchley. We don't want you here. Pack up and get out, before it's too late. Miss Moore, please? Oh, is that you, Agatha? Bartlett Finchley here. Yes, my dear, it has been a long time. Too long. Which indeed prompts this call. How about, um, dinner this evening? Yes, with yours truly. Why, at the restaurant of your choosing, of course. Oh, no, you're quite mistaken. 
There are establishments that meet my standards. In this city? Well, I'm, um, I'm sure there are... Well, it is short notice. But yes, yeah, yes, I see. Some other time, then? I'll call you again. You have my pledge on it. Not at all. Good evening to you. Mrs. Donnelly, please. Pauline, is that you? Oh, and how's my favorite young widow this evening? Bartlett. Bartlett Finchley. You remember? Yes. I'm tip-top. And you? Splendid. Say, listen, Pauline, I was wondering, sort of spur of the moment and all that, but oh... I see. I see. Yes, perfectly. That's quite all right. No, I hadn't heard the good news. Well, I'm delighted for you. Truly delighted. In June. I'll send you a wedding gift. Of course. Good night. It's the telephone. I'm sure of it. Distorting my voice, twisting my words. What other explanation is there? An army of forces dedicated to embarrassing me, inconveniencing me, and generally making my life as miserable as possible. How much longer, may I ask? The phone's off fixed, Mr. Finchley. Go in the bedroom, too. So you say? Yeah, she's operating all right now. Had to replace a handset, though. Shouldn't give you any more trouble. I'm deeply indebted. Convey my best to Mr. Bell for his reliable invention. Uh, yeah, sure. Is there something else? Well, you tripped over the cord. Is that what you said? If that's what I said, you may rest assured that's what happened. Well, you're the boss, Mr. Finchley. Reason I asked, though, those wires sure looked like they were yanked out. Do they now? Proving what a vast storehouse of knowledge the phone company has yet to acquire. Okay. So long, then. Have a nice night. I shall certainly endeavor to do so. One thing. Yes? The thing about phones, though? What? Well, you see, they're just like any other piece of electronics. You have to be careful. Treat them right. Because if you don't, they won't do what you want. Kind of like people, I guess. Kick them to the curb, and they won't be there when you need them. You get back what you give out. But, well, I figure you know that already, don't you, Mr. Finchley? A smart man like you. Good night. So be it. Another evening alone. Just as well. At least this way I'll have the company of a person of quality. And welcome once again to Dinner for One on the Eating Channel. Tonight we prepare a bright and breezy repast guaranteed to liven up any kitchen. Oh, spare me. Three new and exotic courses imported from jolly old England. For appetizers, a wonderful discovery called the Scotch Egg. Followed by an exquisite cold watercress sandwich. Mmm. And the traditional pièce de résistance, bangers and mash. Sound exciting? Well, it is. So sit back and enjoy and keep a pencil and paper handy. Now for something completely different. Boulder Dash. Not worthy of a review. Cretans and halfwits at every turn. Well, who needs you? Who needs any of you? Mr. Bartlett Finchley is going out on the town. He's going to have a wonderful evening with some good wine, and who knows what lovely lady I may meet during my nocturnal meanderings. Who knows indeed? Dinner jacket. White shirt. 
and the red cravat. No, the blue. Or perhaps the polka dots. Yes. This will do. Now, for a quick shave before dressing. Who do I see in the mirror there? Who can that attractive man be? Don't tell me. It's Bartlett Finchley. Good features. Strong chin. Bred from quality stock. All I need to do is whisk off the stubble. Bit me. The shaver actually bit me. I'm bleeding. Get away, you filthy bugger. Finchley. Who's there? Finchley. Look in the mirror. What do you really see? Huh? Who's speaking? Take a good look. You're ugly, Finchley. It's not my face. It can't be. An ugly, dried-up old man. Do yourself a favor. Do us all a favor. Use a straight razor. Stop speaking at once. You have no right. <laughs> Hello, operator. Get me the police. Someone's in my house. Hello? Hello? Finchley, get out of here! Stop! Stop this! You Finchley? Oh, thank God you're here, officer. Hey, your car? What? The car in the street. Yes, it is. What about it? She rolled down the driveway, almost hit a kid on a bike. Yeah, my son! But the, the brake was on. The emergency brake? You better get it fixed. I just did, this afternoon. Don't you believe him, officer? Car rolled right down the driveway and into the street. You're lucky you didn't hit somebody. Then you'd really be in hot water. Got the keys? They're in the other room. Better get them, then. I want to put on some clothes while you're at it. Look at him standing there in his underwear. I have a robe on, madam. Some robe? It's called a dressing gown. And tie it shut. I'll write you up for indecent exposure, too. Oh, yes, of course. All right, fella, you better pull her back in the garage. I'll give you a warning this time. Have those brakes checked first thing in the morning, understand? Perfectly. There is another matter I'd like to discuss with you, officer, now that you're here. And what's all the noise in his house? He's always throwing stuff, yelling at the top of his lungs. Is that true? No, I... I fell, that's all. I tripped and fell on the stairs. Is that why your face is bleeding? Precisely. What's the other matter? Matter? He said you have something to discuss. It's difficult to explain. You wouldn't understand. Eating that, Mr. Finchley. So is he going to move his car or what? In one moment, madam. For now, you may remain on my property until I return with the keys. At that time, I should like you to be out of my yard. Otherwise, I shall solicit the aid of this gendarme to forcibly eject you. Idiots! I need a drink. Perhaps one more. Mm. Oh. oh, that's better. But if the car can't be trusted, how can I go out this evening? I'm a prisoner in this madhouse. Miss Rogers? Edith? Is that you? Yes, of course. You had second thoughts and now you've come back. Where are you? But if you're not here, then... Who's typing? Get out of here, Finchley. Get out of here, Finchley. Is that all you can write, you infernal... machine? turned you on. Get out of here, Finchley. Get out of here, Finchley. No. You get out of my television set. 
What's that? The clock. I smashed it this afternoon. Smashed it to smithereens. And you. I destroyed you too. Well, you won't get me. You won't get me. I won't let you. Help me, please. Someone. It's Bartlett Finchley, your neighbor. Let me in. It's that crazy man again. Don't let him in, Mom. He tried to kill me. I didn't. The car did. Don't you understand? Open your door. You get away from here. You can't follow me. You're only a car. My car. Stop. There's no one at the wheel. You must stop. I demand it. Back to my house. Then it can't follow me to the house. Locked. Wait. I have the keys after all. It can't get in here. I'm safe now. Safe. Oh, where's the light switch? Burned out. Just as well. I'll hide here in the dark until the car goes away. Yes, that's it. Get out. Get out of here. Get out of here, Finchley. Now! Go away! I'll, I'll sneak away. Go, go somewhere, anywhere out of this town, far, far away. What? Those lights, blind them. I can't see a thing. I have your 1019 on Woodlawn Drive. What is the status? Cancel that call for backup. Paramedics have arrived, waiting their decision. Do you have a positive ID? Finchley, first name B for Bartlett. Stand by. 10-4. That man. He was running in his bathroom. Never saw anything like it. What's his condition? Flatline. He's gone. I'll put him down as DOA your arrival. Heart attack? That's what it looks like. What happened here, you know? Neighbors said they heard him shouting about something last night. He sounded scared. What about? Yeah, well, whatever it was, he took it with him. Was he out here? Right here on the porch. Slumped down against the door. Eyes wide open like he saw a ghost. I figure he's on his way to his car. Which one? At the curb. Never got to move it like I told him. He must have been drunk. You can smell it on him. Good thing he forgot his car keys or he might have done some real damage. Yeah. Not now, though. Poor old guy. He was a royal pain, let me tell you. That's all over now. Maybe he did see something. Who knows? Maybe so. <laughs> Yes, maybe so. It could just be that Mr. Bartlett Finchley succumbed to a simple heart attack and a set of delusions that were self-generated. It could just be that he was tormented beyond the breaking point by an imagination as sharp as his wit and as pointed as his dislikes. But as reported by those in attendance, this is one explanation that has definitely left the premises with the deceased. For now, look for it filed under M for machines in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after these words. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. 
so be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. A Thing About Machines starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Peggy Roeder, Rich Kalmanick, Turk Muller, Guy Burrill, Larissa Borkowski, Irene Olson, Heath Corson, Lynn Foley, Natalia Reed, and Peter DeVito. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Don Longo, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>